the premier online speed chess tournament. Oh, he wanted me to do. Can you keep up? <gasps> oh my God, he missed it. For the last seven years and counting, the best blitz and bullet players in the world have flocked to chess.com to prove their worth at this format. No, I lost it. Wow. And he car wins the game. In seven years, dozens have tried but only two have ever worn this crown. Magnus makes it look easy. He, he, made made over. It. he wins the speed chess championship fifth in a row. Who will be this year's Blitz King? Magnus is not human. Welcome to the 2023 Speed Chess Championship, presented by Coinbase. My God, what an intro that was. Well, it's time for me to introduce you to the long-awaited finals of the 2023 Speed Chess Championship presented by Coinbase, where Magnus Carlsen will be taking on Hikaru Nakamura just about 15 minutes from now. I can't wait. We're going to have to wait another couple of minutes. I'm your host, Grandmaster Daniel Naraditsky, and alongside me to cover the finals, Grandmaster Amon Hamilton. Amon, what do we even say in this situation? What do we say, Dania? I actually am so like nervous, anxious, excited in a good way. I can't wait for this. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone had a more picturesque final at the beginning of the SCC, right? Than seeing these two guys meet at the end of the road. This is a rematch from last year. It's a rematch from 2016 and 2017. And it is the next entry in an incredible series of matches that has defined Magnus versus Hikaru as one of, if not the premier rivalry in modern online chess history. And they will be duking it out yet again to determine the SEC crown. Now their path to the top of on, it hasn't been all that easy, but largely they've taken care of business. They've defeated players in good form, Hikaru, Defeating MVL in the bullet, that was a tough match. Magnus Carlsen, 22-7, speaks for itself. It really does. 22-7 against Wesley. And if I had to pick a player in the entire SCC who would not get blown out, maybe in a match ever, but not by Magnus, it would be Wesley. So it's crazy that he was able to do that. And as you mentioned, Nakamura beating MVL, who is the most on-form MVL that I think I'd seen. I'm just so impressed by both of these guys deserving finalists. Absolutely. They are deserving. That's the right word to use. And they also have a storied history, not just overall over the board in Rapid, but also specifically in the Speed Chess Championship, where both Magnus and Hikaru have competed uh, through several, several eras. It's weird to even think about what happened in 2016. I don't remember what I was doing in 2016. I don't remember anything about that year. The one thing I do remember <laughs> is that Magnus Carlsen defeated Hikaru Nakamura back in the times when the SEC was 5 plus 2 and 3 plus 2 with a final score of 14 and a half to 10 and a half. And Amon, this was the sort of first entry in what would become an epic rivalry. Do you remember that match as we're looking at some clips yeah. there? Oh my God. Memory lane, yeah, anybody? Quick. <laughs> Quite the dinosaur I am. I, I seem to remember this, uh, Daniel. I've been around, so I can actually say that I was there at the beginning of the rivalry as it was just budding. I mean, we have one quarter of Magnus Carlsen's face there, and, you know, Hikaru has got his classic orange background that has a few more decorations now. Yeah, you know, there's that silver YouTube button, and there's that shelf, uh, that there's the LED pineapple. 2016, right. man, I'm surprised these players even had internet them on. <laughs> I know, like this This goes back that far is what we're trying to say. It does indeed. And it went back also to 2017 because these same two players faced off the following year as well. And it was a similar story. It was a convincing, even more convincing victory for Magnus Carlsen who went wire to wire. He never trailed in the match. He led six to three after the five minute portion, added, added on a point with a three minute portion and then ran through the bullet, tacking on five more. Now, Hikaru's gotten better since then, and we're going to talk about that, but let's take a moment to appreciate that 2017 was an incredible year for Magnus Carlsen on the board and also online. Truly. I mean, there there was like a page, I feel like, that Hikaru turned in this rivalry, but at the beginning, Magnus was, he was doing everything. To beat Hikaru in the bullet, I think, is the biggest statement from this 2017 performance, because you know, he might get Hikaru in the blitz, but Hikaru always had that bullet. So for Magnus to do that was like a real shock. 
But then something amazing happened to Mon. Hikaru started streaming back in the Naka's Knockouts days. I don't know who in the chat That's remembers right. those evening streams. I would always tune in. Then he I started streaming on his own channel. I, I was living for those streams. And something clicked. Something changed. Hikaru Nakamura, the beast, became Hikaru Nakamura, the big boss, the unbeatable. And in the subsequent few years, he did not face Magnus in the SEC Finals. But that's not to say he didn't face stalwart opposition. Just look at some of those opponents and look at some of those scores. 18.5, 12.5. In 2021, he defeated Wesley 23-8. And yes, we're deliberately leaving out 2022. We'll get to that in a moment. But look at this domination, Amon. This is a, I mean, this is a storyline, and we're all here following it. It started with Magnus getting the better of him, but then Hikaru is reminding people and proving that, look, if you don't put Magnus Carlsen in these tournaments, I'm going to dominate the competition and win it every single year. Indeed, and win it convincingly, win it without any doubt. I mean, even the quote-unquote close matches were essentially controlled by Hikaru from the very beginning. And nobody, it seems, other than Magnus can match him on speed and on accuracy. And nobody other than Magnus seems to share Hikaru's ability to just turn it on in high-pressure moments. Most of these top players, as experienced as they are, they struggle in high-pressure situations. But Hikaru actually thrives in them. And a big high-pressure situation in which Hikaru thrived in a big way, Amon came in last year's SCC final against Magnus. Oof, this is, I mean, this is what it's all about, Danya. I mean, Naka getting his revenge is such a storyline because I feel like in one of the most unfair uh, takes ever, it was like, oh, Hikaru can't uh, compete with Magnus. It's like this old thing that people used to say. And I remember mm -hmm. when he first beat Magnus over the board, I feel like things just clicked. Uh, Hikaru woke up and he was like, I can compete with this guy, not just over the board, online in every single format every single facet and once that i guess he was just like getting over a little bit of a hump there once he did that he woke up and started competing with magnus seriously and a lot of people watching uh this this streamer and i don't know why you'd be watching magnus versus hikaru on, on a friday afternoon i'm on and there's so many better things to do than watch an, an sec final but yeah, in case man. you have carved out some time uh, to, to watch us vamp about this match it was incredible just the extent of Magnus's over-the-board dominance back in 2013-2014. I think their over-the-board score at some point was something like 7-0 with a couple of draws. And like you yep. said, Amon, Hikaru won one or two games, and it's like something clicked. That, I think, coupled with the confidence that his stream has given him and his community has given him has turned Hikaru into somebody who almost never fails to perform at the highest level under pressure, which is which makes him a unicorn even among his peers at the very highest echelons of chess. And last year was an incredible final. It was a one-point match, and it all came down to the wire, Amon. It came down to Magnus trying to checkmate Hikaru with enough time to play yes. another game in the match, and Hikaru was able to procrastinate that two seconds until after the Amazing. match clock ended. Were you watching that final? And you better I was. say yes. Yes. <laughs> Look, whether or not it's true, I was. I was there. Uh, no, no I, I was really there. I, I've actually been watching every single Magnus e. Car match. I'm a fan as much a commentator and a player myself. And just speaking from experience, Dania, as someone who played chess and then started streaming, uh, yeah, I know how it feels to kind of lose your edge in the competitive aspect of chess. So what Hikaru is doing is truly phenomenal, truly unique. He started streaming, and it feels like he's only gotten better. It's it's actually insane. It really is. And you said excited. I'm excited like a little schoolboy, you know, like coming to school in the morning and discovering a box of donuts, and they're all yours. You know, they're nobody else's <laughs> but yours. This is going to be uh, amazing. But let's talk a little bit more about the player's frame of frames of mind uh, going into today's match. After his match against Wesley on Tuesday, we asked Magnus if anything has changed between the two of them, between him and Hikaru, since last year's final, as well as his outlook on this year's match. Let's take a listen to Magnus Carlsen. To be honest, I was pretty sure that I was going to beat him in the final last time, so... <laughs> I don't think there is uh, that much of a that much of a difference there. Um, yeah, well, I'm still up to one against him, and in speed chess championship matches. So, you know, whoever um, so whoever go. wins this one is gonna have some some writing rights for sure. 
Okay, I'm on. There's two there's two things that should jump out to me there. The first is that he's ultra confident in spite of his performance last year. The second thing is that these matches are equally as important to the players as they are to the fans. Neither Magnus nor Hikaru, whom we'll get to in a second, are thinking of this as a casual Friday afternoon match that doesn't decide anything, which I love. This is important yep. to them. Yep, yep. This isn't some online match. The SEC has become the... the Pinnacle online event and trust me these guys know the score between each other i don't think they're forgetting those numbers magnus is quick to remind it's like okay you know hikaru got me but guess what i've still got the lifetime score so this match is really important there's a big difference daniel between 2-2 two -two and 3-1 absolutely and it reminds me of you know when they'd ask michael jordan after a big game you know michael were you aware that you were about to get 60 points what do you think? I was born yesterday? Of course I was aware. I was looking at yeah, the scoreboard exactly. the entire time. They know what the head-to-head -head score is. They know what's at stake here. And, uh, of course, Hikaru does as well. Hikaru defeated MVL in the semifinals. That was a topsy-turvy match, but ultimately Nakamura ran away in the bullet. After his performance in the interview, we asked Hikaru what he thought the key would be to beating Magnus in the final today and reprising his incredible performance from last year. Here is what Hikaru had to say. Well, I mean, the first thing is that I get to play Magnus a lot. I mean, I think I'm playing him on Friday in the final, and I'm playing him on Monday in the uh, Chess Champions Tour as well. So I'll get to play Magnus quite a bit in the the, the next three days. Um, you know, I, I think looking at the match, it's it goes without saying that I'll have to play a lot better than I played today. I think today um, I started off very, very poorly in the first couple of games. Max team was really, really sharp. Um, so I'll have to play a lot better. If I do, I think I have chances. Obviously, I won last year. Um, but, you know, Magnus obviously has been on, been on a big run. So... We'll kind of see how it goes. I, I feel I feel like if I play to the best of my ability, I'll have great chances, especially if I can keep it close going to bullet. But again, you know, and it's anyone's guess what will happen. That was Hikaru Nakamura after his semifinal against MVL. I think one thing is very clear. Two things are very clear. The first is that if both Hikaru and Magnus play to the best of their abilities online, we will get something resembling last year's match. It's going to be close. The second thing, though, Amon, is that Hikaru will have to step up his game compared to his match against Maxime because Magnus is not going to let go of a three or four point lead in the bullet. Yep, I think, uh, you know, all things considered, I think it is fair to say that coming into this match between these two players, uh, I think that Carlson is on better form than Nakamura, you know, respective to themselves. He has been doing something else in this SEC competition. The way that he just stormed through Wesley so, like, he wasn't the competition that he, in fact, is, uh, just incredible. Both of these guys, I mean, I'm so excited to get into this match, Dania, but Magnus and Hikaru... You can't ask for anything better than this. I mean, are we are we trembling? Is it about to we're start? We're trembling. We're, we're five <laughs> minutes and changed away from the match. And, and you said it, Amon. When Magnus is angry, when he's got a chip on his shoulder, he's even more terrifying than, you know, a happy Magnus. And a happy Magnus is already pretty terrifying. So the stage is, <laughs> the stage is set. Uh, but we've got another couple of minutes to delve into this match that will be played today. Let's take a look at our Deloitte game analytics. We're thrilled to have Deloitte, a leader in their field, as the official data insights partner for the Speed Chess Championship. Their dedication to excellence aligns perfectly with the Chess.com mission to grow the game in the sport of chess. And without further ado, here's page one of our Deloitte game analytics. The age, both of them over 30. Well, not a spring chicken anymore, and <laughs> obviously over the hill, you say? <laughs> over the hill, man. Yeah, the graying hair, the arthritic hands. How are they going to play bullet? Should we eliminate the bullet portion of mine? <laughs> I think that the bullet right now between these two is such an interesting part of the match because Hikaru is basically supposed to be the guy in bullet, but Magnus, ha you know, had that over him at the start. I feel like he doesn't have it anymore, and Hikaru Nakamura has that. It's almost like the nitrous boost at the end of a race that he has that ability to win any match, even when he's losing in the bullet. Even Magnus is well aware of that. Well said. It's the cheat code for Hikaru Nakamura. And the fact that Magnus holds that 30 to 24 lead in the bullet, that's a confidence boost from Magnus Carlsen. And I think a lot of that is due to the one second increment that we have mm -hmm. in the Speed Chess Championship. They've also faced off in the last few bullet brawls. And I think they're still pretty evenly matched in one plus zero. But I think the increment, that one second, does give Magnus Carlsen uh, a little bit of a boost. And on sure. that note, let's go to page two of our Deloitte Game Analytics. The rating information 
and also the game win percentage. Magnus Carlsen, well over 50%, the only SEC participant to have a win rate in any individual game, a likelihood of over 50%. How incredible is that? Yeah, I remember commentating another match in the SEC, and these players that I was commentating had win rates of 30%. And I was like, guys, this is actually a really high win rate. There's a lot of draws at the top level. Yes. Winning 30% of your games is super, super impressive. And then now you see Magnus, and he's got over 50% win rate, and Hikaru not far behind. These guys win a lot. I'm hoping that we see that kind of a battle, Daniel, where, you know, we'll get some draws, but I'm excited to see wins by Hikar, wins by Magnus, back and forth. We are going to go back and forth, and that needed to be clarified, Iman. If you see a 47% win likelihood, it doesn't mean there's a 53% loss likelihood. probably <laughs> means there's a 40% draw likelihood and a 13% exactly. loss likelihood. Well, the likelihood that we get a close match is very high. Smarter Chess seems to agree as we take a quick look at the Smarter Chess predictions, uh, who calls for a victory by Magnus Carlsen, and he believes that Magnus will do the heavy lifting in the 3 plus 1 portion, and I think that's a reasonable take Amon, given the fact that Magnus has actually never lost a 3 plus 1 portion to Hikaru Nakamura previously. So that might indeed be the X factor in this match, that middle 60 minutes of 3 plus 1 chess. Yeah, you know, I feel, I feel like one of those sports analysts who's like, you know, when this referee has called the game <laughs> on a Wednesday, the 3 plus 1 portion has always been won by Magnus. And it's like, that's weird to think about. It's been such close matches between these guys. It's gone back and forth. You wouldn't think there's a stat out there that is overwhelming in one player's favor. But yeah, I guess this is one of them. So actually be on the lookout for that one. The three plus one section often and always goes to Magnus Carlsen. And I also feel like a sports analyst, I'm on. I feel like the sports analyst was about to say something completely wrong and <laughs> mispredict the course of the match. And that's why I've, I know better than that at this stage in my commentating career. We have no idea what the X factor is going to be in this match. We have no idea what the decisive segment is going to be in this match. It really could be anything, and that's a product of the incredible level that both these players display. If they're at the top of their game, we might get a, an even match until the very last game. We just don't know. And Magnus Carlsen also agrees. He said uh, on uh, his 2022 final versus Hikaru Nakamura the following. This is as good as it gets. Be chess matches between Hikaru and I, be that Blitz or Rapid or even Boule, that's as good a show as it gets in chess. That's coming from Carlson himself, so if the players are excited, if they're amped up, that's the best news that we can hear. We already talked about it, Amon. This is really yep. important to the players. They're taking this as seriously as, an over, as a serious over-the-board event, maybe even more so. Honestly, I feel like this is as good as it gets. You know, speed chess matches between Hikaru and Magnus, whether it's Blitz, Rapid, or even Bullet. I mean, that's as good a show as it gets in chess. That's what I think. I think we could just look at the cams of the players without even seeing the board for the whole time, and we would be plenty entertained. But no, we promise that a chess board will appear shortly, as will the first game between Hikaru and Magnus. The gong is about to sound, and we will commence with 90 minutes, an hour and a half of five minutes with a one-second increment. Seatbelts fastened them on and mandatory. Mandatory for the first time in the SCC because we are underway with Hikaru having the white pieces in the first game. Here we go. Here we go, indeed, E4, E5, and I mean, thinking back to the, the very first time they played, they didn't even have 5 plus 1, Daniel. They were playing 5 plus 2. <laughs> back in the day when we had the telegrams <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we had the phonograms and Thomas Edison was still alive, uh, but we still had the Rui Lopez, and they literally did because this opening has been around since yep. the 1500s. That is when... A Rui Lopez de Segura, a Spanish priest, published his treatise on chess openings and recommended this opening for the first time. And we see the D3 variation uh, as we yeah. so commonly do uh, these days. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, white is always on the lookout for something that doesn't just, you know, completely simplify into these martial type of lines with D5, you know, pawn sacrifices. The, the players are so well prepared that... Yeah, they, they can do these things and just liquidate and simplify to a draw. And that is part of the reason rookie one is played, to discourage the move d5, which could be played anyway. The other reason I'm on is this classic Rui Lopez maneuver where the knight comes out to d2 and then drops back to f1 and settles on g3, kind of massing the forces on the king side because the king side is ultimately where white wants to butter his bread. <laughs> That's right. That's a, such a classic maneuver, and if anyone is, you know, on looking and being like, I don't understand anything about these 
E45 positions. I see them in every top level match. Well, you just highlighted such a great maneuver to just be aware of. The knight comes to G3, and then I think the thing that bothers players the most is bishop G4. It's a pin on the knight. It looks hard to break, but with the knight on G3, you can just play H3 and kick it away. Indeed. And we see Carlsen expanding on the queen side, C7, C5. All of this is standard fare. Uh, this is what I would call a Chigorin pawn structure. Uh, the Chigorin variation itself uh, it refers to a main line where white has a pawn on d4. But it's important to think not only in terms of moves, but also in terms of the general pawn structure. And you're pointing it out, Amon. White could actually strike with d4, especially if black's light squared bishop lands on e6, which it just did. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> there it definitely go. <laughs> lends itself to the move d4. There are other prep moves that you could throw in. Like, for example, completing that maneuver knight g3 h3 is always a decent move as well and white often has that choice do you want to play the move a4 and just pry open that a file because if you trade the rooks on a8 it could be a timely uh moment to bring that queen away from the center yeah nothing in this position happens too fast you could look at a4 and say well what does this move threaten the a8 rook is defended it's not about mm -hmm. threatening anything in, on this move it's about building up the pressure on both sides of the board and eventually the floodgates are going to open how are they going to open well either by white playing d4 or black playing d5 or action starting to happen when white's knight let's say gets to f5 but right now we're still in the you know all the soldiers are kind of sitting in their headquarters drinking coffee phase <laughs> That's right, and there's going to be an alarm that's going to sound very soon, and just like a you know fi fire department, everyone is going to come down the uh, the fire pole there. H6 played actually a really important move. Sometimes when you rush the move D5, Dania, Knight G5 hits like a truck, hitting that bishop and losing the light squared bishop, and conversely losing the dark squared bishop for white. That's a really bad feeling. And Hikaru fighting for control of the light square, the light squares there, the bishop goes back to b3 and now we have this italian-esque tension between the bishops i don't think mm -hmm. black is going to take on b3 we rarely see that because that relinquishes control of the f5 square and knight f5 it's not a devastating move black's bishop could drop back to f8 not a huge deal but not a move that you want to allow uh, to be played easily you want to fight for that square normally so i'm expecting queen d7 maybe even knight a5 but he grabs it he takes and he might, might want to go d5 to follow up yeah, at this point, he's just making you look bad. He heard you say there's no way <laughs> yeah. Bishop takes B3. No he's like, way. Oh, actually, actually, there is one way. And Take that, I wonder, commentator. <laughs> is he, he going to do the same thing that you were mentioning with D5, but just immediately? So let's say Bishop takes, Queen takes, immediately with, with D5? Because, I mean, stuff like that, you got to be super careful about your e pawn. Yeah, and that queen trade could accentuate the weakness of White's lights uh, of White's queenside pawns, right? That B3 mm -hmm. pawn, it may not seem accessible right now, but knight c6 to a5 in some endgame could be unpleasant. Right. And that's how Magnus thinks. Magnus is always thinking about the ramifications if the queens totally. are swapped. We know that he's the best endgame player probably of all time. I certainly consider him to be. And uh, Hikaru might want to get his queen off the d-file if that is indeed the case. <laughs> Maybe a queen e2 here. <laughs> yes. Knowing that, Queen E2 is go. forced. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think and he's, he plays he's it. keenly aware. <laughs> Bishop F8 is just one of these professional moves. You know, it opens the rook up against the queen that was newly placed on E2. And also the move knight F5, you want to be able to play King H7 and G6 to boot that knight out, so you need to support your H pawn. And Hikaru continues to accumulate his forces on the king side, and I think he's finally created a threat. You see it, I see it. Bishop c1 takes h6, overloading the pawn on g7. That's why Magnus slides his queen up to e6, simultaneously protecting the knight on f6. You want your moves to contain as many ideas as possible. And remember, I mentioned that b3 pawn. Well, it's actually under fire now. Yeah, it's more than under fire. It's, as you mentioned, a very annoying pawn to work around. Like, what are we going to play? Queen d1 here? Uh, I think you have to just counterattack and say, look, if you grab b3, stuff's going to happen to you on the king side. That's exactly what Naka has gone for. I love the move knight f5. Great move by Hikaru. Very heads up decision uh, to switch to the counterattack on the king side. It also bothers Magnus that his a8 rook is tied down to that square. Mm -hmm. You would love to bring that rook to d8 just to increase your control over the center, but you've got to babysit that a6 pawn until it reaches a5, and black might not have that tempo to push that pawn up, especially if white's other knight drops into g4. Later yeah. on, Amon, I will could drop the f5 knight back to e3 and fight for control over the d5 square so not all end games are necessarily bad for white especially if he grabs control over that square absolutely i was even looking at a line where you know if you bring that knight g4 move up as you mentioned the knight captures you could even sack this pawn 
but get your knight to the d5 square, I think the compensation would be palpable for Nakamura. I think the g4 square either way is going to be involved, either uh, as a placement of the knight on g4 or even pawn g4, just running white's pawns up the board. You could try to go brute force and go for yep. checkmate because you've got a lot of forces on the king side. All three minor pieces are participating. Your queen on f3 is supervising the attack from a distance. Your rooks aren't mm -hmm. involved yet, but you could think about a king h1, rook g1. All of this happens faster than people might realize. Yeah, and honestly, the move king h7 seems a little cryptic, but it's it's again connected to the idea of g6 and making sure h6 is def defended. You want to kick the knight out. And honestly, after knight g4, it may not be completely insane to see the move knight g8 just to play g6 and support that h-pawn again. Absolutely not insane. That is a very Magnus-esque move. And Hikaru, after a long thing that brings him down below a minute, Whoa. rook ad8 setting a trap. I'm going to interrupt myself. Rook takes a6, knight d4 is an incredibly yeah. devilish tactical idea. Have we to have show to show this. this. One. Take it away, Amon. Rook, rook a6. a6. <laughs> oh, man. And it's like, it's like it, you would probably think that's a blunder. But it's Magnus, so you got to think twice here. Knight d4, and it's actually white who's getting hoodwinked here. It is, because rook takes e6, the knight captures the queen with check, and black recaptures yep. the rook. Of course, Hikaru sees that, and as we go back to our live board, and said he's played the move knight e3 down to 30 seconds in the first game as Hikaru Nakamura, the d5 square mm -hmm. I'm on, is the yep. reason why I think Carlson has chosen to keep his knight on f6, and now I think he can grab the b3 pawn. Yep. The b3 pawn is loose. Well, b5 is hanging, so it actually really invites queen takes, but actually he's going to oh. meet it with rook a3. Okay, queen has to drop back, and then b5 is lost, and he's, go he he's going for it. Yeah, this looks like a really weird line here. Rook a3 looks, I mean, got to go for it. 19 seconds for Nakamura as he restores material equality. Now Magnus struggles with weak pawns on the queen side, but he's grabbed another pawn on e4. He has eliminated the linchpin of Hikaru's central pressure. Rook a4, yeah. the immediate response, laterally hitting the knight. And that knight, is it going to drop back to f6? You can't. You can go back to d6, I think, tactically, but I'm expecting either knight f6 or even some sort of crazy knight d4 move using tactics uh, to establish that knight in the center. Now, Magnus is a professional. He knows that Hikaru has 20 seconds. He might look for a really complicated way to proceed because you want to use the player's time against him. How many times have you seen Hikaru Nakamura actually down on time by more than a minute against anyone? No, I mean, almost never. He's usually the one putting that pressure. He's usually on the black side of these types of positions. Magnus pausing. This is a critical moment. Where does he put yep. his knight? Even knight d2 is yep. on, on the menu, Amon, trying to shuttle that knight around to b3 so that it can supervise the weak queenside pawns. Magnus now below a minute. He's got to keep an eye on his own clock because this minute evaporates so quickly. And knight wow. d4 is on the board. He's found it. Amazing. The best move. And I don't even have to assign a brilliancy to that one because it popped up for us. Takes, and the queen is hitting the knight on f5. The knights are a little bit clumsy when they're defending one another because they can't move. But a very calm response by Hikaru. He come to, comes to terms with the fact that he's going to lose back the knight. And instead, he helps himself to that a5 pawn. Magnus still has the initiative. The smoke mm -hmm. clears a little bit. And look at how nicely Magnus pieces are positioned all in the center. Queen f6 here would hit the f2 pawn. Magnus has to continue making threats, Amon, and complicating the game in Hikaru's time pressure. But how does he do that? Yeah, it's really complicated. And Hikaru has done, I think, a phenomenal job. The, the patience to play queen takes a5 there when pieces were getting sacked is actually unbelievable. And he's so calm under pressure. But the pressure continues. C4 by Magnus opening up, popping open the diagonal mm -hmm. for Black's Dark Squared Bishop. But Hikaru gets his knife and fork ready. He might have forced the move C3. And if Magnus yep. plays C3, I think this one is heading toward a draw. I think Hikaru has enough time to stabilize the game. Rook C2, perfect the only defensive question, play. question, Danya, is can Hikaru do it without ever moving oh. the C1 Bishop? Oh my gosh. And I think he's about to move it on the next move. So Magnus better offer a draw now. Yeah, And knight h3 there. Wait, knight h3. Knight h3. And Magnus forgot to play that move. It was still a draw after knight h3, but there would have been winning yeah. chances. And a draw yeah. agreed. So I, I think draw agreed here makes sense. But don't you think that if he had actually played knight takes h3, black really pushes that, right? 
Black absolutely pushes that. There was an intermezzo where Black's knight on F2 could have captured the H3 pawn with check. It would have been yep. a three on one. I think Hikaru sees it. He's shaking his head. Why is he shaking his head? I think he realizes there was a little mutual blunder there uh, at yep. the end of the game. But the fact remains, a draw in game one. What else could we have expected other than a sharp, <laughs> even game, Amon? Of course, that's it what we got. And, of course, it wasn't just like, oh, yada, yada, let's trade all the pieces, make a draw. It's like, no, uh, we actually saw Hikaru down to 10, 20 seconds. We saw a piece sacrifice. We saw two pieces for a rook. We saw a lot, and it ended up in stalemate. And I would caution people in the chat about making you know conclusions on the basis of the first game the players are still settling in they're still mm -hmm. testing e each other's opening preparations even for hikaru and magnus there is a period of adjustment where you have to settle the butterflies in your stomach and i think they did a great job of doing that overall i think we're going to see hikaru playing a little bit faster in subsequent games although as yeah. i say that he is taking his time in this second game also a rui lopez this one a little bit different but largely a similar structure. Yeah, and it's such a such an interesting concept, uh, Daniel. What what would be your like you know thirty second explanation for why you would bring a bishop out to develop in castle and then castle and bring it literally back to the starting square? Like, how can you make that make sense? I think what people need to understand is that open and closed positions operate very differently. This is still a closed center position. And as long as the center remains closed, the value of each individual tempo is greatly reduced. You can often afford to make more than one move with each piece, and that doesn't necessarily completely change the dynamic of the position. Black is still very fundamentally sound. And there's the answer mm -hmm. to our question, Amon. G6 by Magnus redeploying the bishop on G7. Why? In order to protect the king and to exert long-term pressure on white's d4 pawn and naka with so naka's with the black pieces here in, unless i have it backwards just confirming no nope, um, he does have black okay <laughs> just making <laughs> sure um but bishop to g7 and it looks like we're gonna see this knight g3 maybe i mean maybe just a slow moving game you know what's interesting is this is the same structure as a king's indian but it's vastly different in the sense that rook e8 you're not playing f5 and going for that, oh, you know, f f4, g5, g4. I don't think we'll see any of that. So it's going to be much more central play. And another big question, how is white going to res is white going to resolve the tension in the center? If so, there are two ways to do it. White could play d5, and then the game does take on a more King's Indian flavor. And we actually might potentially see black dropping the knight away from f6 and trying to push the f-pawn. Although I agree, I think it's very unlikely but I think the likelier scenario is for white to take on e5 and open that center up uh, and then yeah. try to massage those squares in the center. Get the knight not to g3, but maybe to e3 and eventually to d5. Magnus, mm -hmm. though, he keeps the tension, gets it to g3. How is he going to continue? Are we going to see those kg a4, bishop d2 moves? Just trying to right. keep the tension, exert as much pressure as possible. Yeah, I feel like these are the kind of games where you see queen c1 and you're like, oh, yeah, that's a really, really impressive move. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I honestly <laughs> think your speech about Tempe is so relevant here. You were talking earlier about how closed positions, the value of individual Tempe is not as high. And look at this. We see moves like queen f8, rook d8. There's nothing that has been captured yet, Daniel. Incredible. Still nothing that's been captured. And Hikaru literally begging Mag, please open up the D file so that I can mm -hmm. target your queen on D2. Look at that standoff between Black's Rook and White's yep. Queen. And this greatly increases the probability that Magnus plays D5, but still he keeps the tension. It's reached its peak. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> like, I don't know he how you can want to go D5. <laughs> especially because it kind of traps the knight. Like, knight C6 can't happen, and knight B7 to D8 to where sorry d5 <laughs> really does make sense but as soon as you close the position daniel then the move f5 becomes a real idea for uh hikaru especially with that queen almost posing as a rook on f8 man that knight on a5 reminds me of having to fly to all those remote locations for the world youth chess championship i'd go like san francisco to istanbul and you'd fly <laughs> to some small turkish city then you'd hop on a bus and go four hours and then get a taxi that you would have to share to the hotel that night is a long journey back to civilization but look at magnus keeps the tension shifts his queen from d2 to e2 why i think he's eyeing that a6 square actually because hikaru has shuttled all of his pieces to the center and the king side and finally we get a release a partial, I should say, release of the tension as Hikaru trades once, drops his yep. knight back to c6, 
And where is that knight going from c6? That's been a key narrative I'm on. If you go to b4, after bishop b1, white will be threatening a3, and the knight is finally trapped on b4. Truly. <laughs> Yeah, for the first time, we finally see the move d5 committed, but a little bit different now. Knight e5 played, and we might see, I was about to say, we might see actually knight d2 with the idea of f4, but he actually takes right away. Okay, and rook takes e5 will likely be met with f2, f4, although you don't want to play f4 without careful consideration, because in the long run, the e4 pawn is weak, and an idea that we shouldn't yeah. neglect him on is h5, h4, targeting the knight on g3, and softening up White's defense of the e4 pawn. That's why Magnus is not playing f4 automatically and might not play it at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, White might be more interested in maybe anticipating this and preparing perhaps f3 just to be solid in the center. Indeed. And rookie 7 indirectly defending the a7 pawn. Something tells me that pawn is not going to be captured. I, just, I don't know yeah. why. I'm just getting that sense. You, you have a very keen sense for the position, uh, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Good sense of wow. danger. I was right, Amon. Look at me. <laughs> he doesn't take the pawn. And then this little bishop c8 move. The bishop is almost like, what? what is it this game, maybe even this match? It's like queens on f1 and f8. I've seen both bishops return to their original squares. Like These guys are playing so cagey right now. It's some sort of artificial Fisher random game. I mean, how often do you even have a queen on f8? A rook not on e8, but on e7. Kind of a weird arrangement of pieces. It, it <laughs> seems to me like Magnus holds the advantage in this game. He has more space. He's got better control of key central squares. And the opening that this structure reminds me of is a Benoni, right? That pawn on c5, white's pawn on d5. And in a Benoni, the engine often evaluates it in white's favor. But in yeah. practice, it's actually very, very difficult to make concrete progress. And Magnus says, I'm tired of the KG play. I'm going to go e5, and I'm going to run you over in the center. Totally. And there's an idea which I barely even get to talk about before. I believe it's on the board right now. I almost want to award this a double uh, exclamation mark just because of how thematic it is Daniel pawn takes and then white continues pawn to f5 and all those black pieces that want to use the e5 square are looking at the pawn and saying come on dude move out of the way and it and it does move out of the way but he rips the band-aid off but he invites white's knight into the center and that's the problem after knight takes e4 f6 is threatened d6 mm -hmm. is threatened the g6 pawn is weak as well hikaru's position is suddenly on the verge of collapse amon i call that technique the square clear it's where you push your pawn up and vacate the square left behind in order to put a knight on that square black's position is in dire straits and we are all wondering how you came up with that great name. <laughs> I'm known for my originality, man. That's why Shocker. they paid me the big bucks to commentate the SCC finals. And after uh, E4, we essentially have the same position, except the D6 pawn is missing. Because if White had played F5 first, there would have been a pawn on E4, pawn on D6. White's position is so much better with these moves included. Rook E8 and tactics everywhere. Rook takes E4 is the threat right now. Yeah, and the move F6, which probably tempts a lot of people watching this show right now, I think it fails tactically. Black can take on F6, and after yep. the trade, the E3 bishop is going to hang. It's actually a pretty easy line to visualize if you look at that E3 bishop. That bishop would love to be anywhere but there, and that's why bishop G5 here has to be seriously considered by Magnus, but it can be met with the move F6. So yes, the eval bar giving a big advantage, but in practice, a very hard position to navigate accurately. The bishop slides up to F4 instead of G5. Yeah, and you know, the double uh, question mark is showing up there, Daniel, but it's almost a, a double question mark because you could have done better, not because bishop F4 itself was so bad. Oh, bishop wonder, A6. rookie seven! Oh, Hikaru oh my goodness. Hikaru forgot that rook takes e8 is going to pin the queen. He drops a minor piece. Yeah, at first, I was like, wait a minute, bishop a6, is he forgetting there's a queen on f1? But then it was a step further than that. He knew the queen was there, but Magnus, rook takes e7, and rook takes e8. He is going to pull away with a victory here, especially with 10 seconds left on the clock for Hikaru after this and blunder. And he resigns because a6 falls, you can't take the queen, and Magnus strikes first after that initial draw. Hikaru pays the price for his time management. I actually think that in the early going of this match, the fact that Magnus develops that 45 one-minute lead on the clock in the middle game, yep. that's coming in very handy later on as the game continues to complicate. Absolutely. I mean, you can see the, uh, the two competitors on screen there. Do you think that is, is uh, it really as important as... 
you know, the fans might make it out to be drawing that first blood, Daniel, that first win. Are these guys no. thinking about it that much? No, because this isn't their first rodeo. This isn't their first match, Amon. And I don't think yeah. Hikaru is sitting there thinking, that's it. The match is over. <laughs> I didn't win the first game. He has to make in-match adjustments. I think the players are using their losses and will use their losses as evidence of what they're doing wrong. And a big question is going to be whether they're able to make adjustments during the match. Are they going to tweak their openings? Is Hikaru going to tweak his time management? The answer to the first question, at least thus far, is no. We have yet another Rui Lopez, and this time a third structure with the center finally closed, not by white, but by black. Yeah, and this... this uh push pawn to d4 it feels like wait a minute isn't white just you know basically given a free hand on the king side you know black's closing the center but still there is a lot of play for black the move c4 is not out of the question and it's not as closed as white would like it to be and if we could pull up an analysis board i'd like to indicate a very quickly a positional idea that's important let's let's say white plays bishop d2 which is not unlikely by the way black could play dc bc and then carve out the d4 square with this move b4. And the reason that move is so unpleasant is if white plays c4, and you look at this and you look at that bishop on d5, I'm feeling like, mm -hmm. I'm feeling awesome. Well, you know what's, what yeah. else is feeling awesome? A knight that lands on d4, and after the queen drops back to d1, black can start pushing a5, and later on can develop that queenside pressure with his pawn majority. This is yeah. to be avoided by Hikaru, and he avoids it by instituting some queenside tension with a4, but does that actually increase the likelihood that Magnus goes for this operation? I, I think it might get exactly <laughs> what you were saying on the board, guaranteed. Like, no questions asked. Because now, B4... Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I was thinking, wait a minute, is there time to play A takes B5? But actually, there might not have been because you could take on B2 there. Oh, okay, that didn't even work. Yeah, instead, Hikaru goes bishop to b2. What is the idea of that move? Well, he is preparing for b takes c3, and he has mm -hmm. one goal in mind, to keep that d4 square under lock and key. You know, that's like when you go to Target and you see all those headphones behind the glass cage. <laughs> You're like, that costs a <laughs> lot of money, that d4 square. Hikaru is not giving that away without a fight. Absolutely. Knight on g3, I mean, look at the prospects, right? Pawn on g6 was covering everything. And uh, there are greener pastures over in the center and on the queen Literally. side. 93 <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, these are uh, some light pastures here. As far as the green ones, I'm actually not sure. Okay, well, E3, we'll call that a green <laughs> pasture. And bishop takes g4 runs into bishop takes f7 check. Look at how the play is suffused with tactical awareness from both sides. There's so much I'm on that remains behind the scenes and so much that we take for granted. Even this small tactic, I think a lot of GMs yeah. would rule out knight f1. Oh, g4 is hanging, not Hikaru. Totally. Both of these players so good at spotting the smaller tactics. Yep. Yep. Queen d7 is n not a bad move, but it doesn't make the threat that it seems to make. And pawn takes knight d4. Are we just going to snap that off? Man, Hikaru, uh, Magnus thought. wants those headphones on D4. We are going to snap <laughs> that off. But now the C file opens, and those greener pastures on the queen side, the bishop from F8 uh, could yep. access B4. The rook is itching to be placed on C3. Nice outpost, unassailable, because white has given up the dark squared bishop. I don't remember when that happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think there's a really key uh, interaction going on, which is that white cannot play knight d2 to c4 if that knight could get there i think white's position would suddenly just be better so you want to trade light squared bishops knight c4 is anchored there but when you play knight d2 there was bishop b4 so i think if white can achieve knight c4 and trade these bishops this could actually be a really strategically sound position for hikaru nakamura absolutely his queen is also very nicely placed on f3 uh it's defending the d5 score it's also pressuring f7 so it's really tying black up on the king side and rook fb1 threatening rook b7 hikaru says guess what you open the queen side i'm going to try to make you pay the price for that yep and rook b7 will come part and parcel with another idea of rook takes on f7 if you move the queen have to be careful of that bishop g4 there's still the bishop to f7 move from uh, previous and I was looking at the move rook c2 it's kind of a cute way to maybe threaten bishop g4 and Magnus big decision he takes on d5 and goes after yep. that pawn but what he does do is yield the e4 square that square is going to be accessed by white's knight momentarily there's knight g3 mm -hmm. and Hikaru that's a positional sacrifice he's going to give up the pawn totally. on d5 and bank on the activity of his knight of course that rook could also come to b7 right now using some pretty right. tactics along the long diagonal 
It is not off limits. And although Magnus is up a pawn right now, and it, it, it is clearly up a pawn, I think that the knight provides more than enough compensation. And in a blitz game, I feel like I might just rather play down the pawn here. Totally. I also love the placement of the g4 pawn, which prevents black from kicking the knight away with f5 and makes moves like rook b7 possible for newer players. The reason that knight f6 check doesn't win the queen here is because the queen on d5 is guarded by the rook on d8. And that's the tactical underpinning of the move rook b7. You're trying to deflect the queen onto a square along this diagonal that's undefended. And b7 happens to be the only one of those squares. That's right. And bishop and e7... A very nice move. I mean, you talk about tactics. Um, yeah, Hikaru Nakamura is going to be the top guy on the list to see them instantly. And it, Aman, I think it's safe to say he saw Rook B7 within a couple of seconds. He wasn't totally. calculating this move tactically. He was just assessing the other moves in the position. He knew that this move was in his pocket. He was looking for something better. How strong is Rook B7? I don't think it's quite as strong as it might appear to be if Magnus diffuses the tension with Rook to D7 here. Yeah, rook d7, and still we don't have knight f6 available. Remember, if the bishop and knight ever trade, that actually favors Magnus. So you have to be super careful as Hikaru that you don't just liquidate into some endgame here. You have to keep the queens on the board, probably keep the minor pieces on the board, and make use of your activity. Maybe rook d7 should be met with rook a to b1. It's so weird that the rook on b7 is hanging and you're just casually continuing to play. <laughs> Magnus could also move his king up, and if he does, if you're Hikaru, you have to not forget to move the rook away from, you know, b7. That's like when your credit card expires and, you know, you stop play paying, your power goes off. You're like, wait, what happened? <laughs> hey, you need to update your card, man. And he does. That cut, that cut, uh, that got real dark real quick. Yeah, dark. <laughs> and I wasn't talking about the power. <laughs> rook c6. Rook c6. And I think we should point out, because you've been mentioning that diagonal, that this was a one of the only squares where knight f6 could be met by queen takes f6. So you weren't losing the queen there. Exactly. And king g7 was played. The rook is no longer on b7. It's now actually not even on b6 anymore. It's on b8. But it doesn't mm -hmm. have too many squares along the 8th rank. Wait a minute. Rook g8 check. Rook g8 check. What a oh, move. Oh, wow. 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 Because Magnus, Amon, Magnus moved the rook away from d7, so the queen on d5 lost its defender. And I think Hikaru has a close to a technically winning position. Yeah, so it really relies on this a pawn. Can we actually get, like, pick up this pawn? Black is going to be trying to win. First of all, if these pawns could disappear from the board, the a pawns for either side, big benefit for Magnus. He wants everything on one side of the board and just have his nice cozy position all in the dark squares and say, hey, let's make a draw. Could we do a very quick instant replay on rook g8 check just for, for newer players to, to see that again three moves ago? Rook g8 and check. Yeah, go ahead, Amon. It just happened so quick that we didn't even see the brilliancy symbol pop up because it absolutely <laughs> was one. Rook to g8, checking the king. And Dania, it's almost like what you mentioned earlier. That's the right thought process to have. You mentioned the rook on d8 guarding the queen. Well, he found an amazing way to create that position again with a hanging queen on d5. So well explained, Amon, and keenly aware of how every move impacts the position. Rook d7 to c7. That's a small move, but with big ramifications. He will release the queen, and now Hikaru has a queen against a rook and a bishop. But the game, not only is it not over, but Magnus has somehow found a way to guard yep. the a6 pawn. And I actually think he's managed to build up a fortress two moves ago. I, agree. I think Hikaru found the wrong way uh, to target that a pawn. It allowed Black's rook to slide back to the sixth rank. And I think Hikaru is going to keep trying, maybe get his king over to the queen side. But are his winning chances realistic at this point? I think they're quite low um, with this. Basically, every piece in black's position is defended on a safe square, right? Absolutely everything defends something else. So there's no weaknesses. And you need something to target. And I don't know what that something is going to be. And imagine how frustrating this is. And this is a, an indelible component of facing Magnus Carlsen. You find one brilliant move after another, two moves with yep. the same theme on rook b7, yep. and then rook g8 check. Bang, bang, bang. The narrative is spun. You played a brilliant game. Boom. You stare down the barrel of a position where you have absolutely no way to make progress. This is what makes Magnus into Magnus. He can receive as well as he can give. Mm hmm. I mean, Basically, what we're seeing here is probably going to be a very long game with no like no end in sight. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't see how 
you're going to do this. There are some cases where you can sack the queen, but in this position, there's so many pawns for black that I don't think you can get that adventurous. Yeah, and Magna's got a little adventurous there, moved his rook away from the eighth rank. You know, that's like the, the baseball player uh, who's leading and drops back to the base as soon as the a6 pawn is attacked. The thing mm -hmm. is, you, you don't have any Zugzwang potential because if black runs out of rook moves, Magnus could just shuttle his king. There we go, from g6 to g7. But look at Hikaru chiseling his way through those weak squares. But Magnus is unconcerned. King f5 here could be met with yep. bishop e7. Or oh, even threatening King G6. takes E6. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's that about the only joke. threat you could dream <laughs> For of. For newer players, that was a joke. Pinned pieces protect. Very good. <laughs> yeah, this is like the only idea, right? Sometimes, let's say you're playing queen against rook. Imagine the bishop wasn't there. There are ideas like sacking the queen for the rook, but when you have that extra piece, it's simply not an option, and he decides to call it quits before these guys, you know, bang their head against the wall too many times <laughs> without, <laughs> without getting anywhere. Okay, we have a Berlin here, a rookie one Berlin. Do you think Magnus Carlsen still doesn't believe in fortresses after that game? Yeah, he's probably... Ever since he said that, I'm sure <laughs> there's been... Again, everyone is like, hey, Magnus, <laughs> fortress. <laughs> Ooh, like, I sure. thought he said, wait, why did he resign if he doesn't believe in fortresses? You know? <laughs> exactly. It's like, Magnus, I thought you didn't believe. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. It changed your opinion. I'm sure he's anybody? tired of it, but yeah, he benefited from one there. They do exist. Um, and he's he's obviously saying thank you to uh, the fortresses for that one. You know, that's in the same category as the, the Anish Giri draw memes. Like, he had one tournament in his entire career where he <laughs> exactly. drew all the games. And then six years, oh, draw Anish Giri. I'm so funny, you know. He, he's like, yeah. he never played another tournament with even 50% of draws. And, and people are still harping on it. <laughs> now, speaking of fortresses and draws, this rookie one variation has an interesting reputation, Amon. It is played by some players as a way to liquidate and make a draw, but it can also be played for a win, and Magnus is yep. obviously in the latter category. He really is, and Magnus uh, has always been able to put little bits of pressure on this specific variation in the Berlin, and yeah, it looks so symmetrical, but I, I would highlight the one key difference between the two positions, the knight on c6. Black doesn't really have that c6 pawn structure, which is so solid, the b7 pawn on ideas like queen b3 is a little bit uh, weaker. The bishop on c8 needs to stay there. And the d5 pawn for the exact same reason. So structurally, Magnus has what is basically the best pawn structure against mm -hmm. the knight on c6. Great insight, Amon. And of course, you could say, well, I could drop that knight away from c6 and play the move c6. But then mm -hmm. the e5 score is weakened. And that's why we see Hikaru taking fairly drastic measures to keep that square protected and trying to restrict the knight on f3. Yeah. I think he is likely to play a move even like knight c6 back to b8 in order uh, to secure the pawn on d5, especially since that pawn is now x-rayed by the bishop that Magnus has fianchettoed. He's executed um, on the same maneuver two games in a row. In the last game, we saw bishop f8, g6, and bishop g7. Here we see yeah. bishop d3 to f1 to g2, and we do see Hikaru reinforcing his pawn just in time. Yeah, and, and the players, obviously, were, were operating at, uh, simply speaking, the highest level of chess. So Magnus knows that precise moment that, you know, you don't want to play c4 when the knight's on uh, c6, but as soon as the knight moves away and it's about to be strengthened, he hits with c4. He's happy to take this isolated pawn position because, look, he's playing this position for a win. He's not trying to just draw, you know, make it symmetrical. Magnus has imbalanced things, and honestly, chances for both sides here. Yeah, he has unbalanced things, and I love seeing this because the rookie one Berlin can lead to some long, drawn-out, boring structural games. Now mm -hmm. we actually have a fairly dynamic position with a lot going on in the center. I'll point out that knight takes f6 check is a good try because queen takes f6, drops the rook on e8. Unfortunately, that pawn is also protected by the knight on d5. So a dream scenario for white is to take that knight off the board. That's why I would consider a move like knight e4 back to c3 as passive as it seems. The issue, though, I'm on is that the bishop from c8 could come up to e6 and black could continue reinforcing his control over the d5 square yeah v very important to understand that like the d5 square is what this entire game is all about um oh. bishop e6 i mean uh he <laughs> went for your your move there is it time for bishop e6 it feels so logical I think bishop e6, Magnus is actually kind of bailing out. He's probably going to take on d5, then take yep. on e8 and take on d5 again. And we spoke a little bit too soon about the pawn structure getting unbalanced. It's going to get rebalanced. And I think the game is going to head in a very balanced direction subsequently. 
yeah, I think, you know, at, if it's our prerogative to uh, raz on the chat for, you know, the, the Anish draw stuff, I think it's fair for them to be like, oh, yeah, commentators, that's the super exciting position, and a draw. <laughs> yeah, take that <laughs> super exciting position. How about when yeah. a pawn appears on d5? <laughs> Bishop takes d5, and here's that variation, 93. takes 93. Oh, <laughs> You know what this reminds me of? Those those uh, reversed time travel movie scenes where the, the objects that were crashed on the floor are put back together and moved back to the table. Order is restored. We had a Berlin, and we end with a Berlin. Now, it should be pointed out that this position can be agreed to a draw in this position. I <laughs> it should be. Point that out, would But you? I forgot what I was about to say. Goodbye, <laughs> and next game. <laughs> Three draws now. Yeah, it's like, oh, these guys have the best win rates in chess. <laughs> That's what happens when the <laughs> highest win rates go against one another, by the way. We have such an even match. But remember, there's that early lead that uh, Magnus took from that victory. So he's basically, that's the only difference between the two players right now. I mean, what do you make of the match in the early stages, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating that every single game uh, has started out as a Rui Lopez. That in and of itself is an interesting little factoid. I don't know if we've ever had an SEC game where the first five games were the same opening from both sides. But to answer your question, Amon, it is a balanced match. I think we are going to see more excitement in these games as the match yeah. heads down the stretch, especially if one player develops a two or three point lead because his opponent will then have no choice but to take a little bit more risk. But I still think we're less than halfway through the five minute portion. The players are still in the kind of settling in phase. They don't want to take too many big risks. I think that's yeah. totally understandable if you put yourself in their shoes. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned no big risks. Playing the same opening is definitely in that wheelhouse. They're, they're not looking to get too adventurous, playing a structure, and they're just trying to find those minute differences, you know, small inklings of an advantage that they might be able to claim. Uh, for example, bishop b3 was tried by Hikaru. We saw knight h2, queen f3. Now we're seeing a4. So just different ideas. You may be like, why, why on earth are they switching up like 10, 15 different ideas in the same opening? It's because he's just probing to see how his adversary is going to respond and whether or not maybe he can use this opening over and over again. And given that Magnus and good call him on knight h2 once again on the board preparing queen f3 uh, and knight g4, knight f5, you know, that I kind can, of I, I know a mistake. Uh, <laughs> I know a mistake when I see one, when uh, I Daniel. See, yeah. <laughs> and uh, on that note, I would take a quick detour as we see Magnus immediately striking in the center with d5. Very logical move. Hikaru has moved a piece away from the center and the textbooks command it. Magnus plays mm -hmm. it, d5 on the board, and we will see a different pawn structure uh, in previous games, Hikaru allowed Magnus's pawn to reach uh, d4. But I would hesitate to call knight h2 a mistake. You know, any of these move assignments before move 20 or 25, we should take them with a grain of salt because a move that changes the eval from equal to minus 0.3, let's chill out a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Like, an insanely harsh evaluation there. Like, yeah. so, someone at chess.com is like, <laughs> yeah. not, not a perfect move by Hikaru? <laughs> Okay, what do we make of this pawn structure transformation, Amon? First thoughts to me are pretty positive for Black. He's got the space advantage. He's got that, like, reverse Morozzi bind structure mm -hmm. that holds the d3 pawn on a weak square. On the other hand, Hikaru does have some pretty good prospects for his knights, speaking of which. Yeah, there we go. We talk about greener pastures. Knight on e3 looking to uh, return to uh, its former glory. I do think that Magnus should be happier with the developments uh, in the position so far. It just feels like uh, Hikaru had a little more going on when he kept it closed and played for his queen f3 idea. But here, the d3 pawn is such an obvious target and b4 played. Your idea once again, Dania, he's trying to get c4, he's trying to get pawn takes b4, but Hikaru is never gonna play those moves. And the drawback of b4 is that it weakens the c4 square. Something tells me Magnus will not <laughs> miss the fork on b7. Whoa. Beautiful. Man, I'm going to ask you to do that again in a bit. <laughs> yeah, you know, that just was be, on, be on the lookout anytime <laughs> we get close to that square. I if don't know Magnus, why. It's just... If Magnus misses a fork on b6, you're going to have to do that again. Okay, that's fair. I can uh, I can, uh, I can, do that for you. Uh, knight c4 threatening knight b6. And, I mean, bishop takes c4. You might look at it and be like, okay, double pawns? Why would we, why would we not play that move, right? Uh, four pawns against three, and... 
Well, I was about to explain why we wouldn't, uh, but now I'm perplexed. <laughs> it's the second time that Magnus has done that. Remember, I did that in game one where, or game two where there was that capture on B3. And Magnus, in, in the early going of the match, I don't know how to formulate this correctly, but he's playing very concretely. When there is a possibility of, of seriously changing the pawn structure or transforming the game, I think he usually goes for it. He keeps trying to face Hikaru with new difficulties in the position. At the same time, I don't think that this is a particularly challenging position for white to right. hold, even though Hikaru's down a pawn. Look at black's pawns on the queen side. A6, C5, they're weak. White's bishops are nicely harmonized. Black's bishop on F8 leaves a lot to be desired. So I'm actually not the biggest fan of this particular transformation. I think Magnus could have fought for the advantage by keeping the structure as it was. Totally. And it's actually so much that I think the move C4 by black almost inviting to potentially lose the c-pawn in the future, maybe to a5, rook c4. You might want to do this because then you can go rook c8, bishop c5, and try to make your own trades. Your point is well taken. And so I would consider the move bishop to b3 or bishop to d3. Well, bishop d3 gives up the d5 score for black's knight. But bishop right. b3, it freezes yep. the pawn on c5. And you could stick your bishop later on on c4. You could start massaging the a6 pawn. So in an ideal world, the best setup would be bishop b3 and then a5 and bishop c4. Magnus, of yep. course, is not going to allow 20% of that. <laughs> exactly. I was just thinking of a, of a line like bishop c3. Uh, or sorry, bishop b3, excuse me, knight e4 looks really logical because, well, we can't go there now. You give up uh, that square by covering d5. I'll take it. And it looks like bishop d5 is a fork. But there's knight c3, Danny, and it just like explodes and probably in a way that Magnus is looking for. And that's a very important line, and that's probably the motivation for bishop d3. That's the impetus behind putting the bishop on a slightly flimsier square and you've yeah. prevented knight e4 some doors close other doors open and magnus opens the door that leads him to d5 hitting the c3 pawn hitting the bishop on e3 hikaru might be banking on the awkward looking move bishop to d2 but i yeah. don't see any big tactics off the top of my head i'm on it's important that knight takes c3 attempting discovery fails to bishop takes c3 and the rook on d1 protects the other bishop yeah, it's, it's such an awkward looking move, although it is exactly where we are trained to put those bishops, right? It covers technically all the, the forward, uh, forward motion squares that I could <laughs> use. Um, and yeah, we want to play maybe bishop c4. The move a5, by the way, it's, it looks like nothing, totally innocuous, but it fixes that pawn on a light square, the one color complex that black just doesn't have as much control over. So a5, controlling knight b6, fixing the pawn, that's a big time move if it could happen. And instead, we see rook a c1 by Hikaru, indicating that he's not opposed to an opposite colored bishop endgame, and neither mm -hmm. is Magnus. Now I think that the probability of a draw has increased tenfold, just because... Okay, technically black is up a pawn, but because of white's monopoly over all the light squares, I yeah. don't honestly see a world in which Magnus develops serious winning chances. Although, that's a very dangerous thing to say when you're watching Magnus in any endgame. That's right, because, I mean, Magnus is probably thinking to himself, okay, opposite bishops, but I have that one extra pawn, and that's why I think Hikaru has quickly gone for bishop b5, closing this open file, and saying, look, you pretty much gotta take. Oh, but Bishop D6, that move sends a very, very clear message, Amon. He's here to play. He's here to play. Yeah, he and wants are his to chances realistic? more here. Uh, I think he's he's definitely in the right to do that because, look, Rook D5, like, you're not going anywhere down the D file, and the king can move over to E7, and then you can try to move your Rook. But the nice thing for Magnus is he always has the bailout Bishop back to E7. So from his perspective, why not go for it? Well, the eval bar is showing us zeros, and that's such a misleading assessment because it's so clear to us that white is on the defensive. He's down a protected passer on f4. And yes, mm -hmm. it's... I wouldn't call it a dead draw. It is a draw, largely because black has such a hard time getting the rook away from d8. That's why I think Magnus might go king e7, but the moment he does, white shuttles the rook over to g1. What you do not want to allow under any circumstances is for a black rook to land on g3, because then white's blockade is going to yeah. be dismembered. Absolutely. I was looking at bishop c4 as a way to even stop. Good call. Um, oh. Oh, sorry, there we go. Yeah. Uh, stops rook g8, right? And if you go to the b file at any point, of course, you'd need this move first, you can always block it again with bishop b5. So I actually don't think Hikaru is going to have any difficulty making this draw. 
Um, and Magnus is probably realizing that he doesn't really have anything. My gosh, if he puts the bishop on d5 and the rook on b1, then Hikaru will control all of the entries and exits in the position. G8, B8, yeah. the D file, only two pieces, and the king on F3, uh, a nice cherry on top, just making sure that black's F pawn never causes any problems. And in a nutshell, as Magnus essentially offers the draw, this is why opposite yeah. colored bishop endgames are so hard to win, because you can never surmount a blockade on the color complex that you don't control. Yep, and just in time, by the way, I know it, it looked like we were just immediately going for the draw, but just pointing out that the bishop was hitting the h-pawn, so king g2 to h3 was actually picture-perfect just in time to guard it, and now the draw is truly in hand. And we're going to have a fourth draw out of five games with Magnus carrying the one-point lead as the first half of the five-minute portion comes to an end. But I don't think anybody, Amon, can rightfully look at this game and say that the players haven't brought their fighting spirit to the table. We called mm -hmm. for an evenly matched affair, and that's what we're getting. Yeah, truly. Um, we're getting a very close match. In fact, the only thing between these players right now is the fact that um, Hikaru had that one sort of major blunder, Bishop A6. So he basically was actually trying to execute a tactic, missed a counter tactic. And then in the game that would have been Hikaru Nakamura's bounce back result, Rook G8, we remember that brilliancy. He won the queen, but Magnus just defended like crazy, found this fortress. And that's the only reason that this match is not deadlocked right now, Daniel. You're totally right. We've had great moments from both players, but ultimately Magnus Carlsen has the edge as the first 45 minutes of the match wind down. Folks, we will go on our first break of the day, and we will be back with the second half of the five-minute portion of the SCC Final in just a couple of minutes. I'm Andrea. And I'm Alex. And we've been playing competitive chess since we were six years old. We started by focusing on classical chess, but later we fell in love with playing Blitz and Bullet Online. Chess has been around for more than 1,000 years, but that doesn't mean that we can't modernize it. Financial systems have been around for even longer. Sounds like it's time for an update. And Coinbase is doing just that, re-envisioning an entirely new financial system that is decentralized and fully transparent. Also, huge thank you to Coinbase for sponsoring competitive chess and making events like the SCC happen. Go to coinbase.com slash update the system to learn more. September bots are here and it's time for a monumental clash. This barbarian might not crush you on the board, but he certainly can crush you with the board. Speaking of crushing, this giant is a living siege tower. Usually found in groups, goblins are fond of sharp, pointy objects and other people's pieces. The battle-hardened Valkyrie might give you a game once she's done arm-wrestling a golem. This hog rider and his noble steed might give you a headache or two. Skeletons adore her, foes fear her. You'll need to bring your A-game if you want to beat this witch. Yes, that probably is a rabbit up his sleeve, or a huge fireball with your name on it. We hear wizards are pretty good at chess. Not just a killing machine, Pekka loves tiny butterflies. But you're probably not a butterfly, so watch out! The Archer Queen thinks highly of herself, and for good reason. She is a skilled tactician, deadly opponent, and your worst nightmare. Play them all on chess.com.
Halfway through the five-minute portion of the long-awaited Speed Chess Championship Final presented by Coinbase in which Magnus Carlsen holds a 3-2 lead over Hikaru Nakamura. It's been a super interesting high-level match full of Rui Lopez games, literally. And <laughs> the SCC is fun not just because we get to watch Magnus versus Hikaru, but because of the story to history. And this story to history at its centerpiece has featured exactly two people. One is Magnus Carlsen. Having a hard time remembering the other one. If only we had some photos of him, Amon. It's a good thing we have precisely five uh, because <laughs> he's won so many times. And it's actually incredible to think about, uh, Daniel, that there's only truly been two champions uh, of the SEC and we have them here facing off. And it's crazy, not just because it demonstrates their superiority over the rest of the field, but also their stability. The fact that mm -hmm. year in and year out, they're somehow able to bring their A game to this tournament in particular, as well as all of the other ones. And I think both have brought the, the, their A game to this match as well. Hard to make any hard and fast conclusions. We've largely had a balanced match, as you said before the break, Amon, with the exception of that one uncharacteristic mistake by Hikaru uh, in the third game, in the second game. That's right, and I actually feel that, okay, that was maybe a more significant blunder because it kind of lost immediately, but in some ways, I feel like both players have committed, you know, that one kind of tactical shot. Um, they missed something. So Hikaru did hit Magnus back with that Rook G8 move, but he just didn't get full credit for the victory. So I do feel like in terms of the overall match, uh, both players are, are thinking to themselves, okay, you know, I see some vulnerability, you know, they're not like seeing absolutely everything. They are human, so mm -hmm. I don't think uh, Hikaru is panicking at a 3-2 score. Magnus will have white in the next game, which will begin momentarily, and I'm curious to see if we will have any opening variability. And as I ask that, we see opening variability on the very first move. Magnus, as uh, the Russian expression goes, changing the record player, you know, just changing the track, mm -hmm. changing the tune, and we now have a completely fresh opening. The Queen's Indian defense is Hikaru's response to this new Magnus Carlsen, the first time in his life that he's ever played 1d4, <laughs> man. <laughs> Yeah, D4, ooh. What a move. Um, I actually think that the Queen's Indian is a rather interesting response by Nakamura. I'm more shocked by that because, uh, let's be honest, Dania, at the highest levels, this doesn't have as strong of a reputation as some of the other more solid uh, opening choices that Block has against D4. Nope, and they're taking a trip right down to the 1970s and 80s. This particular mm -hmm. variation and I'm referring to 5A3, it's called the Petrosian variation. You will never guess who it's named after. I'll leave chat to do the guessing. But this <laughs> featured very prominently in the Kasparov Korchnoi candidate candidates match of, I think, 1983 or something. And then it kind of fell off the map. I think the current evaluation is actually close to equality, but I've always felt that White's control over the center and the ability in the long run for White to develop uh, an attack on the king's side, you could think about a move like e5 later on, and maybe even a Greek gift sacrifice. That makes Black's yep. position a little bit harder to handle. Yeah, and there's an interesting dynamic that often develops in this opening, which is like when the knight goes and commits itself to the d7 square, the move e5 becomes much more likely. It stops knight f6. Knight c5, knight e5, that d4 pawn holds it back. And the knight on f8 is, it doesn't do that much. What you'd love to do after e5 is have a knight on d5. But the knight on d7 has a bit of a hard time getting there. Uh, Whereas knight c6, not as easy. Come on. Didn't you get the memo that the knight can now move in an L shape plus two? Knight b8 to d5? You don't realize oh, that that's a legal move? Now, is it? What are you doing <laughs> commentating the finals of the SE? The man doesn't even know the rules of chess. Uh, unprepared, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> or shall I say, a man doesn't even know the rules of chess. <laughs> it, that was That's not even hilarious. close to your king takes e6 joke, which was the best <laughs> moment of the broadcast so far. We see rook d1 by Magnus Carlsen accumulating pieces in the center. First priority for white Amon is to make sure that white's center is defended, because if the d4 pawn collapses, the entire position collapses. Yeah, the... The other thing about these positions is uh, sometimes you can actually thrust with the move d5, even if it looks like it loses a pawn. You mentioned e5 to open up the bishop. I mean, d5 kind of accomplishes the same thing. It also opens up the queen. So there are some tactical possibilities in the air, but white is being a little cagey as well, not committing that bishop to b2 nor uh, e3 just yet. And again, black is waiting with that knight, the ultimate decision, knight d7 or knight c6. 
Yeah, big question. Knight d7, I think, is the more standard way of developing knight d7 and then maybe knight to f6. And guess what? Mm -hmm. uh, the far-fetched future in which black has access to the d5 square actually becomes reality. But the benefit of putting the knight on c6 is that you apply more direct pressure on, uh, the D f on, on the d4 pawn. There is one tactic to point out, though, Amon, really, really quickly, if it could play this on the board. Let's say white plays yeah. bishop b2 and black plays knight c6. One thing you to be careful about is the move d5. And it might not be that good here, but after ED, ED, oh, look at this. Rook takes D5, I was going to say, fails to Bishop H7 check, and Rook takes D5. But the line goes on. Look at this. Knight to D4 apparently wins back the Rook. Knight D4, Queen E4 check, and then Black has the crucial move F5, and you're tied up hand and foot. You can't take the F5 pawn, and you're going to lose back the exchange with interest. So basic I think calculation, having, really. Yeah. Having calculated that line, Magnus <laughs> plays. Guess what move? Bishop b2. Yep, yep. He saw that one uh, all the way through. Evidently, uh, Bishop b2. And I wonder. Ah. Yeah, this is such a key <laughs> moment. Knight c6 or knight d7. I honestly think the instinct is knight Ooh. d7 because you see knight c6 d5 and you get freaked out. And he's played knight d7 d5. And ironically, d5 actually does work in this version because the e7 bishop is going to hang if Black takes twice. On d5, mm -hmm. there is this weird move c4, c5, c4 by black, but white beats him to the punch. Yeah, and th I think this is, I mean, it's not uh, the end of the world, but it's kind of a small achievement for, for Magnus to play c4 and have this bishop looking at the d5 pawn like that. Sometimes b5 breaks up the team of pawns, but I mean, mm -hmm. if not b5, white can play a4 and I think just has a, not overwhelming, but a comfortable edge. Definitely. That pawn on d5, very impressive looking. That pawn is not going to win you the game. You need other. You need to mm -hmm. develop other assets because right now black does have the defensive firepower to keep that pawn under lock and key. Speaking of yep. other assets, Magnus kind of starting his 401k on the queen side. He's going to go a5 and potentially a6, and he's going to add some Tabasco sauce uh, to that area of the board. And the knight on d7... It, it does do, uh, you know, a, a little bit of work here defending b6. So a5 is not the end of the world. But it would actually love to be on the d6 square. And, you know, again, I didn't get the memo. Maybe they do move like that. Again, I'll have to check Iman, in with you. you. And your, yeah. It would be nice if the knight were, you know, <laughs> in Hawaii sipping a pina colada right now. Uh, so knight f6, knight e8, knight d6 is a very standard maneuver in these types of positions. That's part of the reason Magnus played a4. It's not necessarily because a5 creates such a big effect. It's that if the knight moves away from d7, then yep. a5 seriously targets uh, the b6 pawn. So Hikaru might want to bring his queen back to c7 or d6. Uh, he goes rook a b8. Same type of idea, right? Just making sure that a5 isn't all that dangerous. And now a5 might run into b takes a5 with problems yep. down the b file. So maybe queen c3, sidestepping things. I think that Magnus can play this position fairly slowly because if the knights trade off i think he's a bit better after a5 if the position remains you know how it is right now i i do think he has the edge so magnus is looking to build this into a bigger advantage magnus looking to trade queens man never said that one before <laughs> you know he's pretty good at end games i heard is he man you and your assumptions i, I don't know <laughs> That's been untested. And Hikaru, he does play knight f6, ultimately. I would also draw attention to that bishop on a6, which is doing two things. It's x-raying its counterpart on d3. So if that d3 bishop is, lo is left without supervision, knight takes d5 is a nasty mm -hmm. tactic. The second thing earlier is that white's move a5 could have be been met with b5. That's no longer the case. But now with the right. rooks off the board, a5 just doesn't carry any backup. So you're not really That's targeting right. the b6 pawn. And Magnus is obviously strong enough that he's not going to let something like this happen. But I should point out that if Hikaru can trade the, the bishop for the knight, we mm -hmm. could easily enter an endgame where despite the protected pass pawn, despite the a5 we've been talking about, that Magnus could actually be worse. And that's the type of endgame that, you know, you can win with the knight against the bishop because you're all over the dark squares. Totally. And we see a5 by Carlson. He tries to keep up the heat on the queen side. Black yep. could take on a5, and white can't really recapture it because you drop the e5 of knight. Of course, that's not Magnus's idea. He is trying to separate black's pawn chain and ultimately target that c5 pawn, which will be left without a defender uh, should black take on a5. It's interesting. You know, it's given a question mark here by our very harsh uh, engine analysis, but like my English it's, based, Jesus. it's based on pawn takes and what bravery from Nakamura to just call it out and say, okay, 
You want to play a5 and you can't take it back? Be my guest. But I actually like a5 from a practical standpoint. Magnus also keeping an eye on Hikaru's clock, and he continues to pose difficult decisions as Hikaru mm -hmm. falls now to below a minute. For instance, rook takes e1, queen takes e1. There's a hidden threat. Knight e7 checks suddenly forks the king and the bishop on c8, so you might lose back the a5 pawn. Hikaru has so many problems to solve here, and 37 seconds now on his clock and ticking down that nagging time advantage that Magnus has had throughout the five-minute portion could come in yep. handy here as well. Absolutely. I was thinking maybe bishop to d7, but he made a, maybe a more logical move. a4, get the pawn off the square where it's being attacked. I don't think he's planning to hold on to that pawn, but he would love to finally achieve that long-term goal of a knight on d6. It's just so difficult to do. Over 75,000 people with over 50,000 watching on YouTube and watching as Hikaru tries to hold this difficult endgame with only 25 seconds on his clock. And will they watch as Magnus recaptures on c6 with the pawn? That seems to be the spicier move. It's also potentially yeah. the riskier move. But I would That's play right. DC in a bullet game. I think it's a harder move to face practically. Let's see what Magnus decides here. Yeah, because bishop takes, then we actually do get what I was mentioning earlier, where even though you have that protected pass pawn, I actually think that Hikaru's practical chances are through the roof. Black can actually now win this game. You called it a while ago. You have a knight versus bishop situation. It's an imbalance. And it's also easy for white to accidentally abandon his king. If the queen moves away from e3, look mm -hmm. at how quickly black's queen and knight can combine. Queen f4, well, not anymore, but queen f4, <laughs> knight e4, and you have to keep an eye on your king. I think that's what Hikaru is trying to do. G5, creating a Luft square for his king on g7, and also creating the potential preconditions for counterplay against white's king. That's right. Yeah, g5 is, I mean, he's just probing at this point. A queen trade, we should point out, absolutely favors Hikaru. So we will definitely see Magnus keeping the queen on the board. That's the, the thing that's tying black down to the defense of the c5 pawn, queen a3, right? You'd have to watch both pawns, maybe with queen e7. I'm having a hard time understanding how Magnus makes any progress here. And again, like the previous game, right? Like the opposite color bishop endgame, Black is a monopoly over the dark squares. That queen on d6 is entirely unassailable. It's impervious to attack. And mm -hmm. if that queen remains on d6, I want to see how Magnus tries to unshuffle Hikaru's blockade here. And we're getting our answer. Queen a3, queen c3. But how are you going to make that final bit of progress? Yeah, it looks very difficult to do. And I will say, as Magnus' time gets lower, his position will become more and more frantic to play because there's mm -hmm. not a clear answer here. It's really easy to shuffle a knight on the dark squares, uh, but it's... Draw. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe time for draw offer, yeah. Make sure I think you don't so. accidentally lose game. Queen e4 <laughs> and Hikaru adding a little bit of heat to the center, and suddenly mm -hmm. the time situation has evened up, and bishop takes yep. c6, I think. Magnus might be regretting that choice just about now. Queen b1 I check so. and queen back to e4 would be one way to repeat the position thrice. Magnus might just start going bishop c6, bishop b5, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the moment where oh, if D6. Magnus, ooh, if he goes just a little bit too far, Hikaru's going to switch and play for a win, but he hasn't but done that yet. There was a brief instance where Magnus could have pushed his pawn there to D6 and D7, and that was missed. And that was missed because both players with three seconds on their clock. Who's playing for a win? It might be Hikaru. I wonder, Queen A6 to maybe intend D6. I think he's what he's trying to go for. Oh, that knight was pinned D6 transformation here but it doesn't really change the dynamic of the position magnus queen takes a 70 cars blunder the pawn that's a mistake that is a big mistake now there are real one. winning chances but still drawing chances for nakamura who keeps his piece tandem active but look at that c pawn on it goes mm -hmm. to c6 and hikaru now in big trouble he's got to keep the c7 square under lock and key yep but so difficult to do now bishop oh. d5 you start to panic about the knight is oh, the bishop queen d6. trade good and Hikaru loses. He loses the pawn endgame. Wow. The pawn promotes. And Magnus wins. No, that was that was just an, an outplay. But based on that blunder of the a7 pawn. So he transformed the position with d6, took on c5. And that was the transformation that white needed to finally play for a win. D6 was such a heads-up move, and it's so misleading looking at that with the engine because D6 is unremarkable. It doesn't change the evaluation. Obviously, that yep. resulting position is drawn, but Hikaru was unable to deal with a new set of problems after having defended that other position for 30 moves. This is what makes Magnus into Magnus. He's so good at confronting you with a whole new set of problems just when you think that he's about to acquiesce to a draw. That's not what exactly. Magnus does, and he has a two-point lead him on.
And you know, it's that exact moment I feel like, and I can speak from experience here, you sort of let your guard down. You're like, okay, I've done enough for a draw. He's not making progress. <clears throat> and you start to think to yourself, okay, uh, this is easy. And it's in that exact moment where he uses that, you know, false confidence against you and plays for a win. And you're not prepared. And remember when he started playing bishop c6 to b5 to a4, I think yep. Magnus saw that d6 idea and he had he had marked it and i think he was lulling hikaru into this false sense that he was okay with a repetition but all along i think magnus was looking for an opportunity to unbalance the game and to keep it going incredible end game display but we're on to the next game and we're back to where we started another rui lopez exactly nakamura basically you know he wants to go back to something that's worked there's also uh you know the old uh Russian adage, you know, go and, go ahead and make a draw after a, a tough loss. He doesn't want <laughs> yeah. to just bleed out here and have uh, the momentum really start to build for Magnus. So he's going to something that he's familiar with. And honestly, Hikaru has gotten some great positions with white, but this one looking a lot more symmetrical. Indeed. And one to tie up our discussion of the last game, another encouraging thing for Magnus fans is how he was able to acquit himself in high time pressure situations. This has been Hikaru's calling card even in yep. previous SCC matches, when things get down to five, four seconds, Hikaru's nearly unassailable, but Magnus, well, he was able to assail him in that game, and now we're having some really interesting tension on the queen side. We had a pawn cube briefly. Hikaru trades on b5 and drives his queen to b3. Will we see a rook lift by black? Will we see rook f6 setting up some sort of exchange <laughs> sack on f3? Is this a French? I mean, you would <laughs> like for it to be a French. That's a hilarious idea. It, it actually is not as crazy as you might think. In fact, rook f6, it's uncomfortable because you might want to play knight yeah. d2, but you don't have that time. Do it, Magnus. Rook f6 and knight h2 is typical, but g4 is a bit of a dead end. Even if the knight gets to g4 and the rook slides back to e6, now the bishop on right. e3 is occupying you know, your apartment with Central Park views, and that knight might have to drop back to h2. Magnus taking the opportunity instead to target the a3 pawn. Can Hikaru take twice on c5? I think Magnus is intending knight f4 at the end of that line. Yeah, I almost want to just pull up an analysis board and show how quickly Let's do it. Um, you know, things can go wrong. If you think that uh, Magnus Carlsen has just hung a pawn, well, you might be right that it's hanging, but I look at knight f4, rook mm -hmm. g6, queen h3, Dania, and yeah, for the price of a pawn, uh, I, I'm not interested anymore. Totally. And apparently knight f4 before bishop takes c5 is even more accurate. The reason why is that e5 pawn isn't hanging here and it threatens mm. knight e2 with a fork. But your point is well taken, Amon. I would calculate bishop takes c5 and knight f4 and just on the basis of that position, particularly when Magnus Carlsen is sort of sitting in front of you. I mean, he's actually yep. sitting in, in Oslo, but you get what I'm saying. I would rule that line out. Not fun. That's a good point. Yep. Great point. And instead... Oh, well, he's actually... Still pondering. I don't think he's thinking about taking pondering? that pawn, but... <laughs> is he pondering? <sighs> he is. The he unintentional pawn I'm on, you are, you are breaking new ground, truly. Is, does that mean I'm good at it or bad at it? You're good at it. It's, it's the okay. highest form of humor, I think, the unintentional okay. pawn. <laughs> it means the puns are... You have internalized them. That's how yeah, naturally they, they flow come naturally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> G3, speaking of pawns, Hikaru how about using the, his pawns... Uh, Best double attack you've ever seen. Rook f6. The old, the old, the old rook f6. King g2 defends both the knight and the pawn at the same time. So that's what mm -hmm. he was pondering. Nice one, Daniel. Nice one. Well, I'm just living off the fact. I'm, I'm riding the coattails, you know. I'm yeah. like one of those <laughs> fanboys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if those. you can't beat him, join him. The high school English plagiarist, you know. <laughs> yeah, I totally invented that phrase. G3, King, G2. And you know what? G3 is exactly how you want to react on a, you know, a more global scale to a knight on G6. The move G3 is exactly the way you want to handle it. In fact, we've seen Magnus play the move G6 to handle White's knight on G3 in almost every Rue Lopez game. So now things are reversed. G3 is a move that we might take for granted when we see it played. Oh, you know, of course, he's stopping knight F4. But how many people would, would have the, the cojones to actually play G3 against Magnus Carlsen. I think it's a great positional right. move. It's based on accurate calculation because if rook f6 works, it wins the game. You have to see king g2. And yep. I actually am starting uh, to become more partial to Hikaru's position here because he clamps down on the d5 square. The bishop on f8 struggles to find 
uh, a clear role to play. And that's why Magnus, sensing the moment, explodes the center with d5. Excellent, excellent move and good awareness of the game not going in your direction. So it's time to change the tenor of the game. Yeah, and he's done exactly that with d5 because rook d6, no matter how it gets taken, you might trade the queens first, but rook d6 in order to take on uh, d5 or to take on d3 in the event of, uh, you know, uh, down the line, that pawn just might be hanging. b4 is also loose. So, in fact, taking this pawn might be worse for you in the, in the long run. Well, I'm afraid to ask what happens after e takes d5 because I get that if you play queen takes d5, black can trade queens and play rook d6. I guess yep. e takes d5, rook d6. Oh, look at this line. Ed, rook d6, rook c5. We can put it on the board. Let's bring up the analysis And suddenly, board. whoop, rook back to f6. Oh, no, queen takes h3. Because by sliding a rook away from e6, you've also opened up an attack on the h3 pawn. Great mm -hmm. whole board awareness by Carlson. So after rook d6, Ikara would have to leave the d pawn on pre. I'm going to give some credit to your move, though. Uh, you know, yeah, a not double bad. attack okay, here. Okay, very nice. Yeah. But here king g2 and okay if you take c5, where white has connected passers. Yeah, okay, maybe not so clear. That's a good yeah. point. Even <laughs> even better, queen takes h3, but point is, not interesting at all for Hikaru nope. to, to transition into that. I would play queen takes d5. If I'm facing Magnus, just liquidate, get the queens mm -hmm. off the board. And he does just that. d5 was such an all-star move by Magnus. Oh, speaking of which, rook c5. Yeah. Hey, there's a, there's a great double attack. I don't know if you saw it, uh, Daniel. Rook f6. Ah, where did you find that, Amon, in some, like, Remote flea market, uh, you know, Rook F6. Just another uh, Hamilton original, you know. Oh, Hamilton original. Rook F6, <laughs> though, we should now point out, because this point has become more central in the mm -hmm. end game. After Rook F6, for instance, Knight D2, taking on yeah, C5 I'll to me, to me, this is out of the question. Even if the eval bar doesn't rise too much, just look at white spawns. Look at the Knight on D2, which is going to jump with great effect to E4. This just yep. doesn't seem appetizing to me. Most importantly, this isn't necessary because Carlson could play the calm of rook b8, guard the d5, uh, the b5 pawn, and then surround the d5 pawn slowly. And, I mean, look at that. Rook b8 played. You called it, Daniel. This move is so patient, just understanding that you have the time in the position to collect this pawn later. H4, though, Hikaru trying to make Magnus regret it and trying to take his attention away from the E5 pawn. But H5, he meets him at the top. And the G5 mm -hmm. square, can it, can it be used as a transit point for White's knight? You know what the problem is, Amon? If you play knight G5 and Black's rook drops back along the D file, not rook F6, but rook right. D8, then Black will be threatening bishop takes C5 and then rook takes D5. So the exchange That's stack right. will lose its luster. Yeah, you cannot go for that. I think he needs to do that right about now. And he goes to yep. d8 and not d7 because I think rook c8 he wanted to avoid. And again, the time situation. Again, it's that nagging, irksome 45-second time advantage that Magnus has put to such good use when the mm -hmm. game becomes critical, when it becomes tactical. Love what Hikaru did there. Rook c7, that's the best square for the rook. And don't sleep on knight g5 because now that it hits the f7 pawn, this move yeah. is a lot more tempting to me. And bishop takes b4. I like this move. Knight g5, maybe bishop back to e7, hitting the knight, Ooh. ready to take on d5. Bishop a7. These guys are playing on every side of the board. Incredible. Rook b7. Why bishop a7? To open up the b7 square for the rook. Why open up b7 for one rook? To open up c7 for the other. And we're going to get likely Amazing. piggies on the 7th. Knight h8. Tripled, <laughs> tripled on the 7th here. Are we going to get a knight h8 sighting on his own volition? Usually that move is only played if the knight is kicked away by a pawn. <laughs> but here, that move might be played in order to guard f7. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on, Magnus. Please go knight h8. <laughs> Just for the for the culture. Uh, for, the, for the memes, you know. And he does. Hey. <laughs> and knight g5. Hikaru is not stopping there. Yeah, knight g5 is the natural follow-up. And I think we might get to a situation where uh, the bishop drops back to f8, guards g7. You kind of admit that you can't keep guarding f7. But no, d4, he wants to clarify the center and maybe pick up that b pawn. What's mesmerizing about the, this game is how both players are using the board as their canvas. They're like two artists Amazing. painting on the left side and in the middle. And Hikaru striking everywhere. But Magnus... Look at the defensive <laughs> construction that he has adopted on the king side. It's it would survive a nuclear apocalypse. And truly, let's not forget the bishop is also <laughs> defending the b pawn. So if pieces start to trade, it's actually going to be Magnus of all people who walks away saying, "I actually might play for a win." 
I'm not a big soccer fan, but when people describe watching Lionel Messi, I've heard it described as you think that you have more than 11 men on your field. When you watch Magnus and Hikaru handling their pieces, you almost feel like they have more pieces on the board to start with. They've like found a cheat code. <laughs> watch out though if you're Carlson. Bishop back to F8. I think a repetition mm -hmm. of moves is likely. Hikaru, he has enough compensation for the pawn in the form of his incredible piece activity. He yep. goes for it though. Hikaru playing for a win here but I don't really see a future in this position. And he does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. He does, and that's all that matters. You know? <laughs> exactly. I think long-term, the most that he could hope for with everything so defended on the king side is, yeah, he can win the B-pawn, but it will trade a pair of minor pieces. And, you know, the knight on H8, as silly as it looks, oh. is actually an amazing defender. Come on, what knight on H8? And now it's Magnus who goes for it. He says, you let my knight back in the game, I'm going to make you pay for it. But now there's mm -hmm. a rank pressure, and I think we're going to get liquidation and finally a draw now guaranteed yeah a draw guaranteed but you know the most moral of victories for magnus having the knight against the bishop it's like haha -ha. <laughs> and that was a real test for magnus because he was under pressure from the early middle game hikaru did some great stuff on the queen side and every time that magnus had to find an important move to stay afloat he did he found d5 he found knight h8 he arranged his pieces perfectly, and Magnus is just indicating that he is in phenomenal form yet again. He is. Um, I mean, Hikaru Nakamura is step for step with him, but just to be able to do that oh. on defense is very, very impressive. Magnus letting his clock run down there to, like, one second, but now he builds it back up, and it, is he, like, playing for a win here? Does Hikaru think, yeah. need to be a little bit careful? King h1. Knights are, are tricky pieces. And with yeah. the king cut off here, this is not <laughs> this is not nothing. I've played Magnus in enough bullet games to know that he can win with no pieces on his clock. And Hikaru, he seems annoyed. I don't know what he's annoyed about. This is still a draw. Me? I'm wondering as well whether it's like he's annoyed with himself for having to be the one defending or Whoa. Huh? huh? Whoa, 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 whoa. What are We're what is going on some... here? <laughs> whoa. We're seeing what? some kind of pre-moves, and maybe that was the reaction. He pre-moved bishop f2 or something? But, wait, Magnus is black here. He gave up a bishop. Wait, what on earth? Hikaru could have captured that immediately and won the game. I think and now he it's must have pre-moved it, which is why he's, like, just thinking to himself, I can't believe I just played so quickly. We're going to have to do an instant replay after this game totally. finishes. Unbelievable. Like, yeah, just now. Nothing to say after that. I thought that it was a glitch, Amon. I thought that the board lagged or something, but no, it didn't. Magnus had made a false pre-move, and Hikaru had responded with a pre-move instead of capturing that free knight. <laughs> that was so strange, but here we are in this here position. He's trying to play bishop f8. Uh, let's be clear. Even after uh, that, well, let's call it a, a blunder is what it was initially, it would have been immediately lost for Magnus. But when he did win the piece, it was at the cost of both of his pawns, so, yeah, I think this is actually going to be a draw anyway. And there's just no way to make progress. That's the whole point. If both pawns disappeared, this game would last for another couple of hours. But as yep. it stands, that king on g6 is on a perfect defensive position. Magnus did a great job of adjusting. You know, he blundered that piece, but he didn't panic. He found the only narrow path to a draw. And again, I will point out for the 100,000 of you in the chat who are sitting there saying, I didn't see what happened. Like, what on earth just happened? Why is Hikaru up a minor piece? we will quickly revisit that moment and try to explain retroactively what happened. Yeah, right now it's uh, it's Wait, all about this rook and bishop. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Magnus is playing so sloppy here. Rook b7, he's blundered the g-pun. Yeah, but he rook got his idea. And he had rook a8 there, I think, but he's just doing everything possible to give Hikaru winning chances. Yeah, that's true. Rook a8 is a, is a good spot, but hang on. That pawn will most... I think you could probably find a way in 50 moves to, to win that pawn. What do you think, Daniel? I think you could surround it eventually. I There are a bunch of fortresses with rook, pawn, and king against rook, bishop, and king. And this might be one of them. This might be a situation where as long as you keep the rook on a6, Sikar actually has no way to surround the f6 pawn. I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it almost feels like one of those uh, you know potential worst-case scenarios for Hikaru where he's played... You know, so well, and what, is he going to come out of this with just another draw? Like, he's itching to get that one full point converted because he's had so many opportunities, just not quite enough in terms of an evaluation.
man, but this would be so huge. If something crazy happens and Magnus blunders the pawn and loses yep. the subsequent endgame, that would be so... That would be deci- remarkable. That would decisively change the momentum and the, and the tenor of this match. So Magnus has to keep his, his, his annoyance in check. Hikaru just continues to, you know, make those motions. I, I mean, I would be happy that I even have the extra bishop to begin with. I mean, what what's yeah. going on here? <laughs> Yeah, the, the players are reacting to something, so it's like, I can't wait to see what it is. What it is, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if there was yet rook? another blunder. Because <laughs> they have too much time to be flagging. Yeah, I mean, if white blunders the rook, he actually loses because black has the f-pawn. Maybe and, the bishop yeah. got blundered, and then <laughs> now it's Magnus pushing with one pawn. Oh, what? Whoa, what? <laughs> what just happened? We need so many instant replays right now. Well, clearly, we just I'm got on, teleported into the future. We were lagging on like 20 moves, and we were. Those 20 moves were made, and Magnus lost the game. And I have the next to. Game starts, least, we have to look over what happened. I need to at least go back to where that pawn was won. How was it that, lost? I don't know how that even occurred. It's just a dead fortress. Hikaru went around the side. He went around the side, and somehow. Amazing. He somehow got the pawn, and then he won That's it. That's incredible. That's and truly then he incredible. Won. Insane. And then I'm going to fast forward, because they played so many moves. They were just coming instantly. I'll just show the finish of this bishop and knight. Or, uh, sorry, bishop and rook. <laughs> they don't have knight, that many pieces. <laughs> didn't get the memo I'm on. It was blundered. <laughs> and, and then, oh wow. Oh, my gosh. Stopping oh the rook from gosh. going to a5. And, I mean... <laughs> I'm not even sure what just happened there. Are we on to the next game? I'm looking for the next game here. I don't think we are just yet. Um, I think maybe the players are, are adjusting to this new reality. <laughs> I have Magnus so many losing. questions and not enough answers. First of all, Magnus had no business pre-moving with four seconds on the clock in that night. He got too comfortable, I think, being in the driver's seat of that end game, And then suddenly he gives up the night. Then he gives up yep. one pawn, then another one. And then the thing we haven't talked about, he actually lost Rook and Bishop versus Rook, which for newer players yes. is a theoretical draw, which means with best play, you are supposed to be able to make a draw. But there's no one better than Hikaru at squeezing wins quite like this one. Yeah, and for more experienced players, it's a theoretical draw as well, um, just yeah. so you know. Um, and Magnus would make it in a classical game. He, he would. The thing about what we just witnessed is... You know, we could say whatever we want about, oh, you know, Hikaru pre-moved, he missed that free piece. Let's focus on what actually did happen. He he actually played a game against Magnus, and he won Rook and Bishop against Rook and two pawns. It feels like, oh, he's got that extra piece. Yeah, he always had winning chances. No, that is so dead drawn. It's actually incredible that he was able to win that. And not in my wildest dreams would I think Magnus, of all people, could lose that position. You need a momentum boost as Hikaru Nakamura, you just got it. I would n- not to be the Debbie Downer of the party as, as we see the next game underway. And, and I just think we see it in Magnus's body language. He might still be incredulous. He might just think, I, I, I'm going to wake up from this any moment now. But yep. the reality is he's still up a point in the match. We're still in our first segment. So the objective effect of this game on the course of the match is probably not as big as I think some people might make it out to be, especially because I think Hikaru has misplayed the subsequent game, and I think Magnus is even angrier now. He's got an even bigger chip on his shoulder. <laughs> yeah, and I think and he's gotten what he wanted. Totally. If anyone is you know, wondering, yes, we did miss the opening, but hey, newsflash, it was the same opening as every other game. So uh, that's a consolation prize here as we are now up to speed. And I wanted to add one last thing as we see queen d2 by Carlson connecting his rooks, setting up the potential threat of bishop takes h6. He's got more space, better pieces. Hikaru's position riddled with pawn weaknesses. And bishop takes h6 right now has to be seriously considered. Last thing I'm on, when the eval bar was showing TB, um, when they transitioned to rook and bishop, no, it did not self-diagnose tuberculosis. Instead, it refers to table base, and table base refers to all of the positions with seven pieces or under having been studied. So chess is actually a partially solved game, and the evaluation table base was a draw. That's what it means yeah. when the eval bar switches to TB. That's a good explanation and much needed because it's like, hey, hang on, where's my evaluation? Where's especially, my email? <laughs> <laughs> especially when it switches from TB to uh, checkmate in two at the very end. 
Okay, the elephant in the room. Literally yeah, the I mean, elephant. Because <laughs> Look, he's going to play it. He had time to think about it, Daniel. That's the thing. He had four minutes, and guess what? He's pissed off from that last game, so of yeah. course he's going to do it. And the other bishop, and when I say elephant uh, in Russian and in some other languages, bishop is elephant, so that was the pawn. Look at the exquisite play, again, using both sides of the board. Bishop b3. Uh, does he have a yep. threat on? Uh, What's yeah, that arrow? Uh, Blundering the well, queen you there. Well, you know, uh, pin <laughs> pieces, uh, I heard they defend, but they actually don't, not here. Queen takes g6 after bishop b3 is the now elephant in the room, and uh, knight h8. I know he might be trying to uh, steal an idea, but uh, does not work as well here. Knight f5 threatens oh, checkmate no. on g7, and queen f8, you've got the f6 knight to pick up. And the problem is Hikaru tries to stir up some complication. I think that was the only move, the only feasible move, is that Black's right. minor pieces are dangling, and without pawns to protect them, Black essentially can't multitask. Black can't simultaneously keep his king protected and keep both of his knights under control. That's why I would play knight takes e5 right now, and only after the knight leaves g6 would I jump with the other knight to f5. That's essentially wow. a double attack, right? It's a double attack on the queen on g7, yep. but also on f6. And when the queen drops back to f8, you can simply start picking up black's minor pieces, none of right. which are protected by a pawn. None of the four are protected <laughs> by a pawn. Yeah, and that's a really high level calculation there. Knight takes, and then an intermezzo knight f5, but you stumble upon these ideas when you realize knight f5, as tempting as it is, queen f8 meets it so well. So you want to move that knight from g6 or force it to move. The move pawn takes on e5, Daniel, is pretty much achieving the exact same thing. Black has to get the queens off the board. Even if it comes at the cost of a minor piece, you might want to just go queen f8 and bite the bullet. White's got this sick response, queen h6 to c1, actually. Hitting the bishop on c6, I will confess, I didn't find that move on my own. But <laughs> if Hikaru saves this one with a minute now on his clock, I would be even more shocked than I was given the proceedings of the last game. And I think after knight f5, we might see resignation very shortly. Yeah, knight f5, queen f8, um, talking about forced moves. Queen takes on uh, f6, and maybe he's trying to get something going with like knight takes f3, doubling the pawns, rook e6, rook g6, swinging over in that direction. So I feel like that might be what Hikaru is thinking about. He knows, as well as Magnus, that there's no way this works out for him, but nope. you still have to find something. King h1, just get, let go of that bishop, get away from it, because king take, the bishop is radioactive, right? Knight g4 yep. check is going to pick up white's queen and lead to a complete liquidation. It's I love it when you leave a piece on pre like this and play king h1. That produces such a nice aesthetic effect, at least for yep. me. Totally. And and this is a reminder, like bishop f2, I'll admit, I didn't even think nope. of it because <laughs> Neither the, <did> the, I. <laughs> the moves were so overwhelming for white that... To be honest, it maybe wasn't necessary, but that, you know that's a fault of mine. I didn't even see this counter shot. Hikaru is truly so resourceful, but Magnus just does not need to bite on this bait. Bishop takes f2 here. And he can. He can play king takes f2, and when the smoke clears, he will be up a, a pass pawn on defense. In fact, he'll be up two pawns, but we know right. how good Hikaru is at manufacturing chances in lost endgames. It's the, it, you know, the, the quintessential unstoppable force meets immovable object. Both of these players are such wizards in the end game that I wouldn't flirt uh, with yep. with even an iota uh, of possibility that Hikaru builds up some sort of fortress. Magnus calculating it, if he plays King H1, he virtually ends the game on the spot. Yeah, but you gotta have the confidence to do that because in some ways, King takes F2 is kind of a stable edge. You know you have the couple extra pawns later, whereas this, you know, there's Knight takes F3, there's Bishop takes E1. Rook uh, e6 to g6. You have to be sure that you're not actually throwing the game away by by miscalculating here. So oh. a riskier approach, but the correct one. And here's what Magnus had to see. Rook g6 would have run into knight e7 check with a fork. That was critical. And Hikaru blocks with the knight. He tries to keep some intrigue on the board. But I would yep. just go rook f1 here. I would just move the rook away. Everything is hanging. And Hikaru is okay. going to start dropping minor pieces here. What a game. Yep. What a win by Carlson to rebound from that shocking loss in the previous one. It's it's really impressive just from a, a mental standpoint to be able to do that, right? <laughs> to, to bounce back from uh, getting checkmated, Rook and Bishop against Rook. He even had two pawns on the board. The outplay from Hikaru in the previous game was insane. You know, full credit to Hikaru, but to just basically silence everyone, it's like by the time we had appreciated that, he had already gone and won another game.
And speaking of full credit, we wanted to credit the over 100,000 of you watching this amazing SEC Finals match presented by Coinbase uh, across the, the various platforms. You know, when I say that I appreciate people taking time out of their busy Fridays, these are not just cliche words. Uh, th this is not just boilerplate. We truly appreciate uh, the chat and the, the energy that people bring it. It lends a magical quality uh, to these events and these matches, and it makes them truly unforgettable. So give yourself a pat on the back, everybody. We hope you're enjoying the match, and we've got the best yet to come. We have two more segments. Uh, the match oh, remains yeah. close, yeah. even though Magnus is up by two. He's only up by two, and he's, like, played the best SCC segment <laughs> in history. That's no, truly. playing Hikaru uh, in a nutshell. <laughs> It's like 99% accuracy beats 97% accuracy or something. I know. Now, what's going on here, Amon? You're the French expert. This didn't start out as a French, but it certainly looks like one. Uh, well, you see this, uh, this G5 uh, move? Uh, oui. Yeah, uh, oui, mais... G4, I mean, ah, <laughs> Maybe we should ask um, Laurent Fressinet what he thinks of this position. Yeah. Ah, I think the king side is uh, maybe a bit open after G4 and G5 pawn. I think drops here and ah, okay, it's uh, still uh, très compliqué. Hein? Very good, yeah, knight e5, yeah, and bishop yeah. f4, and so le fou, eh, entendu, eh, aujourd'hui, the queen f4, yeah. Okay, queen takes yeah. e5. What a move. Okay, now I can't, get, <laughs> I can't escape the accent. It's yeah, like, no, now it's you're it's trapped in there it. a little bit. <laughs> you're trapped you had, in you it. You must continue. Okay, so are we going to see knight b5 by Nakamura to target the c7 square? These positions, I have to say, are so stressful to play with the black pieces. Like, you, you feel like you've done the absolute best, right? When, when you read the blueprint for the, the, the French, let's say, because it is more like a French position right now, you think, okay, get rid of the center, right? e5, d4, let me undermine the center. That's what the French is all about. Well, guess what? You've done it. And the position is still extremely unclear, as the eval bar points out, that black still has lots to worry about. Absolutely. But white also has, white has more to worry about than may meet the eye, because once black's bishop from f8 comes out to c5 I'm on, it targets the f2 pawn, and the fact that white hasn't developed his queen side might bite him in the behind pretty shortly. Yeah, I think, I think this is all about... First of all, the G pawn is hanging, so yes, you can take it. It's not that easy for Black to play Rook G8 um, because you need to long castle. Lots needs to happen, so the G4 pawn is up for grabs. But I like Knight B5. However, Bishop C5 is a very aggressive way to react, and it just could become a total mess. Okay, Bishop B3 instead. Hikaru prioritizing his develop development. Magnus could now secure the G4 pawn with H7, H5. That, of course, is the kind of boilerplate response uh, once mm -hmm. you advance the pawn to g4, or he could similarly prioritize his development and get his dark squared bishop out. Which path is he going to choose? h5 feels really natural, and I guess now that bishop e3 has been played, the clear reaction is knight b5. There's no bishop c5 uh, to, to think of, so knight b5, I, I imagine, has to be um, uh, Nakamura's idea, but... You know, the, the engine, because I've looked at these positions enough, the engine will always be like, you know what? It's not that bad for white. Even if you just develop, black has problems to solve. The king is never fully safe castling kingside, and castling queenside is not that easy to achieve. Well, you got the square. We got the square right. We got the piece wrong. He's put the <laughs> bishop on b5. And e5 by Carlson leading to complete pandemonium in the center. But Amon, this doesn't actually threaten. I think this is very important. E takes d4 is not a threat because of bishop right. takes d4, bishop g5. So Hikaru can take this opportunity to say, you want to open up the center? I'll take it to you. A move like c4 and knight c3 would terrify wow. me if I were in Magnus' shoes. And that's very it, much up Hikaru's alley. It really is. But he needs, he needs to find the confidence to play those moves. I think he knows that this position calls for those types of moves. We talk about the move C4, the move F4 is equally playable. How insane mm -hmm. are these moves here? And C4, Hikaru Nakamura strikes. I'm gonna go ahead and give that a brilliance. Oh wait, it's already done. Both of these Amazing players have move. such a keen sense of the initiative. They know exactly when their opponent starts to lose the thread and they pounce like a tiger out of the cage. So this is strong. also gonna be um, on the final game of the five minute portion. So a win by Hikaru would go such a long way toward reestablishing mm -hmm. the momentum that he seized after that end game victory. I'm just go gonna go ahead and say it. Um, Magnus surviving this position will be so astounding to me because I said it earlier, this position is nothing but stress 
for Black to play. You're, you're getting attacked the whole game. C4 is an incredible move, and Hikaru is feeling the, the zen of the position. He knows the type of moves that need to happen, and that's frightening. So I don't know how Magnus is going to survive here. Cor correct, yes, yeah, sir. I'm just trying to grasp the zen, the zen of the position. And uh, speaking, are of we zen, mellowing out, Daniel? I, I remember when Robert Hubner uh, practiced zen meditation at the 1970 Hugovens uh, Chorus Vikanze tournament, and this is getting scarier by the second, literally, because Magnus is now down to two minutes. Why, Amon? I think for, for newer players, well, you look at this position; it's chaos on the board. Why is this mm -hmm. so bad for Black? I think it boils down to two things. The first is your permanent lack of king safety. The king is stuck on the e file; it has nowhere to run because the king side is wide open. Look at Hikar Knight c3, and that's the Incredible. second thing: the superiority of White's piece placement. Black's pieces are stumbling on each other; they're not I'm able to defend it. crucial squares. Let's I'm let's hear it. it. Brilliant. I'm upgrading it, it to brilliancy. No, one one was not enough there. This is the second. Look at how many pieces are hanging. Oh my gosh. I don't think that was enough exclamation marks, Simon. I just want to make it clear that when you hang this many pieces, you deserve some credit. Hikaru is head bobbing. We know what that means. He's feeling the position and he is ready to go into the break with a victory here. I uh, said it once, I'll say it again. I don't think Magnus is going to survive here. It's too tough to play. He's not just head rubbing, he's also chewing, and you know what that means. If you have the mental capacity to go for a snack during the game, that means you're confident that things are going your way. If black takes the bishop, what actually happens, you might be asking. White takes yeah. the d5 pawn with the knight, takes the b5 pawn with the other knight, and then both knights are staring at the c7 square. And you could Let's put this on the board really that. quickly. As Magnus starts to come to terms with, I would say, the hopelessness of his position, we might see this on the board. He will have to allow knight c7 check, give up the rook in mm -hmm. the corner, and try to run his king to the king side. I do think that that is the best practical chance. Yep. Magnus just rook b8. Look wow. how calmly he's defending, even in the face of almost certain death. That's actually an excellent move by Carlson. He says, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die with an extra minor piece in my stomach. And this mm -hmm. game is not over. This is not over. And it's it feels insane to even say that. You know, at this point, white could consider just like a regular looking move like queen d2, rook d1. Those types of moves will still build up uh, insane pressure on the position. So uh, I wonder if there's something more forcing here, Dania, but I might be thinking about just moving the queen. Queen d2. Also, you're setting up potential ideas like bishop e3 to g5 in order to cover the d8 square. But yep. my worry is that Magnus is actually only a couple of moves away from finding better shelter for his king. He might play the move f6 and then king f7, and that king on f7 is going to be a whole lot safer than it was just a couple of moves ago. Yep, and it will be on a light square, which is the one piece that white is missing. In fact, a nice move maybe instead of queen d2, but same idea, is just to check the king first and then do it. So you force the king to go to that you know undesirable d8 square. Absolutely. And now Hikaru down a minute on the clock. I don't think he's finding anything that he truly likes. He forces the king to d8, but now the king is very nicely sheltered by the knight mm -hmm. on d7. Bishop to b6, setting up. But what exactly is the threat? I think that's the problem with this move. Where are you actually going to jump with the knight? a6? I think the bishop b6 move is doing my favorite thing. Threatening to threaten. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, does it threaten it yet, but, but it looks scary. I can say that for sure. If you move the knight, you know, you want to run away with the king. Right now, I think it feels to me like it's time to move that bishop so that you have an escape path. Great call, on Bishop to b4 on the board. The rook on e1 is also hanging. And again, white is down a minor piece, even though it doesn't mm -hmm. feel that way. Do you make a run for it with king e7? Is now the time? And it is. And is Magnus starting to take over the initiative? Unbelievable. There's no bishop c5 check. But what about takes? Takes bishop c7. I guess you oh. retreat the knight. And Don't want to be blunt with bishop d6. Amon, uh, Carlson is one move away from establishing his king on g7, the safest square on the chessboard. Black is now better. I can't believe this. And he's kept his extra piece the entire time. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. Uh, d4, the defensive though, knight effort. Takes d4, and he's blundered rook takes e5. And Hikaru, once again, is in charge. b5. b5. Uh-oh. Oh, bishop d4 was really bad. Really bad. By Carlson. Yep. Magnus lets it slip a little bit. Because look at the pieces. Look, you're up material, but those pieces aren't in the game. They're not playing. So if you're not using them, they're not affecting the, the evaluation of the position. 
There was absolutely no need for Carlson to give up his dark squared bishop. Now look at those dark squares along the long diagonal, queen c3, and rook e1. Yep. And this feels like a completely different type of position than just a yep. couple of moves ago. At the same time, if Black's knight gets to e6, then it's very much still a game. Queen g5. Okay. Dangerous looking move, but it covers the things it needs to cover. Like the f5 square, the the queen looking at Whoa, the queen GF, g5 is scary. He blundered on Passant. And h4. Think, wow, yeah, I was thinking even queen c5, but th this is even better. h4 oh and the attack gosh. rages for black. And now the bishop can't move because you get mated on g2. You're going to have... Oh, rook takes rook f3, takes though. Three. Oh, and rook takes g3, blundered his queen. Magnus blundered his queen. He can't cover with the knight. Oh my god. I don't gosh, know if he thought nerves. he had knight g4, but that was nerves, exactly. He definitely thought he had knight g4. Now it's over. Knight e8, uh, rook takes d1, and you can't even take the knight. One. And Hikaru wins. Unbelievable. The I mean, I think we were looking at about a 99% accuracy match the entire way, and this game went up in flames. Naka gets the win, Dania. That is so needed. Five to four is the score. How many turnarounds did we have at the end of that game? First, it was almost a sure win for Hikaru after C4. Then Carlsen starts to stabilize. He takes over the advantage, gives yep. away his dark squared bishop, and then blunders his queen just when he was about to deal the final blow. The score is five to four, and we have gotten everything that we've asked for him on, and then some. Wow, this was such an insane finish to the five plus one portion. I mean, this, it speaks for itself. Danya, that the match is within one point. I think we need an instant replay of the final blunder. We don't have the time to go through every turnaround of that crazy game. There was a game. lot. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> if we could go to move 32, Amon, really quickly after F4, Hikaru forgetting about Ampassant, which sets up the mate threat on G2. He has yep. to waste the tempo to bring his bishop back. Now, H4 would have won on the spot because it would have forced the bishop back and would have forced the queen trade. Instead, Carlson gives Nakamura a tempo. He uses his tempo to bring his knight back. H4, queen, c3 check. And now the shocking move of all. F6 here would have mm -hmm. kept a winning advantage. But instead, he goes knight f6, forgetting that white can simply capture f3 and simultaneously prevent h takes g3, which was played because of rook takes g3, picking up the queen. Now, I say obviously, but with 10 seconds on the clock in a position this chaotic, God himself wouldn't be able to figure this out properly. Truly. I mean, what we just saw was, uh, I think, a great sign for Nakamura. He was not afraid to sack multiple pieces to take the game to Magnus Carlsen. Yes, Magnus wiggled out of it a little bit, but it was never to the point where it was done and dusted and, you know, we were on to the, the next uh, format or anything like that. No, this game was still up in the air the entire time, and you're going to be rewarded for being the aggressor. Incredible. Hikaru was the aggressor in that game. Magnus still the aggressor in the match. He leads by one, and we will let the players take a much-deserved breather before the next segment. But before we do that, we wanted to ask if you wish that your financial systems were as fast and as smart as the 2023 Speed Chess Championship presented by Coinbase. Well, they can be. Check out coinbase.com slash update the system today or use exclam Coinbase in the chat to learn more. Well, we have assigned a lot of exclamation marks to the moves in this match, and we will continue to do so. You are watching the finals of the Speed Chess Championship presented by Coinbase. More action in just a couple of minutes. I take a G1 almost daily. I love them honestly because they taste great. I know that sounds silly, but not everyone wakes up looking forward to taking a supplement. And I legitimately do because they're tasty. Obviously they're phenomenal for you or I wouldn't be taking them. A few years ago, I went completely corn free. So I don't eat anything that has not just corn, but any type of corn syrup, which these days is in everything. And so I spent a lot of time looking into the supplements, whether it's pre-workout or just to like start my day. Um, and I spent a lot of time looking into that stuff and there is nothing better than the ingredients in AG1. Oh. Phenomenal for any type of thing you're looking, you're looking for, whether it's just adding a little more 
whatever you want to call it, fiber, vitamins, all the stuff in them, you know, into your diet if you're lacking some of that. If you're legitimately looking for energy and, and ways to kind of start your day on the healthy side of the of the bed, if that's a thing, or the chessboard. But uh, no, the, the ingredients in this stuff is the highest quality if you are looking for anything to boost your diet around. It's, it's awesome. I also actually take this liquid stuff, which is vitamin D with vitamin K. These days, if you're not taking vitamin K with vitamin D, you're basically wasting your time. If you didn't know that pro tip, you got to have vitamin K with your vitamin D. So anyway, I, uh, I love AG1. Whatever reason you might be looking for it, it just tastes so good. Like honestly, I have to be careful not to drink too much because then that can, you know, can be too much for your tummy. But it's phenomenal, tastes good, good for you, good energy, makes you feel like you're starting the day fresh. And I uh, recommend it. Check out AG1 right now. He's gonna play A4, oh my gosh! He's got trousers! Where's the mate though? I don't know, but mate? it's gotta be there! Oh, he got oh my god! Oh. He made him oh my, god. oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh, he's pre this... of GF. Okay, you have Rook D1. Oh, oh, my, god. Oh. oh my god, that was sick! Oh my god, that was nasty! Rook B1, he Wait, wanted Rook B1. a piece! He oh my piece. goodness! Goodbye, one bang bang bang! Bishop 7 wait, Bishop and 7 does it the Bishop. Yeah, Bishop F7, gosh. Rookie 6 is a mate threat. Oh, oh he's lost. He's positioned. But does lost. he have enough time? Oh my gosh, Magnus has to show off the mouse speed right now. This could be over if Hikaru can bleed another minute off the match clock. Here we go. Oh, 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 oh. No, he doesn't have enough oh, time. Hikaru it's made it's it. Over. It's over. Magnus gives a little bit of a clap for Hikaru Nakamura. Back we are at the 2023 Speed Chess Championship Final presented by Coinbase. I almost said 2022, Amon. We had that incredible <laughs> highlight reel there from last year's finals. I've been experiencing withdrawal for exactly a year, and I'll be experiencing withdrawal for another year after this. But we still have a lot of chess left to play as Magnus Carlsen holds a one-point lead. Let's take a quick look at his 2022 performance. Up until the loss with Hikaru, Magnus was rampaging through the field of mine. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me, uh, surprise, of this year, right? He has had a really similar run, and, you know, it, if he ends up losing this finals to Hikaru, obviously he's going to be thinking, oh, you know, Hikaru's done it again. That same type of run from last year. So Magnus is out here looking for his revenge, and guess what, Dania? We are approaching that stat that we talked about earlier, the three plus one section. This is his best section against Hikaru Nakamura, so this is his best place to cement that revenge. 
This is where Magnus has to butter his bread. But in order to do that, he's got to set himself up mentally, especially given his last two losses. They weren't consecutive losses. He won a beautiful game there in the middle. But first there was that insane end game where he gives up his knight in a dead drawn position. And then that final game where Magnus somehow climbed out of a dead loss position only to make the last blunder. So Hikaru, he had the last laugh in the five mm -hmm. plus one segment. Who will have the first laugh in our next hour of three plus one? and the gong sounds again a queen's indian yet again yeah interesting i'm trying to i, I guess technically uh, going back to that one game they did have in it uh it, it didn't really go hikaru's way but i think he was quick to to realize it well, didn't have anything to do with the opening so he was happy to try this one again but in a shorter time format now i'm actually going to be paying close attention dania to the time situation Early on, it's actually in Hikaru's favor, but he has been down on the clock against Magnus Ooh. a lot in this match. Ooh. And what just happened there is I, I, pretty much standard fare. This knight g5, knight e4 sequence is common mm -hmm. in a lot of different types of positions. Can we rewind? It, we're on the same page yet again, Amon. Yeah, we have knight to. g5. <laughs> so what's the idea of this move? It's a double attack. Knight g5 is against the h7 square, which is mate, and bishop takes b7. So if you take on g5, you allow bishop takes b7, and black actually loses the exchange because you can't guard the rook on a8 and save your knight at the same time. So mm -hmm. that's why Hikaru covered with his knight onto e4, covering the mate, covering the bishop, and garnering for himself a tempo that he uses in order to cut the contact between the two bishops by developing the knight. And now the game uh, is much more stable. What do you make of this position that they currently have? Yeah, that was a great explanation. Exactly what the players were thinking. Now, I think with the Queen's Indian, I always have to just hand that little bit of an edge to uh, to white just based on the structure. Like you have more space, more control of the center. But this extended F pawn is what I'm focusing on for Hikaru here. This is gonna give his pieces some scope on the F file. And if you back that pawn up to F5 and maybe give white the F4 move, then I think the edge in terms of the space is really clear. So I like this move that Hikaru has managed to get in. I think it's balanced. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say whether, you know, the, the weight of white's superiority in the center, because if you just look at the center, white's got the pawns on d4 and c4, white's got the potential breakthrough with d5. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, he doesn't have his light squared bishop anymore, Amon, and he's just allowed the move f3, girl, <laughs> Magnus, <laughs> calm down here. <laughs> f3? Anybody? Any yeah, takers? this is... <laughs> Going once? f3 and queen h3, and I think everyone is, you know, chomping at the bit to checkmate Magnus Carlsen in that fashion. I mean, look, he does have ways that he can prevent this. King h1, of course. Eventually, you'll get a queen uh, to f1, queen d3, rook g1. But why do you want to have to defend that position? That's what I'm wondering. Well, I'm wondering that too. I'm on, I'm on f3, <laughs> and it's on the board. And e4, why to prevent queen f5? But Hikaru says, I'm going to fly through a different airport. No direct fl flight from Charlotte, so I'm going to drive to Atlanta. And, and fly to h3. But queen g4 is met with king h2. And I think Magnus's general philosophy here, Amon, is that in the time that it takes for black to set up all these threats, Magnus has mm -hmm. imperceptibly built a really impressive center. He's also blundered the move rook f4, and I think he's losing the threat of this game. Yeah, king, and by the way, h4, while I understand it, I actually thought that h3 was a smarter decision for the same idea, king h2. Um, after rook f4, oh. I think the engine, oh, by the way, yeah, no, One no, uh, really? mark? Come, on, come on, Daniel. Come on. And now rook this a to f8, crazy. I think. I think My that the goodness. engine doesn't understand how good this is for black. Like, I think this is actually one where Hikaru understands that he's completely winning and the engine is actually still coming to that. Oh game. my gosh. Oh my gosh. There's an incredible move here. You want to right, go rook takes it? h4. Most people want to do it. But white plays rook takes f3 and eliminates the pawn. So what you do is you deflect the queen with knight takes c4. Then you play rook takes h4. And there is an unstoppable mate threat along the h -well. For example, queen d3 I'm on. Black just plays queen g4 and that's not the end of it. Let's say white plays d5. Rook h1 yep. check. Whoop. King takes h1. Queen h3 and queen g2. How sexy would that be? And yes, I said wow. the word because no other word would accurately describe this combination. Truly. I mean, this, t talk about a game after the break. Like Magnus just came came out and played 
this e3 allowing f3 and now it feels like he's just getting checkmated and he's slowly coming to that realization this is not the way you want to start to three plus one section and Hikaru knows that something exists. He has now paused yeah. for a minute, which is a long time in a three minute game. I think he's searching, searching he for that crushing blow. Knight takes C4 is an incredibly difficult move, not only because it sacks a piece, but because it occurs on the other side of the board. With 30 yeah. seconds on the clock, Hikaru better find it because he might no longer have the time to manage this position for a long time. He needs to checkmate Magnus now, and he has found it. Unreal. And he Unreal. has found it. what a it. move. Knight takes c4, you explained it perfectly, deflecting the queen. All you need is that one moment, that one move after rook h4 to play queen g4. And look, technically this is playable if you take and maybe give up the rook, but you're, you're lost and Hikaru knows it. What a game, what a combination. And there's basically only two players on the planet that can find a move like this in a blitz game. And they're sitting in front of us right now on the camera. One is Magnus. Reminds me of his knight takes b4 move against Vidit. How the yeah. delicious irony, right? Knight takes b4. Now we shift at one file to the right. Hikaru finds knight takes c4. Is Magnus going to find knight takes d4 sacking the knight in the next game? <laughs> yeah. We're just going to work our way over with <laughs> yeah, brilliancies. Yeah. Rook takes h4 and it's over. Queen g4 is unstoppable. Queen takes g3! <gasps> oh, oh my gosh. There's a queen sack no, on g3 and f that, leads that to main and he's oh. done it! Oh! Oh my goodness, oh, that Hikaru. is beautiful. The word sexy, no, we have to use it again, you Daniel. didn't, girl. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Wow. Just wow. Nothing but just pure shock. I have to go back yeah, to yeah, that yeah, one, yeah. Daniel. There's, there's no way that we can't show that again and explain what exactly was going to happen. Queen takes G3. Of course, a brilliancy. Look, King F1 is not even a question so you have to take it but then you unleash the f pawn moving down but to f1 and rook h1 incredible and then the mate king f1 rook h1 king e2 and look at the mate f1 queen king d2 queen c1 shuttling the queen to e2 and then queen e1 mate you have exactly two squares that are accessible they are the mating squares this was exquisite. This was a work of art. And you knew Honestly. that something was going to go down when Hikaru landed upon on F3. Lolly's mate, he said it on his stream a million times. You knew that he started to search the moment that pawn mm -hmm. landed on F3. What a game to tie the match. And you think about how, you know, that was almost, you know, not taking anything away from Hikaru, but very self-inflicted by Magnus. He played totally. E3 and said, push your pawn. To, to f3 and hikaru said uh sure i'll do that and i'll mate you with a couple brilliancies is that what you wanted clearly that's that's what magnus asked for and that's what he received it was unnecessarily provocative and it was more annoying that for magnus that he did it with the white pieces in a, in a queen's indian where he was hoping to play without risk instead mm -hmm. he gets checkmated i feel like I try as a commentator, Ramon, now to make less comments about body language because you, you never know what the players are actually thinking. But right. man, after that bish, Rook and Bishop versus Rook game, it seems to me like Magnus hasn't been the same yet. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because he bounced back immediately with an incredible win to sort of silence uh, that notion. But then you look at the, the games that have followed and yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. He's not fully himself and let's give credit where credit's due, Hikaru Nakamura has absolutely, you know, he's he's joined this match in a real way. He's back in it, and the momentum seems to be in his corner in this uh, 3 plus 1 segment that he's struggled with in the past. And so far, he's also adjusted his clock management subtly, but still in a big way. Now, he's holding the time advantage in the last couple of games, this game included. Yep. We have a really interesting Sicilian where Magnus has just released the tension with d4 and c5. The drawback mm -hmm. of this approach is that White now has some light square control on the queen side. You can see Hikaru's knight heading over to c4. The bishop could also park itself on a4. Uh, I think the position is approximately balanced, but I would probably take White here. Yeah, the, the structure does look pretty, pretty pleasant here. And remember, Hikaru Nakamura is currently playing for what I believe would be his first lead of this match. He's tied it up and started in the best possible way. Now he's got the white pieces. He can keep piling on the pressure.
that would be momentous, as would a potential kingside attack that Hikaru would develop if he lifts his rook up to f3 or his queen to g4. Queen g4, very thematic move here, Amon. You're not necessarily trying to checkmate black in one fell swoop. You're trying mm -hmm. to set up the preconditions for a potential kingside attack. I mean, bishop h6 and f4 would come really, really fast. And that bishop, which would land on f6, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a reliable bishop at all. I would go bishop h6 and take my chances here. Right, because bishop f6, he's saying, okay, e5, I've got it covered. But f4 renews f4. that exact threat. And if you play e5, you're opening up this bishop in general. Point. Yeah, that, that looks really scary. I'll tell you what Magnus missed. I think Magnus was relying on king h8. He might play that move. And there might be mm -hmm. a pawn that lands on f6, mirroring the narrative in the last game. Hikaru would play e5 anyway. And after g takes h6, e takes f6, black's kingside is going to be in shambles. And we're going to get another thematic attack by Hikaru here. Magnus is in trouble yeah, yet again. I was going to point out, I mean, it, it feels like we're stating the obvious, but you have to take a step back and think that Hikaru Nakamura, he's gotten his wins. And actually, we've seen Magnus under the most pressure when he's kind of just closed his eyes and started attacking, like caveman style. He is going for the king, and it's so refreshing. And I think the chat has got to be entertained by this type of chess, Daniel. You don't always see this from, you know, the absolute highest levels because those barbaric kind of attacks don't work. But that is exactly what's working for Hikaru Nakamura. Barbar barbaric is a great way to put the way that this match has proceeded. Amon, it's not one match. It's been two matches. Yeah. Where are the balanced Rui Lopez? Is gone... Are yeah. the positional struggles hardly, gone? Hardly are the long end games gone? Are the maneuvering battles now? We've got all out bloody sanguinary action against each other's kings, except it's really only against one king. Magnus hasn't really taken too many stabs at Icaro's king recently. Mm -hmm. and, and it's on the board. You know, I, you know, Rook G8. Let's let's at least give some credit to the bishop on uh, B7 who heard that comment from you and said, "Well, hang on, you know, <laughs> whoa, 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 I, I can make some threats too." Oh, but no, you're, horses. you're absolutely right. This is, uh, you know, Hikaru is going to bring that that rook into to E1. Maybe Knight E5, F5 is also on the cards. Hey, the H6 pawn is hanging as well. And C5, and the C5 pawn is hanging. And Hikaru might absolutely say, "Listen, I don't. I'm under no. I didn't sign a contract that I have to win this game by checkmate." He might take c5 and then trade queens on d6. Magnus is also down to 10 seconds. I feel like the wheels are really coming off in this game. Mm hmm Yeah, rook g6 feels like a normal move to hit the f pawn, guard the h pawn. But then, as you mentioned, you could switch gears and just take on c5. And now you could switch gears and go knight e5, which is the square relinquished by Magnus' last move. Rook to e1 mm -hmm. would be a great build-up move. C3, bishop, well, I'm, c2, I'm so at... many ideas. Yeah, if you can bring that bishop to c2, remember, with 5.6 seconds, you just need the most you know, complicated procedure for Magnus to find, and that alone might be enough. So I really like the move c3. I think it's tough to handle. And we called it, right? He's just taking material, and knight f3, knight g5. Oh, no, that could be a hammer blow, and he finds it, because rook g6 Amazing. is impossible. The f8 rook hangs. Every detail has been accounted oh. for. Look at this. Yes, this is exquisite. He called it. That's actually a really key detail. And Magnus was having that precise panic in his head. He was like, oh, rook g6 and h6. That's easy. But with the rook hanging, oof. Bishop c2. Bishop, bishop c2. c2. He doesn't recapture the bishop. And bishop takes g6. Or queen takes f8. Yep. And he wins. Start with this. Hikaru is on fire. He wins with a miss. Oh, God. What an awful move. <laughs> <laughs> that was, again, he's just taking it. To Magnus Carlsen right now. This is honestly amazing to watch. I said it before, but I'll say it again. You don't see these kind of... like This is not supposed to be Magnus's kryptonite, but it feels that way at the moment. Hikaru Nakamura is on another level, and he's just... Any chance he has to attack the king, he's doing it, and it's working right now. Magnus needs a game to calm things down. And I like Magnus's decision. Go back to the Rui Lopez. The Queen's Indian hasn't been working very well. And what impressed me the most about that game, it wasn't the fast attacking moves. It wasn't the Bishop H6s and F4s, because mm -hmm. that's pretty standard fare. It was the slow moves, right? The Knight F3s and the C3 Bishop C2s. Hikaru was able to keep his composure and find these slow buildup moves when a lot of people, especially against Magnus, would start to panic and throw all their pieces into the fire. Hikaru completely disarmed Magnus's attempts at counterplay. His time management is improved. The good news for mm -hmm. Magnus is that he's only down by a point. We're talking about this like it's a 10-point match. No, this right. is still very close. Yeah, and this is what we expected. We talked about those win percentages from these players earlier. We're starting to see where it comes from. Both of them 
have taken leads, gone on runs. This is, speaking of leads, Hikaru Nakamura's first lead of this SCC final. Incredible. Now, what do we make of this latest Rui Lopez? I, again, am a little bit biased in White's favor. And the fact that 97 cannot be played here forces Black's Knight to an awkward square. That's right. And we've seen this opening before from Hikaru. And I believe this is the game that featured his, uh, you know, sort of uncharacteristic blunder of a full piece uh, last time. Indeed. And look at that knight on b7. It's, uh, does it have a future? I... That's more of a rhetorical question, <laughs> as you're indicating. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to answer that with words. I'll just let the yeah. arrows do the talking. <laughs> I would go c6 here, honestly, with, with Hikaru. I would try to change the course of the game. Also, bishop d3 is a mm -hmm. major threat, and the b5 pawn cannot be defended. Yeah, and it's a little unusual to feel so comfortable giving away your dark squared bishop if you're Magnus here, but it comes with a very... Well, and you see the move c6 played. Because the b-pawn is so weak, bishop d3, he's, I think he's made the right decision, Daniel. Followed your idea. c6 just needed to happen. Necessary evil. And there's two main reasons. The first is now you can protect the pawn with queen b6. The second reason is how do you harness your bishop pair? Well, normally you do it by opening up the center. And that's what mm -hmm. Magnus's last move is aimed against. Bishop b3 controlling the d5 square and discouraging Hikaru from opening up the center with d5. We might even see a move like queen d3. And the knight from d2 yep. could access the d5 square through f1 and e3. And that would spell major positional trouble for Hikaru Nakamura, who still struggles yeah. with that knight, that terrible knight on b7. And there's, there's a long-term reason why this knight is no good. Right now, we can see its future is pretty bleak. But knight d8, you're thinking, okay, knight e6. But white is going to play the move. g3, maybe the move h4. And you start to see, wait, every single forward square is covered. And again, we're seeing the classic play on all three sides of the board. Queen side, Magnus mm -hmm. has the a file. Center, he's got the d5 square. But was bishop d5 a little bit premature? Because the queen is not the piece that you want occupying an outpost. You want to take the knight and put it on d5. And that's like, you know, taking a parking spot that's reserved for the business. That queen is going to get towed away pretty shortly. But that's going to cost Magnus a couple of tempi. And tempi is money in a position like this. The c3 pawn could come under fire. Oh, the interconnected business money references. <laughs> Dania is going crazy right now. I, I like am. that one. Rook A3 guarding the C3 pawn, but multi-purpose as well. Rook to A1 and Rook A6, Rook A7. You're going to bring the Rooks into the party. And again, that knight is looking for somewhere to go. Knight C6, Great not column really on. doing much. And Knight E6, you will see the move G3. And you called that when there was still a piece on d8. So pretty impressive. The knight finally has a future. It's got the e6 square. And Magnus has clearly lost the lion's share of his advantage, which is mm -hmm. uncharacteristic. These are exactly the positions where we know Magnus to be nearly flawless in blitz. But bishop d5 was a bit of a panicky reaction. I still think he's got the preferable position. But if Hikaru gets a knight to f4, God forbid. Yep. If black can push d5 here, the tides yep. could really turn. Totally. And that's why you saw knight e3. He actually wants to play g3, but I think he realized knight c7 accomplishes the same thing as knight f4. And if you can play d5, you might sack the pawn, right? And play e4. Totally. And that could be devastating. d5 is very much in the cards. It's being threatened. And I think Hikaru could even play queen c6 here, targeting the c3 pawn and preparing d5 once more. And Magnus mm -hmm. is going to say over my dead body, he's going to shift the rook from e1 to d1. And it's so clear what the battle is revolving around. The battle is revolving squarely around the d5 square. Oh, squarely. yes. And uh, <laughs> you're getting good at it, Daniel. That's There's one, one, one step at a time. Long term right? thing that we need to be very careful of if we are playing with the black pieces here. Do not let a pair of knights trade and the other knight reach the d5 square. That's like, you know, worst case scenario. And something went a little bit wrong in the last few moves by Hikaru because Magnus is very close to turning that into reality. Even if mm -hmm. the F3 knight doesn't manage to reach D5, I still think this endgame requires a lot more precision from black than it does from white. And it's almost like precision yeah. is Hikaru's calling card. Yeah, he, he heard that. He's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got that. I've got that. Rook There's a C4 weird line here because H4, if the bishop goes back, knight d2 and i think white is achieving a lot so the idea are you must thinking what bishop i'm thinking to <laughs> bishop c1 and like what's going on there i don't like rick takes b5 by magnus hikaru simply doubles on the c file he's gonna win the c3 pawn back and i feel like the worst is behind him i think he's gonna hold Definitely. the draw here with with room to spare 
I agree. I agree. You can't defend that pawn. The rooks will invade. And if you don't play knight takes bishop, then yeah, you may even risk something as well because the rook's going to get behind the pawn. Rook totally. b2. There's going to be going to be threats bishop there. Bishop b3. I, I, and bishop b3 is going to be threatened after black yep. puts the rook on the second rank. So be careful if you're Carlson. Yep. Rook. I guess you could go rook c2, but you're running into uh, running into bishop e3 there. Instead, he wants to clarify things win the pawn immediately we've seen magnus pull out wins in these types of end games but given hikaru's current level of confidence it just mm -hmm. doesn't feel the same way when magnus had these end games against wesley you were almost expecting something to go wrong now i'm yep. expecting something to go wrong but from the opposite side it feels like magnus is suddenly worse agreed yep N now he's playing the one. so well but he's got the confidence that's what really matters he's playing with that that uh different different level of intensity right now the position starting to sharpen up, and now it's liquidating back down. Finally, we see a piece trade, and the C pawn yeah. might get traded eventually for the B pawn. That's how these games are often drawn. I think so. Yeah, the king is going to try to move over to C1, but everyone is just going to stay put. <laughs> yep. Ooh, a little bit of tactics here. Don't go rook B6 and blunder rook C6. That's the one way to lose this. True. And Magnus is going to sign the peace treaty here. In a way, Amon, that was just as frustrating as the losses because Magnus got exactly what he wanted with the white mm -hmm. pieces and he couldn't deliver. Yeah, well said. And uh, Nakamura is doing what he needs to do when he's a little bit worse. He's fighting well and he's making those draws, but he's taking his chances, his opportunities when he has them. So uh, the match has really turned and I feel like Hikaru is following the, the perfect match strategy right now. Magnus is suddenly under pressure to get a win because he hasn't seen one come his way in a while crazy the way that the momentum turns in these sec matches just when you think you have a handle on who's in charge and who's calling the shots boom not only did mm -hmm. the results change but the way the moment the course of the games have changed completely we have another re lopez this time hikaru playing kind of an old setup with a pawn on c4 this was popular i think in the 80s uh these c4 d3 e4 setups and i'm gonna be honest i don't have a pretty good handle on anything that's happening with the pawn structure here yeah it, it definitely feels that's like c takes fine. needs to happen but you know the light squares for magnus all i'm seeing are easy pawn breaks for black like queen d7 c6 f5 like it, it feels like everything is coming for black here and are we going to see counterattack? is it time for f5 magnus needs to strike this is where Magnus needs to say, listen, the momentum isn't going my way, but I'm going to take this one over. He has to play f5 because if he takes on d4, he allows knight takes d4, and white suddenly clamps down on light squares on both sides of the board. c6, f5, Magnus taking his time. That tells us mm -hmm. the wheels are turning in his brain. He's definitely calculating f5 right now. Yep. And f5, what is the variation? So f5 happens if pawn takes on e5, pawn takes on e4. I want to pull this up on the analysis board, Danny, because this it. is critical. E6 looks really scary. I think a lot of people would see this move and rule the line out. But look at the D5 scoop mm -hmm. pawn. After Queen... I guess Queen E8 was my idea. Um, yeah. Queen C8, C8 I think, keeping to this To keep the defended. pawn protected. And Knight D4, that's the problem. It gives up the D pawn. If you go yeah. back to E1, I'm on, instead of Knight D4, you allow Rook to F5, picking off that pawn, and White's position collapses. But Magnus, he engineers a different pawn break. He's decided to strike on the other side of the board, and this seems to carry a lot less punch than F5. Definitely. It it, it has a more, um, I guess, liquidating nature to it. Um, F5 was definitely playing for the edge, but it was equally, you know, it was risky as well. Uh, oh, careful. Whoa, 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 Queen whoa. D5. And he's Knight he D7 there. It. Oh, he <laughs> sidesteps it. Queen D6 and Bishop F6, and he will pick up the D5 pawn. But yep. Hikaru could even go knight c6, and I find it hard to believe that he's in real danger in that position. Maybe a smidge worse because of his pawns, but they're not really accessible to Black's bishop. That's right. Yeah, and I think we probably will see something like that. Maybe bishop c3 here. Um, I feel like what Hikaru wants to do to be perfectly fine is play bishop c3 and then b4. Once that pawn gets up to b4, I think he knows like nothing bad's going to happen at that point. And I don't want to keep harping on the momentum because it's still a one point match this could change at the drop of a hat but i think magnus early in the match would have played f5 i feel like after he jumped mm -hmm. out to that two point lead he was making decisions quickly now he's playing with a little bit more hesitation trying to avoid getting behind you know by two or three points but eventually he's gonna have to start taking risks again yeah i 
I get the feeling from this position that Hikaru is very content to play bishop here, uh, at some point play knight c6, and I was going to say play the move b4, and Magnus I think is well aware that he wants to play b4 so that bishop doesn't feel secure on the c3 square. And it's a three-result game. I mean, white's not the only one with weaknesses on the queen side. In fact, I would go so far as to say that black now... Uh, it has the onus is on black to make sure that a6 is protected. Rook b5, mm -hmm. I think, might be the only reasonable move here because white can't take on a6 there because of bishop takes c4 with the lateral attack on the bishop. So I'm expecting yeah. rook b5. I'm not expecting rook a8, which would lose the game to knight b6 and bishop c7 after rook d8. Yep, that's a good point. Um, and certainly rook a8 just doesn't feel right anyway, you know? No. Um, <laughs> but rook b5. Super strange move to play. We talk about moves that don't feel right. Uh, rook c8 doesn't feel right, although after knight b6, I guess there's... I was going to say rook c5, but there's knight d7 there. He's going to sack the exchange. After bishop c7, I think he's going to pick up the pawn on b3, take back on d8 wow. with the rook, and this is actually, I think, a really high-level decision by Magnus. Rook to d2 is incoming, bishop f6, and those bishops are dominating the knight on b6, which has no way back because of bishop wow, this c4. this is amazing. And this is this is so high level by Magnus. I think it's still equal, but this puts serious pressure on Hikaru to play accurately. Wow, you know, just got to uh, you know step aside and let it happen because that that was sick. I did not see that um, at all, and this is exactly the type of shock moves that these players are capable of because that looked unplayable. I mean, you were like, this is lost, and I, I couldn't see any reason why not. Bishop f6, and suddenly I'm like, oh, you were right, but for who? This is in the category of Magnus Carlsen moves that I would never play in. Literally, you can give me a million years to train and to acquire knowledge about the game, and I don't think I would ever decide upon an exchange sacrifice out of nowhere in the end game. Look at this position. Yeah. Why does a full exchange up? He could even trade the rooks with rook a8. He might do that, mm -hmm. but the b2 pawn is so problematic that Hikaru decides to bail out. Rook takes f6, yeah. sacking the exchange back, and a very heads-up decision, I think. Yeah, honestly, this is like... You know, rook takes b4, bishop b5, check, king h2, takes, takes, rook uh, d2, and we, you know, it's just like amazing from both sides the way they do it. And rook d4 will defend the b4 pawn. Is anybody playing for a win here nominally? I don't think so. Rook to d2, maybe, but I wouldn't give up the b4 pawn unless you absolutely have to. Yeah, and there's a weird bit of coordination, like rook d2, rook takes b4, rook takes f2, and sometimes king g1, you know, just shocks you for a minute, because you're like, well, I can't take that pawn on g2. Okay. Bishop to b5, but suddenly he's given a b4, and whoa! He goes Big for concession. the three on three with a b pawn, and this is a draw, objectively. I would even go so far as to say this is a handle... Black should make the draw handily, but... Why is mm -hmm. he flirting with this? Yeah, you I don't know. This. this is uh, th this is something you could definitely lose here. The pawn totally. is going to go up the board. It should be a draw, but yeah, you mentioned uh, it. It's just, whoa, 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 whoa. Why? I feel like Magnus has improperly arranged his pawns. Now, king to d4. How do you win these positions? You have to sacrifice the f2 pawn at some point, but you also right. could lose this with white if you accidentally sack your two pawns and black plays g4. Hikaru is thinking about it, though. And he's going to buy he's his He's still time. thinking, by the way. Like, King f3 is not like, let's make a draw. It's, I'm, I need more time to process what's going on king here. King g4. Now, don't go king g6 if you're Carlson. He gets his king to h5, but how does he progress f4. from here? f4. f4. Definitely f4 is going to happen. But you can't get your king out of the cage without giving up g2 yeah. with a check. Oh, he's allowed king g4. What on earth did he just do? But wait, now, now, wait, wait a minute. So can he actually win this pawn? That's the question. The king comes in. He's going to put the pawn up to h6. He can win the f pawn maybe, but after h6, remember the king is going to hide out on h7. There has to be a winning plan here, but can Hikaru find it with under 10 seconds on his clock? Okay, At when least Magnus' moves six? are easy. Mm -hmm. Rook b1, rook b4. You give the lateral checks as long as you can. White's king will approach the rook, and that's when you play rook b1. King e6, and black is in Zugzwang! King f5, yep, he wins! King f7. Same thing. No way. How on earth did he take that game? I have. Those were some of the most obvious head 
movements I've ever seen from Hikaru Nakamura and just, you know, let's give him space to bob accordingly because he should, after that performance, he just won that position. He's winning games against Magnus Carlsen that you'd never expect anyone should be able to do. You saw this game and you could put a silver dollar on the fact that Magnus, Magnus is the one from whom we're used to seeing these endgame victories out of nowhere. It's a three on three, Iman. And yep. we already have seen this. We saw it in the game where Carlson hung a knight. Here, he didn't hang a knight. He actually got outplayed. First, he gave up the B pawn. He made a concession and thought that rook end game was easy to save. And somehow, you know, the, the, the path to a draw, as my coach used to say, when it gets narrower and narrower and narrower like that, eventually, you're just not used to having to find a single forced move. Magnus is reeling right now, and he is down by two points. He's reeling and he's making decisions which I would say are uncharacteristic. You know, normally such a practical player. Why did he want a position where seemingly like he could only play to lose it, right? The, the material was even. Then he gave up a pawn to play a rook end game where it's like you, your best result is a draw. So why go down that path? Only bad things can happen and bad things did happen. And they did, and Magnus needs to stem the bleeding. This is a huge game, because this is the game before our halftime break uh, of mm -hmm. the three-minute portion. Magnus deciding to go into the Berlin endgame in a very thematic pawn sacrifice, pushing e6, damaging Black's pawns even further, and now he's going to get his knife and fork ready and try to win that e6 pawn back. That's right. And, you know, we're going to have that classic situation where White's trying to get a mobile pawn majority, three against two, whereas... You know, Black's pawn majority is not, I wouldn't use the word mobile because the pawns are doubled and you can't create a pass pawn easily. 125,000 of you across Twitch and YouTube watching as Hikaru Nakamura seizes the momentum and the two point lead for the first time in this match. What an incredible turnaround, although I like the way that Magnus is handling the end game. When you're reeling like that, Amon, when you're struggling, it doesn't yeah. matter if you're Magnus or your Joe Schmo, you want to do the same thing. You want to steer the subsequent games in the direction that you feel most comfortable. You want to go back to your roots. And for Magnus, that means getting into end games in which he feels comfortable. So I was, I mean, going to ask the obvious, but did, did he hang the C6 pawn? Did he realize it was hanging? Or is there a... Yeah. What's going on no, here? No, rook, rook takes c6, and the rook evacuates via c4. Even if black plays I, bishop d6, it doesn't trap the rook. Yeah, did they both miss a free pawn? It's almost like mutual blindness. Uh, they're seeing all the same things, and they're missing all the same things. That's what, really what weird. Like? It was literally sh up. rook takes c6, simple as that. Now, Hikaru puts his king on b7. I still think he's worse. I think he's struggling to get his pieces out largely because of the h6 bonamon because you can't go bishop yeah. g7 that's right and there still is a 3v2 brewing which is why you know black's not necessarily in a rush to take and trade because i don't i don't know like what what's the next procedure after that hmm hard to develop hard to develop magnus he really really needs this win this is the kind of position we're used to seeing him convert and totally. he's gotten the dream Berlin setup. He has the yeah, three on two has majority on the king side and more active pieces. Yeah. Yep. No, this is, uh, I would say, one of the most important games of the match. I mean, uh, Hikaru pulling off a draw here is going to feel like a win. Totally. And Carlson trying to prevent that from happening, pushing h4, trying to introduce more attackable weaknesses on the king side. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't think that's a mistake at all, really. Nope. It looks like a pretty good move to me. <laughs> King h3 and knight h4. Of course, he wasn't going to blunder the g-pawn with knight takes h4 there. Well, they blundered the c6 pawn. And never say never, man. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Back in that my is a good day, point. <laughs> you blundered pawn like that, Governor. <laughs> Wait, you don't say. Okay, gh rook g5. Hikaru trying to go after the g-pawn, but knight g6 might defend the pawn tactically. Knight g6, rook wow. takes h5 check, king g4, and you've got two pieces hanging at the same time. Easy pickings. For Magnus Carlsen, who's going to yeah, ferry his knight back to f4. We just talked about blundering a pawn, and it's like, <laughs> there we go. oh, you mean like this? <laughs> now, Amon, knight f4, it's so important to understand that rook takes c5 and bishop takes f4 is losing for black because the minor pieces are incapable of handling the h-pawn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that is a really... It's like 
such a strange concept because you always, always in chess think two pieces for the rook. Of course, it's better than two pieces, but the minor pieces are notoriously very, very poor at defending not only against pass pawns, but especially ones on the side of the board, A and H pawns, and that's exactly what white has. I would also be tempted by the move F4, trying to give up the H pawn in order to uh, shuttle the F pawn off the board quickly. But if you can play mm -hmm. knight F4 and you get away with it, you absolutely should. Knight F4, rook F5, there's king G4. White's pieces are ideally positioned to support those minor pieces. But Magnus, that lack of confidence, is it going to bite him yet again? He's now down on the clock. He has to yep. find knight F4. That is a really, really important move. Yeah, and uh, it should be said that F4 is like a very decent backup, and this is a complicated move to play. Knight F4 invites everything because you mm -hmm. might think, oh, the king is coming, and if my H-pawn is not going as fast as I think it should, it's uh, not something oh that you can gosh. be confident in. I'm on 15 seconds. He's played the mm -hmm. bishop to F4. He puts a third piece on that square, and rook f5, wow. sacking the bishop in order to go after white's queen side pawns. What an incredible decision. And rook g5, Hikaru is navigating these tactics with unbelievable precision. Yeah, bishop takes h6. It was just rook takes f2, I believe. And pawns fall. And without any pawns left, you're not going to win. Rook g2. Magnus has to be careful here. I know it sounds crazy, but I would be playing this for a win, given the time situation if I'm Hikaru. He's bobbing his head. Rook takes F2. Oh my C4, gosh. Or it's just Rook barely F3. surviving. Magnus is going to lose the B pawn, and he has another endgame to defend. I, I can't believe we're saying this. And he let his clock run too low. Mm hmm. Oh my yeah. Gosh. Rook D3 is such a stable move. So Rook F3, I, you have to. I, was, I mean, Rook right. D3 now, isn't that just a draw? It was. Now he's gone Rook B2, allowing Knight E7. The Knight. Going back where? Is it going back to d5? Bishop f8 has to be considered, but don't get yourself checkmated if you're Hikaru. Rook d7 check yeah. and knight c6 sets up a mate threat, and that's mm -hmm. why he goes to f4 and back to a8. And bishop b8, whoa! <laughs> so that's and why he, he does sacks. this. Which... Oh my gosh, he's playing for a win. Yeah, this is very, very strange. He's playing for a win. Magnus's knight is stuck, and black has connected passers him on. This Magnus is the one haywire. that needs to be careful, though. Yeah, yeah for this... sure. King b7, and there's no knight d7. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no! There's only one oh, move no! in that position, and he nobody could wins. produce it. No! Absolutely insane! I can't believe and it! Magnus is like, how did this just happen? This was Have the you... most unbelievable endgame yet. Have you ever seen a mic drop in chess? This was one of them. This was an actual mic drop moment. Hikaru has left Magnus at the board. He gets up emphatically, and I mean, he should be walking like a champ right now. I can't believe that he's won back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to games that it looked like he had no business. That was literal wizardry, and I wanted to point out, Amon, the last moment where Magnus actually made the losing move was here, and yes. we already knew that things had gone completely haywire. The knight was totally. stuck. Such an instructive moment for newer players. You see how strong, much stronger the pawns are than the knight. The only drawing move was, and I'll let you show it, Amon, sorry, rook h6. Mm. Rook h6 yeah. instead of rook h3, sorry, rook h6. And what is uh, rook h6? Like, you know... To play this move would be, <laughs> it would be like actual sorcery. <laughs> what is this? The point is king takes b8, rook takes b6, and then rook b4 rounds up the pawns. But the second point, the one that's harder to see, is that if instead of king takes b8, black plays c3, you actually use the right. knight on b8 as a springboard and stop the pawn from c6. But that, at this point, was impossible to find. Magnus let his clock run too low, and he gave up that h-pawn, and that's when you sense the game starting to turn. Yep, and to for this to be the basis of that position being equal, it's like, no, you have to go back and revise your valuation. No, Hikaru was playing that for a win, and this was it practically it might have just been lost, right? Because totally. you can't you can't base the the uh, evaluation of oh yeah, it was equal and you know Magnus just blundered. No, if he has to find this, those were insanely good practical winning chances from Hikaru, and he knew that going into it. And if Magnus can't convert this position, if Magnus can't do what he does best, what he's hung his hat on for his entire chess career, then he's in huge trouble in this match, and he's in trouble objectively losing the three-minute portion, four and a half half, 
and he really, really needs this break. But before we go on break, we wanted to remind you not to miss out on what month is it? Not September, it's September. Through the end of this month, claim up to 30% off on all new subs on Twitch. Subscribers gain access to exclusive break time content during broadcasts, unlock new emotes, and score an ad-free experience on chess.com. Don't miss out on the deals this September. Subscribe now. Okay, well, we will let this September continue with an incredible SCC Finals presented by Coinbase. Hikaru holds a three-point lead. Magnus has coming back to do. He has some mental work to do, and we will be back with the second portion of the three-minute segment in just a couple of minutes. the same thing every time. Why did you on passant, bro? I swear to God, on passant should be forced. All my friends watching and this day is taking forever. Play faster. If I could move this pawn backwards, it would basically be checkmate. Oh, and draws are dumb. I should be able to flag him no matter how many times I repeat moves. 1400 years and it's the same game every time. You know what? It's time for some updates. I'm tired of this. I'm, I'm doing it. Still mate? is now a win for the player who gets stalemated. You're welcome, Eric Rosen. Hey, it's the Rosen Trap. Pawns can move backwards. Why has that never not been a rule? Pawns can move backwards now? Every piece should be allowed to on passant. What? That's not even possible. How? Ship it. Dunzo. Update. Enter. Why is it ending? There's just two kings on the board. What is this purgatory? This is so awesome what we're doing here. Guys, we're changing chess. Why can't people just move however they want, whenever they want? Wait, what? Checkmate? Do I not get to move? From now on, C4 actually explodes. Pawns are weak no more. Pawns can promote on the first move. Update. Take that, bro. I'm not sure I made the users as happy as I thought I would. Maybe chess doesn't need an update. Financial systems do need an update though. Coinbase is working on just that. Re-envisioning an entirely new financial system that is decentralized and fully transparent. Thank you Coinbase for sponsoring competitive chess and making events like the Speed Chess Championship possible. Go to coinbase.com slash update the system today to learn more. What's the best way to follow any chess event from the Champions Chess Tour to the Candidates, Speed Chess Championship, Title Tuesday, FIDE World Championship, and so much more? Chess.com slash events has all of the top chess tournaments played both over the board and online. Analyze and review games from the world's greatest players with live commentary, cloud analysis, opening explorer, and table bases. Find all the key event information, including schedules, prizes, results, news reports, player bios, tie breaks, and more. Even compete by voting for your predicted results. Explore chess.com slash events today on web or with our iOS and Android apps and experience chess like never before.
absolute insanity has broken out at the Speed Chess Championship Finals presented by Coinbase. I see Karu Nakamura has jumped out to a three-point lead halfway through the three-plus-one segment, but it's how he's done it on the strength of some unbelievable turnaround victories, and he leads the three-minute segment four-and-a-half half. There's the man himself. Hikaru has been nothing short of incredible this year, thus far in the match, and of course the previous five years. Hikaru has instituted his hegemony over online chess, and he's done it through one finals win after another. Here's what was the like, case when Hikaru and I like this crossing. The SCC champion. I'm on. Which one is the craziest to you? Well, you're gonna have to explain. Uh, what's a what's a galon? Uh, we don't a we don't galon? have that up here. A galon. Like, hey, wait, wait, listen, I'm on. In South Carolina, gas was under two dollars <laughs> back when Hikaru and I can were awards an SEC champion. Unbelievable. Every Hikaru remembers. It's just a mainstay, you know, like death taxes and Hikaru being the SEC champion. Truly, and if he continues that, I mean, he's going to be taking down. Magnus Carlsen, which he's looked poised to do thus far, but I mean, it's Magnus Carlsen. He's never gonna go quietly. You feel I've never Magnus has never lost like a blowout match. So you have to feel that if if Hikaru keeps this pressure up and keeps getting these wins, we're in for a result that we've we simply never heard of from Magnus Carlsen. Well, first and foremost, Magnus has to he has to win a game. He has to prove to himself that he can win a game in the three minute time control. And this yep. is made all the more incredible by the fact that Carlson has not lost to date a three plus one segment against Ikaro. And this is very likely to be the first, but let's see if he can reduce the deficit going into the bullet. 22 minutes left and we have an opening that we haven't had before, the Rosalimo, which featured very prominently uh, in several SCC matches thus far. And I mean, I guess more important than the change of opening is the change of attire here for uh magnus is this uh you think this is uh you know oh that shirt was attributed to a bunch <laughs> of losses this shirt fresh start let's see uh if this can shake up the momentum hey you got to do what you got to do chess players are pretty superstitious maybe he he's gotten sweaty and i wouldn't blame him i mean you you just get sweaty by definition when you're facing an on-form <laughs> Hikaru Nakamura. What's going on in this position? The center is open. Black can stick a rook on d8. And that seems like a kind of low-hanging fruit type of move. White now has to decide on accommodations for the queen. And I don't see a square that I particularly like here for white. Yeah, I think rook d8 is one of those moves that, of course, you expect. Like, you know your opponent's going to chase your queen. But still, when the moment arrives, you're like, eh, like really have to move this thing. As you mentioned, queen c2 might run into bishop h3, bishop mm -hmm. f5. There's a lot of tactics, which is why knight d2 is played to support that knight. But here comes knight b4. Great response by Magnus, and I think an encouraging response by Magnus, showing that he's still confident in his ability to handle complex tactical situations. The d3 mm -hmm. square and the c2 square, those are the main problems for white. I would consider queen to b3, Hikaru with bishop to d4, and immediately Magnus sacrifices the bishop on h3. Change of shirt, change of play, change of attitude for Magnus Carlsen. What do we make of this? I was actually going to say change of shirt, but the same guy underneath. Remember, he hit <laughs> bishop takes h6 in a previous game. And this feels reminiscent to that because I'm looking at how you defend against this. And, well, the usual uh, suspects are knight h2. Right, to cover the, the g4 square, but hang on, you can't play that move. The other idea is to get something to f1. c5 and bishop f1 or queen e2, queen f1, those are the ideas, but it's not that easy to achieve. There's knight c2 in the position. There's a rook takes d4 after knight g4 idea. There's so many things that can go wrong, and he is trusting his instincts. Guess what? He does not have absolutely everything calculated, Dania, but he knows that this is the, you know, things are set up perfectly for this type of sacrifice. And it's not even such a high-risk move. He's gotten two pawns for it, right? This is very different from sacking a queen or sacking a rook. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to prove anything right now. You can just kind of chill. Hikaru certainly can't chill. He's under a minute, and this isn't even the first time I'm on that Magnus has sacrificed a bishop on h3. Remember, in that Rui Lopez game, that rebound game in the five-minute portion, feels like eons ago, he sacked on h6, yeah. and he did it very Similarly, he followed his intuition, and Magnus's intuition in these types of situations are second is second to none. Hikaru doesn't have a lot of seconds left to figure out a defensive strategy. Can he pull out another miracle? 
He doesn't want his seconds to turn to none if he wants a chance in this game. Bishop to e5. He's trying to bring reinforcements in, but, I mean, there's so many things wrong with the, the current position. Knight d3, knight g4. I mean, take your pick at a good-looking move here. Knight d3, excellent move. Good call, on Knight h5 going after harassing that bishop, but also preparing to get the knight to f4. That's a very Magnus-like move. I've played him enough in bullet to know that Magnus loves these cagey, unexpected moves. And right Amazing. on cue. Amazing. Yeah, at this point, I mean, knight g3 is as much of a threat as knight f4. Totally. So, I mean, it just looks like you don't have any options here. What comes to mind? This Ro looks so frustrating. Yeah, knight g5 kicking the queen away. Queen says, I'm more than happy to sink my teeth into f5. Also, the other mm -hmm. side of the board. Don't ignore that bishop on b5, which can be targeted with a6. That's also a very Magnus-like move. He likes to use yeah. both sides of the board. Just when you think he's going to attack on the king side, he throws you in for a loop and goes after the other side of the board. I'm totally. almost expecting a6. He could also go queen h3 yeah. and, take a d and go bobbing for apples again. Yeah, that's a really good point because there is going to be just a, a knight b2 move to follow up. So I love a6, force bishop a4, and then instead of taking the rook, you can actually take the pawn on b2, take the bishop, and then grab the rook in the corner. And you're kind of like picking apart the white position. As you mentioned, on both sides of the board, I mean, the king is going to be left to, to hang out to dry at the end of that line. Yeah, because White's queen is going to be on a4. Presumably, it's going to recapture the knight. So that move, queen yeah. h3, Magnus is keeping it in his pocket and awaiting the perfect opportunity to go back after... Oh, and queen e5 is even oh, stronger. Oh. Now the rook is hanging, f5 is threatened, f5. and the wheels are coming off completely. The knights are Vish. woefully incapable of defending all the weaknesses. f5 resigns. And rook this, takes d2, this should queen be a loss. one How about that, Amon? Rook takes d2 and queen e1 after f5? Beautiful. Beautiful. The wheels are coming off, as you mentioned. G3 is going to be hanging. Rook D2 tactic. Magnus has started this portion emphatically. Not only did you need a win, but you needed a win precisely in the style. I'm pretty stunned that he didn't find uh, Rook takes D2. He has a little bit of work to do here. And after seeing the previous few games, uh, Amon, yeah. can you blame me for being, you know still being a little <laughs> bit on edge? Yeah, four connected pass. I think Magnus I needs five, you know. <laughs> Maybe even yeah. six to just to be safe, you know. Yeah, knights are tricky pieces, but 4.9 seconds and a dream is all Hikaru Nakamura has here. He's going to play knight d5. He's going to, you know, box out that, that rook to claim a basketball term here. And king g7 and push the h-pawn. I think you want to pawn as far as possible from those knights. You want to go g5, h5, h4, just indiscriminately start pushing your pawns because white's knights are are stuck in place. If you move the d5 knight away, you lose the other one. The other knight on e5 had no squares. There's nothing left to play for. And the way that he won that game is so encouraging for Magnus fans. He went back to what he does best, playing intuitively, putting pressure on all sides of the board and on the clock. Mm-hmm. Yep, and he's back to a position that he's had success with, so I'm sure that he'll be happy to be here. But obviously, if Hikaru is repeating, he's probably checked this position out. I think, if I'm thinking back to the, the beginning of this 3 plus 1 section, did we not have that insanely nice attacking game by Hikaru? And it was like, what a way to start. Remember Pawn F3? I think that was the first game. And now, mm -hmm. first game after the break, it's Magnus who comes back and says, okay, I'm a, I'm a different person here. I got a new shirt on. Don't forget. And it's hard for me to even say this, but 45 minutes into the start of this 60-minute segment comes Magnus's first win. I mean, mm -hmm. not only do we not say that every day, we've never said that. I mean, we expect <laughs> we don't Magnus say that to, at all. We don't say that, and we might never even say it again. So, you know, taking this match while it's going, I don't mm -hmm. love the kinds of positions that Hikaru has gotten out of the opening, which is also a weird thing to say because it's an end game, but it's also an opening. <laughs> Can Magnus open up the king side with g4 and f5? Can he create connected passers? I think that Magnus is playing with the, the kind of energy right now that that's exactly what he's going to do. Uh, there's one defensive idea. It's crazy to call it a defensive idea, but if you didn't play the move g4, Black would actually play h5 themselves and stop the move g4, which would stop the move f5, which would halt the e5 pawn. So it doesn't look like much, but h5 I consider to be a real threat there. And if you play it now, you're not in time to stop f5. Rook f1, Magnus is not going to miss this chance to push. 
No, and e6 here. He can push now the other pawn, forcing the knight yeah. away, and then play f5. Now, what is Hikaru banking on? He's banking on a dark square blockade on f6. The issue is that he can hold these pawns down for a while, but eventually, mm -hmm. when White's knight joins in the action through g4, which I think is yep. a square that will be opened up after the trade, it's only a matter of time to me until Carlson can set his pawns in motion once again. That's right. And remember, there's no pass pawn coming from this four on three over here. So it's basically two connected pass pawns, a rook that can't join the fray. And yeah, you mentioned it. We might just see a bunch of pieces trade. And although we won't see the pawns crash through and make a queen immediately, long term, I mean, white's just going to bring the king up to the center. H5, I think, has to be tried to prevent knight g4. At all costs, you have to prevent f6. But now Carlson yeah. will switch to a slow burn approach. And this is exact thing this slow burn technical conversion is what we are used to seeing him do flawlessly he's also struggled with it mightily in this portion so this is a big game also from a confidence perspective can magnus convince himself that yeah i'm still magnus carlson and i still win these types of games smoothly or will hikaru oh. pull out yet another crazy comeback in the end game yeah i was thinking rook h4 is kind of a it's almost like he baited that like rook f4 oh, and now exquisite. rook here and, you know, as tempting as rook h8, knight g4 is, I think oh. it's smart to play king h1 first, maybe, because I'm worried about rook g8, but knight g4 is such a beautiful, you know, geometric move. Pins galore, and king h1, Amon, is also a great move because you're preparing rook g1 and rook g7. So Hikaru, mm -hmm. I think, trying to defend from the g5 square, but the moment the rook is kicked away from the g-file, that rook on f1 is going to find green pastures to continue a, uh, a sub-theme yeah. of today's commentary on g7, which is a green square. That's right, rook g5. And you can't quite kick the rook out. It's like a little bit annoying. Yes, you can play bishop c1, but then you remove the possibility of mm -hmm. bishop takes knight and rook h5. You can play rook g1, but that, drop that pawn. And then knight f3, but you drop f5. So it's not that easy. And Rook HF4 preparing to involve the knight. He rolls out the red carpet. You know, the airplane mm -hmm. has arrived. And where is that knight going from F3? Well, that's the big question. G6 comes to mind because if you can kick away the bishop on E7, then you remove the wrong Jenga block and the whole tower comes crashing down, which I think is going to happen. I would have played knight H4, though. He's allowed bishop right. D6, and I think that's a small imprecision, giving Hikaru a little bit more latitude on the king side but look at this wow. knight g6 anyway and 97 knight g8 wins i guess 97 you have 97 over. he might have even just planned this to go rook takes f4 which might be good enough but this is even better this is the magnus that we know he didn't just win this he won this with a lot of room to spare now he can take either minor piece i would take on f4 yeah. because the knight is much worse than the bishop at stopping these passers Totally. And after you take here, you have the perfect setup. Your pawns are on light squares and your bishop controls the opposite color complex on the dark square. So you can play f6, f7, and the pawns cannot be stopped. He could have flirted with the immediate f6, but what is the point of that? You can just move your rook back. You can play c4. You can play f6. This one is a couple of moves away from its conclusion. Hikaru might resign right here. There's just nothing left with which to stop yeah. these passers. He, he wants... You know, F7, Rook takes E6, F8, in your wildest dreams. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh! Not going to happen. Will we see a Rook sack on G8, followed by F7? Like, Knight F8, E7, Knight E6, and Rook G8 forces <laughs> the Rook away from E8. That's what we're missing. That's the cherry on top. That's exciting. And I think we're going to see it. I think the gods are going to grant us a Rook sack at the end. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> nope. Well, there was, it was impossible because of Knight takes F6, actually. I think Knight takes F6 and... Well, I was actually starting to think of, uh, you know, the, the gamesmanship in Hikaru. Because why else would he be playing this on, right? He's already playing the clock. And with 10 minutes left in the three-minute portion, I think you're at that threshold where every minute starts to become important. And I actually think Hikaru wants to get into the bullet ASAP. Yeah, I'm just going to point out here. Uh, Bishop takes C5. I mean, a terrible, terrible mistake. Rook takes C5. Keep the king cut off. Now, Magnus, you got to preserve the seconds here. What are we talking about? <laughs> maybe avoid stalemating with a queen a7 queen e8 mate is coming up and hikaru has gotten to the point where he is checkmated in two moves he can still go king f1 um yeah. so he does have a safe move and mm -hmm. he's gonna take a solid 90 seconds off the match clock with uh uh with with this gamesmanship as you called it and, and look say what you want about it but this is the precise thing that got hikaru the win last time mm -hmm. right so i mean 
it, and it was so literally the fact that he had done this earlier in the match that you know later on in the bullet segment when it came down to one win it was like two seconds remember two seconds that he had taken off the clock earlier and that's why he won and i'm gonna be dead honest with you man this is what i truly think uh, hikaru in the past he's had some questionable antics you know he sometimes gets emotional after losses but this milking the clock when you're up on the match and you want to get to your best segment as quickly as possible is a completely legitimate strategy. He's maximizing his chances of victory. And what do we truly want from the, the players in this match? You know, do we want some imaginary concept of chivalry or do we want the players to maximize their chances of success? I think it's still the latter. Yep. Yep. And, and you know, everyone is well within their right to to do that. You know, it's not it's not something that's just reserved for him. Um, but mm -hmm. I think because he's so talented in the bullet segment that we see him maybe more than others uh, do it. And it, it's just because of his prowess there. And it's easy to say, I don't know what I'll be doing with those 30 seconds that we're waiting for Hikaru to let his clock run out. But I think we're all going to survive. And will Magnus survive another Sicilian? Hikaru going for a slightly weird line. I don't like the bishop on c4. It's just kind of biting on granite. So I would consider dropping it back to d3 and maybe opening up the diagonal with e5. Of course, Magnus could beat him to the punch with d6, but not right yep. now because he would drop your dark squared bishop to b4. Yeah, and I think that's exactly why I like the move c3 because I want to play bishop d3, but no need to drop the, the bishop pair or hand it over. So c3, and now you can bring the bishop back, but more trades introduced by Magnus here. It does feel very equal. Indeed. And the knights are going to get swapped here. Bishop f4, possible, yeah. but instead Icaro trades immediately. Just to kind of, I mean, given that this came from a Sicilian, this is very vanilla. It is. Um, there, There's also this a six pawn it feels like nothing right now but it's actually very annoying for magnus like you can't just play rook d8 go d5 or something you will need to probably play the move a5 at some point mm -hmm. um which you know it's not the worst move but it's a move that he has to spend indeed and how is hikaru going to arrange his pieces i mentioned bishop d3 earlier he plays it now and the big moment of yeah. truth will we see d5 or will we see a slower approach like a5 and d6 I think it's in Magnus' style to push d5. He's shown a willingness to change the structure uh, and create tension, especially in the last couple of games where we see the more confident Magnus that made an appearance yeah. at the start of the match. I think we're going to see d5 and likely a bunch of trades in the center. Yep, and it's important to remember that the pawn on f2 is stuck. You can't just respond with you know f4, e5, and close things up. The only Why way to get that mind? to happen... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, pin pawns, they can't move. Ah, that rule it was introduced uh i was uh <laughs> i was away drinking some lemonade all right go the ahead last <laughs> time that hikaru nakamura was not the scc champion puns could play to f4 here i remember that time too and d5 <laughs> is on the board after a sizable think will we Makes see sense. a bunch of trades on e4 in another end game yeah. yes sir why the heck not i definitely see why hikaru wants to play this i mean if you're magnus you're not going to shy away from something like this. You know you're not significantly worse. But I do think that the queenside majority, if there's just the slightest of advantages or preferences, I would take white because of that. I totally agree, Amon. I like to point out in such situations that the side with the smaller pawn majority has an easier time creating the pass pawn. When I say smaller, I don't mean smaller like you have less of a pawn majority, smaller numerically. It's a three on two yeah. versus a four on three on the king side. And yeah. if it's a two on one, then it's really easy to create a passer. If it's a two on three, all you have to do is play b4, c4, and c5. Whereas for black, the distance between these actual pawns yeah. is a lot <laughs> wider. But all of this is a moot point as long as you have a bunch of pieces on the board because it's really, really hard for white in practice to actually set his pawns in motion without creating weaknesses. That's right. And, you know, uh, I think the king placement also contributes to why I feel... Uh, like, like Hikaru's position is um, pretty nice here. And so Magnus is looking to equalize that and immediately get the king into the middle of the board. It just, it's one of those things that needs to happen eight as eight p. And we have Rook to C4 threatening. Is Hikaru threatening anything? Amon? I'm having a hard time uh, perceiving, you know, if there's any threat with this move. <laughs> yeah, well, wh whether or not there was, and we'll never know, the move B5 has been played to kick the Rook out. B5 was played before before. And will before be played before before? 
I think B4 will be played before B4 because B5 could go to B4 before <laughs> B4. B4. And before we say anything further, we need to cover the moves <laughs> actually played in the game. Bishop b3 by Hikaru, and guess what he's done? He has reduced the size of his pawn majority, again, to a two-on-one. Now, all he needs to do is play b3 and c4, so maybe we'll get c4 before b4. <laughs> I, I hope so, because I have the perfect emote to drop on that square, Daniel. Let is me tell that you. so? And Hikaru oh. has the perfect piece to drop on a7. That would be a rook, and he is making moves here. Yeah, Go bishop on. drops back to e3 and king d3. This is actually the pawn structure you don't want to see whoa, as whoa, black. Whoa, 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 whoa. B4? Before, before, before. Before, before. <laughs> and we will get c takes before. Rook c2 check. That's what he's banking on. But king d3 and king c3, I think, was overlooked by Carlson. Oh, and king c2. We have to show this line. CB, That's amazing. rook c2. This is crucial. King d3, rook takes b2, king c3. Now, it's obvious it that you like can't you. take on b4. But rook right. b1 seems to keep the tension, as you're showing him on uh, this line. But rook b1, king c2 was overlooked by Magnus, and you're in huge trouble because of this tactic. And the bishop picks off the rook before before. <laughs> that is amazing. And king d3, a miss? Of course a miss. Why? I guess because if you had gone to d1, you could have gone to c1, and maybe that's marginally better. I still think king c3 and king c2... Is a great winning chance he's missed it. Wow. And I think what that line actually was was that King to C1 actually trapped the rook and forced him to take. Whoa. That was a big moment. But Magnus still has yeah. to be a little bit careful here. White's got the more active rook and the better practical chances. Mm -hmm. King E4, but okay, some chances. Yeah, get the king to center. And by the way, we've seen 0.00. We've seen, you know, Magnus be in these rook end games. And guess what? Hikaru Nakamura is the guy who can turn these into wins. So just be careful if you're Magnus because you have to just admit you have lost these before. Whoa. It's pretty scary. And now you've got to take with a pawn. If you take with a rook, white gets trousers. I think most people in the chat will know that term now. Said it many times. A Russian chess term referring to two passed pawns on either side of the board that can't be stopped. And G3 is super precise chess. He's going to mm -hmm. use his G-pawn as a counterweight to prevent White's pawn from reaching h7 fast enough. Yeah, and you'll definitely see king e4 here trying to get it. But even if the black pawns were not on the board, it would be a draw. So actually, it's the presence of the pawns that maybe <laughs> gives you shaky feet here. Man, I, I think the eval bar is developing a disturbing cough. Might it have tuberculosis? Oh, I, <laughs> I think it's, it's TB early onset. Well, it's TBD, whether it has TB. But the TB is indicating a draw. And Hikaru, I think he sensed that he had a chance there. Big, big game, and an even bigger game to conclude the three-minute portion. Amon, the bullet is going to be one of the most epic match segments I think we're ever going to see. It really will. And, you know, there's... Obviously, it could be said about any match. You know, there's a difference between going in with the score tied or one player has the lead. But between these two guys where... You know, there's never really been uh, that much of a difference between them. That one point, that one game, a half a point makes all the difference. So, yeah, you could talk about momentum, but strictly based on the score and how narrowly close these matches have been, yeah, this game's important. You're totally right, and this is giving me shades of the Nakamura MVL match where Hikaru was down by two going into the final game of this portion, and he managed to win it, and that really, really set the tone. Now, obviously, he dominated all across the bullet, but if Magnus mm -hmm. could tie the match here, man, would that go a long way toward filling him with a lot of momentum. And right now, this is resembling last year's match, where the score going into the bullet, I think, was something like a one- or two-point lead only for Hikaru. We have That's a right. transformation here in the Rui Lopez. Hikaru has put his knight on e7 as opposed to f6, uh, as has been standard in their games thus far. Yeah, and also the uh, trade on e5, I, I think the position last time we saw this featured, you know, some rather strange, like, knight a5, uh, b5 sorts of positions. Instead, this one is much more calm all around, mm -hmm. and uh, I think Magnus is probably happy here with a stable position that he knows he could not be worse in, no. uh, especially as the final game in this segment. It feels like a position where if you want to draw to go to the bullet, uh, you know, Nakamura would certainly acquiesce, so, uh, you know, Magnus' game to, to play, it looks like. 
for sure. And Hikaru has to decide on which side of the board he's going to operate. B5 is a tempting move, but you're also introducing long-term weaknesses on the queen side. As we know, white will have the typical A to A4 strike. You can go on the other side, and I think the move Hikaru's turning over in his head is actually G5, potentially even followed by F5. But that also allows avenues to be opened up, such as the queen dropping back to B3 with a check. I'm mm -hmm. definitely surprised at the move C6. That is ultra committal and ultra risky because look at the D6 pawn. Totally. Yeah, th this immediately makes me think of like the direct approach. Rook D1, uh, the pawn is loose and pinned, so the queen has to sidestep. But, you know, it introduces options for white to play queen B4, bishop G3, E5 with the right amount of pressure on the E7 square. This can turn very dangerous and some really basic moves that Magnus needs to play, right? These aren't like, you know, out of these world moves. It's like Rook AD1, no. let's go. And I'm surprised he's not playing them. He's taking a large chunk of his time here. Obviously, he's figuring out the right way to arrange his pieces, but I would just start with Rook D1 and Bishop G3 and then think he's played it. He's got so many easy ways to increase the pressure on the pawn. Bishop G3, Queen B4, double Rooks on the D file. He could do all three of those successively. Mm -hmm. Instead, he expands first on the king side. That's such a typical Magnus move. Again, playing on both sides of the board. It's been a theme of this match. It's a theme featuring in all high-level matches and games. Yeah, and this actually not only maybe has the idea of h5 in the future, but it really restricts black from that g5 idea. g5, f5 no longer exists. There's no g5, knight, g6, and black could maybe try to play for the e5 square. So the knight on e7 is restricted. Maybe it's going to be reduced to knight c8, which is totally. purely a defensive task. And knight c8 relinquishes the grip on the f5 score. So Magnus perfectly timing the move h5. Hikaru doing everything possible to avoid playing g5 and allowing that knight on f3 to sink its teeth into the delicious f5 square. I think you have to go g5, though. Uh, by hook or by crook, you have to keep the f5 square protected. And after white plays knight d4... The problem is that the rook loses contact with the d6 square, so black actually can return to e7 of the knight. Hikaru still holding yeah. on. Yeah, the knight on c8 is like, it's actually the only thing uh, keeping him in the game because it's guarding the d6 pawn, and when the f5 square is threatened, it's guarding the f5 square. So without that knight on c8, <laughs> big problems in this position for Hikaru. It looks easy for Magnus to play, Oh, but he's Bishop offered takes... maybe a trade. And Hikaru could have snagged that knight off the board. Now he doesn't have that yep. chance anymore. He also could have tr tried d5. But I think Hikaru is actually comfortable with this pawn structure. He's telling himself, Magnus is burning a lot of clock, and he hasn't found a way to win the d6 pawn yet. Let's just kind of keep the status quo, and maybe Magnus will overpress. I don't know if that's the way to, to, to do it, though, because like you want to play d5, but I think you're going to need to recapture with a pawn there. Agreed. And instead, he's gone b5, sending the knight either back to e3. And again, we're going to see this knight e7 classic. But knight a5 is also very tempting, attacking that new target on c6. That's a more Magnus-esque move, I think. No, he drops back to e3. Okay. I think knight e7, rook d... Well, yeah, d2, d3. He goes on a light square. Just good, good practice there. And after d5, he wants to play rook d1. And the pawns are going to find themselves on fixed dark squares for a potential endgame, maybe with just dark square bishops. But d4, Hikaru slides his pawn through. b4, preventing wow. c5. What a move. Obviously, the knight is untouchable there because the rook on d7 will hang. And Magnus keeping the status quo here with a3. He could have taken a5, but I think he's trying yeah. to surround the d pawn with the move knight e3 to c2, which is a big threat, by the way. Yeah, and the, the moves here that are possible, knight d5, just to showcase the pure insanity of how many things are hanging in that position. Whoa, f5 whoa, whoa. has a similar idea. Knight c2 there would have picked off the d4 pawn. I think that was a big miss by Magnus. He takes the pawn on f5 instead, but Hikaru's Can rook... Take? Could... Oh my gosh. No, there's rook takes g7 in the end? And bishop wow. b5, bishop b2? But the king could sidestep. But you could go to f8. I'm bishop looking d6. at pawn takes. Bishop d6, Amazing. we're gonna have to show this after the game, or... Yeah. Hikaru might play the move. It, no. The time is too low. We have to stay with the action. Now it doesn't exist anymore. That was an insane line, Amon. We promised to show this after the game. No matter how the game finishes, feels That's like insane. Magnus is in the driver's seat. He can support the F-pawn with G4. That's very scary. Remember, Bishop D4, Rook D8. You can't just rush and take that. And that's why Magnus bringing his king up to E2, supporting the rooks, playing for a win. Hikaru's in big the pawn. trouble. 
big trouble. Yeah. Also on the clock, he's got seven seconds and so many weaknesses to defend here. Yeah, the king is going to be improved maybe all the way over to B3. BC. Just take yeah, it and take it. And... Oh, he didn't you take D4. You walk into a permanent pin, but he doesn't want to do it. But bishop takes he D4, have taken, threatened, yeah. and bishop right. F6 there was easy. Magnus allowing Hikaru to get active again. Good point. Rook C8. Rook B6 is coming, though. Okay, now it's suddenly a three-result game again. I mean, Magnus could lose control of this game and let that deep on through. Ooh, that I didn't expect. That looks like oh. a good move. Rook A5, it's not Ooh. hanging. What a move. Rook B6, maybe surround the B pawn. And now a trade. Mm -hmm. Check it first. It looks like keeping both rooks on the board was maybe more dangerous. Uh -oh. King D3, oh, the king comes up. Rook this B7, sending the king back. And Magnus has to find a way to infiltrate Hikaru's blockade. Oh, mm -hmm. Rook E2. D3. Uh, oh my gosh. Who has to be careful here? <laughs> it's, oh my goodness rook f2 and he's gonna win the f3 pawn and i think hikaru might hold this yep because if if the rook could get to e4 that would be different and hikaru holding the e file he cannot let the king infiltrate e6 oh this is incredible he's hanging on by an actual threat and he's doing it incredibly well he just goes rookie one rookie two i don't think magnus has an easy way to make progress if you're carlson six rookie B four careful where you put your pieces yeah rook g4 was too risky though i agree with hikaru stay on the e-file and that's your defensive method and i think we're gonna get a draw magnus just not finding a single way to pose further problems i don't think such a way exists he can't put anything on the e-file hikaru is too solid i think rook b4 is a reasonable try yeah bring the rook here so at least that's taken care of but he Whoa. does it in a moment when bishop e7 can be played Bishop d4, rook d1, pinning the bishop, moving the king back. Magnus keeps finding newer and newer ways to pose yep. new problems, but Hikaru mm -hmm. believes the rook end game is drawn, and it is. Especially with the king cut off this way. If the king was on d4, different oh! story. Why did he oh, let it out? Oh, he's got this king to f6, and Magnus oh, is going to no, win. Oh, no, he's lost. King g6, f6, it's over. It's an umbrella. He's using the pawns as a shield. This king is a loss. Oh, my goodness. How many turnarounds? f7 there was winning on the spot. As yeah, does this. It, and it's actually the presence of the pawn that makes it a win. Because otherwise, black can play rook takes f6, check, and stalemate. And Hikaru is annoyed. He's wow. irritated. And he has lost a critical game, allowing Magnus to tie the match. I'll give you the choice, Amon. We can show that amazing line earlier, or we can show how Magnus was able to turn this game around at the end. Your call. I think we, we stick with what happened, uh, stick with what's fresh. This ultimately was uh, the turnaround point. I think it is uh, instructive because it, it looked like a total draw, and Hikaru was making it a total draw. He was defending on seconds on his clock the entire time. I mean, that alone is such a tough task, especially against Magnus Carlsen, who's you know right, right up in your grill trying to tie this match. And look at this. The king was cut off, Dania, and I mean... What, what do you think here? You just had to leave the rook on the e-file, right? Well, rook e6 was an incredible practical move by Carlsen. And what Hikaru had to do was defend laterally. He had to play the move mm -hmm. rook to a1. And the point of that move is that after rook a1, king e4, uh, it's not even easy for me. And I'm, you know, I see the e-file bar. King g7 apparently yeah. was the only move. Prevent What you have to do is prevent the white king from reaching f6. If it reaches e5, you can now start giving the lateral checks, rook a5, rook a6, mm -hmm. wherever the king goes, you pursue him. But how hard is this to figure out with two seconds? Hikaru made the natural move, rook g1. He thought, I'm tying myself to the g-pawn, the king can't move, but it can, and it moves to f6, yeah. and now the white piece activity overwhelms black's defenses. All credit yeah. to Magnus. How does he do this? It's amazing, and the presence of black's g-pawn is the reason that this position is actually lost. I mean, it, having that pawn here, otherwise you could play rook takes f6 with a stalemate, but that guy's working for the other team. Be still, my biting heart I'm on. That's all I have to say. And what we have to say for you folks is that we have 30 minutes of bullet to decide the SEC final. This match is all tied at nine apiece, and we are about to have some of the most epic half an hour of action ever. But before we go on break and set the players up for bullet, we wanted to remind you 
Um, and take a moment to thank AG1, a new partner of the SCC. AG1 is your daily support of key health functions from mental performance to energy and the immune system. It's the one product that does the work of many. To find out more, visit drinkag1.com slash chess or use exclaim AG1. We thank AG1 for sponsoring the SCC. Well, we'll let the players drink their AG1 and they'll need a lot of it because the SCC returns to determine a winner we have 30 minutes of bullet coming up, and we will be back with more Hikaru versus Magnus action in just a couple moments. We first thought that we had experienced the chest boom that had washed over us in 2019 at the end of 2018 yep. kind of going into 2019 we kind of looked at oh well that was guys that was the chess boom and oh we're in a new level we compete it was kind of then but then like literally like COVID happened we were ramping up so quickly in each country that locked down italy india but you could see the registrations flying through as each country locked down and it was all happening so fast there was no like oh this is so cool this was like Oh my gosh, we're going to, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we literally couldn't keep up. And so there was no like positive coolness out of this. It wasn't until like we were into the, you know, pandemic and then like several months and we're like, oh, wow, this, okay. Well, during the pandemic, more people are going to play chess. It will die back down. Nope. Then came pong champs and what Dean talked about. And we're like, oh my gosh, then, okay, after that, it will, no, okay. And then came Queen's Gambit. We're like, all right, well, that was definitely the peak. And then, we'll, and then the media started writing about chess. And then, okay, where is it going to stop? We, we have been- And then Pong Champs 3. You're just getting hit wave after wave after wave. And then there's the stuff in the media now, which is like wave. And like, we, we almost can't even come up breath fast enough to recognize this before we, there's like another wave coming from this point on we just don't know what to expect is there another wave coming probably do you wish playing a chess game with a friend was as easy as sending them a text well good news now it is with Chess.com's new iMessage app, you can start and play a game directly in iMessage. Your friend doesn't even need a Chess.com account. It's just tap and play. Head over to go.chess.com slash iMessage or use the command iMessage in chat to learn more. Or is mate. there some sort of mate? It's mate. G5 is coming and it's mate. Hikaru yeah. has to sack. So it's two to two, and that means we are level once more. Outside chance of perpetual. Oh, the queen! Oh, 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 queen!
Oh, I did the second time. <laughs> he sees it the second time. <laughs> and now Hikaru has built his lead up, and in addition to his three-point lead, he's got a really nice position in this game. He has to rush this like he's never rushed before. Yep, 10 seconds. Here comes the eight. Oh, 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 oh. It's a tied match? It's a tied match? Hikaru should play for a win. Look at the clock. Should, and he knows it, and he does it. Hikaru going in. Wait, it was a blunder. We'd be six. Yeah, this part is promoting. He allowed the queen oh, in. The part is promoting. You see it on Magnus' face. He knows. God. That does it. That's how Hikaru Nakamura defended his Bullet Chess Championship title. Oh my goodness. That was a clash of titans. He is the 2023 Bullet Chess Champion. He defeated Magnus Carlsen in one of the most incredible matches that we have seen. Quadruple overtime. And Hikaru stands all tied up with Magnus. The score is 9-9 nine to nine in the Speed Chess Championship Final presented by Coinbase. We welcome everybody who has been with us from the start, and we welcome everybody who's just joined. You come in at a great time. Grandmaster Mon Hamilton, we see a lot of three-letter words that start with W and end with N. <laughs> hmm. I think I can figure this one out, although uh, you know, my wordle needs a little more practice. Uh, yeah, I, the most notable <laughs> one there comes at the end. Magnus Carlsen, also a familiar name. Now, this is the perfect opportunity for Magnus to get his quite literal revenge because this is Hikaru's wheelhouse. Magnus Carlsen, you know, undisputed, you know, the greatest player maybe of all time, but certainly right now. But guess what? In Bullet, Hikaru Nakamura is something else, and even Magnus knows that he respects Hikaru's ability in Bullet. And we got a great reminder of that in Hikaru's semifinal match against MVL. Nakamura was down a point going into the bullet. He won that match by five. He was dominant from wire to wire. And the biggest mistake by Hikaru's admission that MVL made is that he played too quickly. This is not one plus zero. This is one plus one. And what you want to avoid doing is over adjust. Start out by playing too fast and end with a minute on your clock. Magnus Carlsen is one of the best at adjusting to the new demands to the new constraints of the time control. Folks, the score is nine to nine. We have 30 minutes of one plus one action. My voice is quivering. And this, I mean, was there ever any doubt that we were gonna be tied no. going into the bullet? Was there ever an no. actual doubt? I mean, it helps that, you know, it's all scripted anyway for an unbelievable finale. And surprise, surprise that we're gonna get it in bullet. Queen A5, this very trendy move. And we are off in the bullet portion here, but that plus one is going to give Magnus uh, a chance to hang with a bullet pro like Hikaru. Early signs, Magnus playing the first Karokan of the match, clearly indicating that with black, he wants to play uh, as solidly as possible. He wants to get structures that you're familiar with, and that becomes yep. more important in the bullet and then in the blitz. You want structures that you can play intuitively as Hikaru there setting up a devilish threat of bishop takes h6. And, you know, faking Magnus <laughs> out. Bishop c7 is a big threat. And I think Yukaru's got the initiative early in this game. Mm -hmm. And look, you're willing to actually make moves like knight h4, bishop h7, um, just knight back to f3. That's something that you would probably frown at in a blitz game. But in bullet, no, you're comfortable just probing around and not necessarily worried about every single move. And Magnus continuing to steer the game in the direction that makes him comfortable. Now he repeats moves with queen g6 and queen f5. He can play g5 and force this bishop off. Instead, he expands on the other side of the board. And Hikaru does the same in the center. Queen b5 now threatens a4. And Magnus says, I'm not taking Hikaru's initiative sitting down. Yeah, I, I mean, bishop h6 Ooh. is uh, one of the moves to look at. But it doesn't really come with the next move. Bishop Ooh. e5, however, That's f7 pawn is loose as well. Amon, that's a knife, especially in bullet, because trading on e5 and dropping your queen back, I think Magnus might have to go for that line, but giving up f7, Ouch. the entire house of cards might come down in the center, but Magnus mm -hmm. has to bite the bullet here. What happens after queen takes f7? Is it a4? <laughs> queen b6, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> and a4, great move by Carlson, very heads up, targeting all of White's pawns in the center, and we're going to get a Pac-Man game here pretty shortly. Mm -hmm. And you could take that... But you could also take on e6. The thing with e6 is that that a pawn actually might be dangerous down the line. Magnus could have thrown in rook f8 for starters, but that would have involved giving up the e6 pawn. Speaking of Pac-Man, who's going to take more pawns here? I think it's actually going to be white uh, in the end. Yep. White might uh, emerge with an extra a pawn and a weak pawn on e6. Wow, that's 
quite a move there, sort of walking into it almost, but queen d2 is the Oof. next move, and these rooks, yeah, they defend each other, but they can't move. In a blitz game, you would take white's position with open arms, but in the bullet segment, you have to defend against all these annoying threats. Black has a bit of an initiative on the king side. He can also drive yeah. his e-pawn up to e4, potentially, and Magnus does a grow! He mouse slipped! What was that? What did he mouse slip? No, it wasn't a mouse slip. He was expecting queen takes e6, and he was hovering yeah, over that's... that square. What are you doing? You've got 15 seconds. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's such a classic type of bullet blunder. Not a mouse slip, as you said, but just you expect the queen to show up there, and when any piece shows up on you e6, you're ready to take yeah, it. Yeah, you can't prevent your like animal brain from executing yes. the move. The problem isn't that. It's that Magnus was hovering over that square, trying to do a little bit too much that time, and after an yeah. amazing job navigating a dubious position, Magnus drops his queen, and he drops the first bullet game. And man, oh man, does he need to strike back in this one. He does. Like, that's quite literally the worst way to start <laughs> this uh, segment. Uh, however, I do like his position here. I think in bullet uh, for the white pieces, especially looking at that F5 square, uh, I think he's got a pretty good practical position. Very promising as he heads back to E1 with his other knight. And Hikaru there with B5 trying to prevent the D2 knight. Uh, from getting to the e3 square. That is ideal real estate because you're accessing both f5 and d5. And I think we are going to mm -hmm. see knight c2 by Magnus. But look at what Ikaru is doing, Amon. He is trying to play really, really actively to compensate yep. uh, for his lack of control in the center. And he's doing an amazing job of it so far. Yeah, even though um, I like what Hikaru has done here, I still think that Magnus is kind of executing this long-term positional plan uh, and that bishop, if it gets left over with some pawns on the same color, I, I actually really like the way this is going for Magnus. God, he's faked us out so many times. But finally, we see knight c2. e3 is not the only transit point. You can also fly mm -hmm. through the b4 international airport. And he actually recaptures with the pawn. Yeah, I agree, Amon. b3 might be coming soon. But yeah. rook d6, and he's blundered. Because if you trade, you blunder the fork on d2. <gasps> yeah. And it turns and around again. And d2 is happening anyway. Oh my gosh, it's just lost. Pawn takes. And the knights hit a knight d2. And the decision to yeah. take back with a pawn was a really bad one. Here comes the other knight. Bang, bang, yeah. bang. And Hikaru is crushing Magnus in the end game. I think, uh, you know, the, the secret's out. It was not the shirt. It was the <laughs> it, it was a blitz shirt. I think he needed to put his bullet shirt on. Uh, maybe the original shirt. And now Magnus <laughs> is dropping everything. Knight takes g2 and knight to d2. Yeah. And C takes B4 was when the wheels came off Magnus, outsmarting himself there, Amon. A little bit, yeah. That almost looked uh, like too cute, oh, too whoa, fancy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, BC. Huh? BC and Hikaru wants to go C3. He's taken with a bishop. What's going mm, on okay. here? Okay. Bishop back now, and then C2, Rook A1. Rook C1, Seems like though, unnecessary by both sides there. Something very strange was going on in this game. Hikaru goes for this endgame. He's going to go A3, I think. But Bishop yeah. D2 is an amazing move, because after A2, Unreal. King B2, you drop the A pawn, and Magnus finds the most complicated move of all instantly. Incredible. He had it, he had it all planned. It's a draw. How did he save yep. that? He's going to play h4, king e6, I would have said first. But yes, just going to be a draw here. Oh, that's a huge, huge save. Hikaru might extend this game, though, as long as possible. You're not really... Yeah. It's. I mean, you can milk the clock. You're only up a point, but this would be consistent with his strategy. Yeah, I would say here, don't really know if that's his strategy because he's, I mean, he's confident <laughs> in bullet, right? He's not trying to shy away from anything. No, no, but he is... Showing a desire to ex extend this game as long as possible. I think if you're Hikaru, you do want this to go down to the wire. You you thrive in these high-pressure situations. And so he's yeah. going to get another 30 seconds, 45 seconds off the clock. Also, Magnus is the one who has to remain on his toes. Because the knight is the more dangerous piece in these situations. Mm -hmm. Or will Magnus make me eat my words? <laughs> <laughs> you said what? Yeah, well, nothing, nothing. You heard something. Maybe you need to replace your headphones. F5 by Hikaru is still trying. Yeah, he can extend this game. He's going to be able to play Knight F4 or E4 if he wants. So uh, match strategy clearly uh, revealed. Well, eight minutes have already been lopped off the match clock. Hikaru wins the first bullet game. Uh, <laughs> I thought we were on to... like game one or two here. I What's going on? 
you know, we were still on break a second ago, and now there's 22 <laughs> minutes left. This is what Hikaru's going for. And is he trying to lose this game, King D5? Yeah, he has to be a little careful here. He's... Girl. Oh, nice yeah, he's C4. He's barely surviving this. He's down to, like, having to find only moves now, but yeah. he is finding them. Yeah, that's that. He does that. You know? <laughs> Sometimes, once in a while. Come on, Amon. Don't overstate the case here. This isn't the SEC mm, finals or anything. Oh! Wow, so clever. He's won a pawn. How? I don't King know. King e4, the knight knight heading c2, to f4. Bishop c5. Uh, bishop to d8. Got it. Oh my gosh. Now suddenly white's the one who has to be careful. Knight f4 is coming. <laughs> it really feels like someone. Oh, knight f2. Gonna he's going to win. Or is he? <laughs> Regardless of whether he's going to win, it's phenomenal that he's done what he's done. How how is he up a pawn from that end game? Uh, it's uh, it's it's you you watch the moves. I see the moves. I my brain processes the moves, and I still can't understand how we have a two on one. And he, and the worst thing is Hikaru can now milk another minute off the clock. That's right. And ninety five threatened. Yep, and he can just shuffle that knight around. There's no big oh, urgency. That's such a that's such a devilish little move because Magnus could have very easily pre moved a king move there. Totally. He should totally. hold it now, but it's still hard. Hikaru getting his king around. Ugh. Yeah. King f5, bishop e5. There's some h3, knight f4 stuff. And finally, Magnus is going to bag the h3 pawn and bag the g5 pawn and force this game, this never-ending game, to end. And Hikaru is still keeping the pawn on the board. <laughs> I think he... 97. 97, yeah. And course. now wait five seconds and then take the queen. Maximum squeeze. Totally. And let's let's not uh, sugarcoat it. That wasn't just a, a maximum squeeze uh, in a gamesmanship way. Uh, no, he was playing for a win there, in case you forgot. And he was briefly winning, according to the eval bar, if he had moved the knight to f2. But that ship has sailed, and they repeat an opening that we saw quite a bit in the three-minute portion. A Sicilian with a bishop on c3. I don't Did love the that. way this starts for Hikaru. I mean, Magnus just seems to have gotten a very, very nice setup here. Yep. Yep, A3 and C3, you can see the desperation to get that bishop back to C3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get rid of that pawn, Magnus. And Magnus says, no, I will not. Bishop E3, I mean, again, hoping to have B take C3 played. I, I still feel like uh, Magnus is really, really happy with how this has started. But he's got to figure out a way to protect the D7 pawn either directly or indirectly as he's done. Now he can castle. Look at this tactical yep. awareness. I'm on queen takes D7, rook D8 traps the queen. That's such a hard idea to see in bullet. And it was because of queen b8 covering the, the c7 square. So he mm -hmm. totally planned that. I would put the queen on c7, though, to give the rook a little bit more latitude uh, along the eighth rank. Maybe later you can play rook a8. Magnus burning a lot of clock here. And this is what he was spending it on. Mm. What a sacrifice. And e 4 is hanging. The b3 yep. bishop is under fire. Hikaru's got to be really careful to keep his position together here. Yeah, maybe... Okay, yeah, this is probably more what Magnus was looking for. Two bishops, uh -oh. imbalanced pawn structure. Don't take with a knight. Don't take with a knight. Bishop a4 wins the piece, and Hikaru mm -hmm. sees it. Yeah, but this is fantastic for the bishops, right? It's totally. exactly what you want. Magnus, this is precisely the kind of position that we're used to seeing him winning regularly. E5, e5. and bishop c6? Yeah, knight b5, bishop c6, knight f3, you could Ooh. just take it. I think that's... Oh, he wants to play the bishops. Because there was one school of thought, you know, just take, rook takes b3, but maybe that position is just objectively very hard to win. Well, Magnus wants to take Hikaru to school in this endgame, and I think he thinks, Amon, that you can win the b3 pawn on demand. So he yeah. wants to extract more out of the position. Maybe milk white's clock down, but he's that's milking right. his own clock down as a result f5 f4 okay he's gonna just defend for now but going very aggressive Knight now c4. magnus has overpressed before and he's overpressed again or has he because bishop f2 runs into rook a1 but there's the move b4 and hikaru missed Clever. it b4 would have kept the c5 pawn defended now it should be technically winning for carlson mm -hmm. he keeps the rooks on i don't know whether that was a, a chance to to trade it off i i think hikaru made the right choice though D5 now is going to come with devastating effect. Look at Black's pawn phalanx. Not over yet, though. Hikaru's rook is very, very active. And if you D4. push your pawns prematurely, Bishop D4. 
Wow. He's, is he just going to try to, like, stay in this position? As, okay, he's giving h7. And rook a6, there's rook b6, and that spells trouble. But is this winning? It is. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> it is. But not easy. Look That's at Hikaru a... using every last resource, but he's just Bishop not fast F6. enough. King c2 now. Ooh. Yeah, bishop e3. And bishop G3. remember, there's like this h pawn bishop configuration on the h1 square. Oh, d2. Apparently that was wrong. e5. Oh my gosh, this is so close to a draw all of a sudden. h6. Amazing. Wow. But how do you win this? You do you get your king back to g4? Yeah, you, get you your leave king bishop back. c3. And now you just walk. And eventually you'll have to play g7. And then you're playing, what, these two pawns against the bishop? How does that work? Aman, I don't think I would have found h6 in a classical game. That is inhuman to leave the protected passer on g3. g7. And now it's finally completely winning. Or is it? Nah, but yeah, yeah, you really have whoa, to whoa, work whoa. again here, though. This is Wrong very specific. Wrong color pawn, but he's going to get the yep. bishop off. I mean, that win was <gasps> truly insane. We are looking at a match between two of the, the best players in the world, and one of them happens to be Agnes Carlson, who's a wizard in the endgame. You talk about Hikaru's bullet prowess. How about Magnus' endgames? Considering that they had 10 seconds on their clock, no, it wasn't flawless. Yes, Hikaru almost got back in the game, which is incredible mm -hmm. on its own merits. But the way that Magnus found H6 and handled, walked on hot coals there is amazing. And we Truly. have another Rui Lopez and another King's Indian-like structure with a very early C5 push by Magnus. Yeah, and another tied match. Ten and a half, ten and a half. Talk about it going down to the wire. We're halfway oh. through this match, and guess what? It has the makings of that, you know, photo finish. Oh, it absolutely does. You know this is gonna be a photo finish. Halfway through the one minute portion. And Carlson sacking the pawn there. Hikaru could have advanced it to F4 and taken on C5, but in the King's Indian, yeah. Amon, this is a very standard way to sack in order to open up the queen side. Now, with White's control over the E4 square, I think Magnus has the upper hand. Yeah, and this um, bishop on e3, I mean, it makes sense to take, but as soon as you do, the knight will return to the d4 <laughs> square that you once uh, had covered. Yeah, it's like playing, uh, you know, knockout basketball. You knock someone's ball out, they get angry, and they're like, I'm going to come back and knock your ball out. But knight d4 <laughs> doesn't tell the whole story because white also controls yeah. the c file. There is among the idea of an exchange sacrifice on d4. Potentially, you could go rook c4, rook takes d4. So I still think Magnus... Hikaru, rather, Good has point. the shorter end of the stick, and he's given up h6. Ooh, yeah, and it or looks like he? knight d4 takes. There was knight e2, but a lot of pawns fall in that position. I actually think, practically, this is a very hard position for Magnus to handle. And he's yeah, handling he it incredibly. Didn't even realize it was hanging there. What a move, queen h4. Hikaru spotted that in, like, a nanosecond. But he could, couldn't take on g6 there because of rook g3. Magnus secures the yeah. pawn. And can he go down the C-file with queen C3, queen C7? True. Yeah, going with the queen makes more sense. You actually have some threats like queen H7 there. But you're also giving away the F2 pawn in the process. G7. Hikaru allowing uh, queen C1. I think that might win. Yeah. If the rook goes to C8, it's over. But he decides to take. However, what do you do about this pawn? This is a serious problem. Hikaru has to keep the D6 pawn protected. Magnus helping himself to another pawn. Queen takes mm -hmm. a6. Hikaru doing everything he can to open up White's king. But I think Magnus he has just enough goes here. Back. Queen f1 and queen e1. Queen f1. That's the move. Yeah. It's totally winning. Too many extra pawns here. Now the queen has to go back, and you can basically serve up a distraction on the a file. Black's Whoa. two pieces need to be near the king. Sloppy there by Magnus. Queen to e6 would have been an easier win. He plays it now. Hikaru could have actually snagged the pawn on g7, but it was lost anyway. And Magnus is yeah. back on top. Wow. Just like that, Magnus flips the script. If I'm remembering correctly, Hikaru started out with that win, right? Because Magnus, you know, effectively, some kind of brain slipped his queen, right? And that's how things started. But this is how they're going. And currently, Magnus has retaken that lead. It probably feels good because he hasn't had it in a while. Which is crazy to say, given how the match started, we're getting another endgame. And in the early going, Amon, I'm not suggesting that Hikaru's bad at endgames, but mm -hmm. Carlson is getting exactly the kinds of positions that he really, really wants in the last couple of games. That's right. That's right.
And now Hikaru down in the match, you know, might have to shift uh, the strategy because what was working for you before might not be applicable anymore. But he's trying to work on black center. Obviously, black is the bishop pair, but the king side pawn structure is really weak and the d5 pawn is weak. I think we're going to get yep. some sort of major liquidation here. Rook takes d5, there's bishop to e6. So Magnus might actually play down a pawn here for a bit. Oh, bishop f4 almost wins an exchange, but the knight blocks. Yeah, and you have to be careful of bishop e3, pawn e3. It looks like you're shattering white's pawn structure, but the bishop against the knight is not favorable for black. So if white can liquidate these pawns over here, I think b3 is not crazy just to make sure you get that nasty a pawn off the board. Oh, absolutely. And that's precisely what Hikaru will focus on. I think a draw here is likely. Although yep. I keep saying that and then crazy stuff keeps happening in the end game. We're going to see the trade on E3. No, Magnus is playing for a win here. He's keeping both of his bishops on the board. I think I'm on. You called it. I would take yep. and go B3 if I'm Hikaru. Yep. Mm -hmm. Same idea. B3 now. And okay, this is what I'm wondering. Is Magnus now not going to acquiesce to the draw? Because, okay, maybe I prefer the knight, but do I prefer the knight when I'm down in the match? Like playing this on for any reason? So, Aman, I think as long as both rooks are on the board, I actually prefer black because his rooks are more active. I think mm -hmm. white is the one who has to exercise caution. Now, if the knight lands on h5, then the script flips, as, as you said earlier. But right now, I think Magnus is still playing this on the merits of the position. Right. Yep. Makes sense. Or but needs to keep those rooks on the board, and he goes back to a1, and he can just move the king, like king g6 or something, and, and continue. Oh my goodness, 11 minutes left in the bullet segment. Hikaru down by one. First of all, he needs to hold this position. He cannot afford a loss here. And I think he's doing an excellent job of defending this essentially from a position of strength. I think it's time to repeat moves. Or is Hikaru going for it now? I don't think Hikaru's going. I think Magnus is saying, hey, you want to play positions out? Let's play positions out. I'm happy to do it now that I have uh, the edge in the match. And now he trades rooks. This obviously increases the likelihood of a draw. Hikaru preventing f5 and fixing black's pawns on weak squares. But that king on g6 is ideally placed to keep everything mm -hmm. under lock and key. This one is going to liquidate. Yeah, I, I immediately saw e4 and I was like, hmm, I'm not sure if I like that move. But if the, the idea is to liquidate and just get out of this game as fast as possible, it makes total sense. It does indeed. Hikaru still making threats there. Oh, and he can take e6 and take f6 and take g6, but that is a drawn rook endgame. And... It's almost like if you get into that endgame, Magnus is down a pawn, but he's happy because the game will go for a while. Totally, and look, we're under 10 minutes in the match. Now a draw is all but guaranteed, and Hikaru trying to keep pieces on the board. This move, e5, tells me that Hikaru is still entertaining hopes of some sort of knight fork, but it's unrealistic. Yeah, how? I mean, if you move the knight, there's rook e4 always, so... It feels like uh, there's just no progress to be made. And not to mention the age pawn is just loose. And Hikaru keeps trying to find ways uh, to keep the game going. But it's finally a draw. And Magnus maintains his one-point lead and has mm -hmm. the white pieces with which he's been able to put major pressure in the last segment of this match. And it goes without saying that with less than 10 minutes to go, don't think of these bullet games, Dania, as like, oh, two minutes for that game, two minutes for that game. No, these <laughs> bullet games with plus one second, they can go five, six minutes. Remember, we had a game that looked like it was taking like six plus minutes, and we were like, wait a minute, did this just segment just start? Yeah, this is not like the bullet brawl where you can get 10 games in the last five minutes. And look at Hikaru. Yep. I think he, of all people, senses the urgency, and he says, I'm going to go for Magnus's throat. And I think he's doing a great job of it. Magnus has misplayed yeah. the opening. Queen e8, queen h5. It's an easy position to play. And that is the main thing, which makes white yeah. have a difficulty here. Totally. And look at this. Bishop takes c6. Hikaru doesn't care. He says, go ahead and win that pawn. I mean, at this point, I may consider c5. <laughs> but um, yeah, he was happy to give it up and play on what I was expecting to be the king side. But Magnus is trying to say, hey, focus Dude. over here. Don't forget about my king. Magnus is doing an amazing job of deflecting Hikaru from the king side to the queen side, which he's opened up. And look at Magnus making strides and trying to infiltrate. Rook c7 yeah. would threaten a potential mate on h7, and Hikaru has to shoo the queen away. But down yeah. goes the pawn. And rook takes d6, just as a practical bullet move, is right around the corner. So don't forget about that. 
Rook f6, that's a sad necessity for Nakamura. I think you're exactly right. Keeping his center protected, but giving Magnus an important tempo that he uses mm -hmm. to bring his rook back to the seventh rank. Maybe d5, although there is a rook c6 move. Yeah, he gets out of the way of that. The uh -oh. rook needs to move. Watch out. Rook takes a2. I would throw that in if I'm Hikaru. Just get rid of that yeah. passed pawn. And now Don't any end game is going to be more defensible for Black. I think he's making strides to take over this game once again. Bishop h3, knight h4 is a nice shot. And he plays it anyway and gets the other knight to f3. The f5 square. Watch out for that square if you're Hikaru. Mm -hmm. Oof. This is really well played by Magnus right now. Even though he might not be maximizing his advantage, he just wants to neutralize what Hikaru is trying to drum up on the king side. He definitely has the initiative, but bishop e7 is such a cagey move. Look at that knight on h4. It's kind of stranded, and you're not playing g3 anytime soon because that loosens up the yep. other knight. It's very much a three-result game. <laughs> Absolutely. This <laughs> is unclear to the max. Queen d5. Uh-oh, uh-oh, rook f8. Rook takes e7. I would take... I would take and just take d6. It's bullet. Just get things off the board. That was winning him on because of the fork threat on g6. Instead, he puts piggies on the seventh, and this is still yeah. very difficult for Nakamura. Oh, that's a depressing move to play. Rook e8, sort of admitting that the tactics oh. aren't working for black. But rook g7 is exquisite defensive play. The rook on e8 is now <laughs> guarded by the queen. Well, what do you do? Everything is Check. barely holding on. Unbelievable. Rook takes e7. There goes a minor piece. That's hanging. But is there... Is there rook takes g2? Oh my gosh. There's rook h7 there as a result. Hikaru going all in, sacking the piece. Wow. But queen d3 is going to stabilize. Amazing. Queen d3 holds absolutely everything. Rook g3 there was again rook h7. Uh-oh. Queen h6 threatened. Hikaru defends. The queen can shuttle trampolining back and forth. Threatening mates galore. Rook f7 trading. Rook's winning. Winning. And he's, he's going to resign immediately. Yep. He knows he needs to resign. He needs the next game to get underway. It's not full panic mode yet, but this game is super important. If it's a long drawn out game, especially if it's a draw, this might be it for Hikaru Nakamura. I think he's now officially thinking of this as a must win game. And it's interesting to me that he keeps repeating this weird bishop c4 line in the Sicilian. Now it yep. makes sense though, because at the very least you're guaranteeing an unbalanced game. Yep, you, and this is an improvement from last time. Remember bishop c3, those positions weren't working out. Instead, he's going back to what has worked. Queen h5, he might be trying to really drum up an attack, and, and Magnus says no. <laughs> and it goes without saying that Nakamura keeps his queens on the board. I like this setup a lot more uh, with his pawn on c3 and more space than he did in the previous Sicilian game. But mm -hmm. Magnus, classic Sicilian maneuver, and now we have a more standard type of Shevenengen structure. Yeah, and there it is. H4. It needs to happen. <laughs> uh, we might see knight h2, rook d3, rook g3. Uh, I, I like it from Nakamura. He can turn it on when, when he needs a, a result. And look, the attacking games have worked for him against Magnus so far. Oh my goodness. Pandemonium on the board. We keep seeing Magnus advance that deep on. But from a practical perspective, I think rook g3 is an excellent move. There's a Love lot it. of threats to deal with. And Amon, don't sleep on the c2 bishop. White could play e takes d5 and queen d3. And if the black mm -hmm. king sidesteps to h8, I think that might be a huge issue. So he goes the other way. Yep. I wonder if it's time to remove this bishop with bishop g5. Because you could also just bring the bishop all the way back. You're not worried about bishop d4. h6 is your next idea. You're opening things up and bringing the black king to the center of the board where it's going to be exposed. And the best news yet is that he has 50 seconds on his clock as Magnus with some crazy tactics. What is this tactics. move all about? Bishop takes b2. He wants bishop takes d4 and the c2 bishop is going to hang. But what I don't like about this move is that Hikaru can ignore everything, go h6 and tear black to shreds on the king's side. This looks scary. And this is exactly where Nakamura has found success, attacking Magnus's king. h7, h7. Wow, He's winning, h7 but it's the, the only move. Moves. But how do you continue from there? Queen b7? Queen b7 and knight c6. Oh, and then knight c6. Whoa. Wow. And he's going to win. Queen takes c8 is winning. You can give up e1 with check and just sidestep with king h2. And the h pawn queens. Whoa. What the heck is knight f5? Trying to get black to play ef so white could take the queen with check. But queen takes h7 and Magnus is still in the game. The take pawn the is pawn. hanging. Take Does the he pawn. see it? He, it? he doesn't see it. Bishop a3. Where is he going? He's going for a jog. Nerves. That this was is pure nerves. Lost. And Hikaru's laughing because Amon, after Queen takes h7, it was winning, but it was still a game. And Hikaru yes. wins the first game on demand.
And he, I think maybe it is a wry Ooh. smile because he's like, okay, you know, we got exactly what the people want. We got one more game. And I think it's still possible that it could be a draw and we get another game, but highly unlikely. Very good chance that this is the final game of the match and a must win for Hikaru Nakamura. And he unbalances the game immediately. He plays e4, e5, but he puts his knight on e7. He tries to get opposite side castling, but he's already mm -hmm. in trouble because you can't castle short. You're going to drop the h6 pawn. So I yep. don't like what he's gotten here early on. The knight can land yeah. on d5. This is a Carlson type of position. It is, but you know what? You got to cut uh, Hikaru some slack here because he needs an imbalanced position. And sometimes you have to just take a bad position straight up and then turn it into a good one later. So at the very least, it's not some sort of equal game that's going to be a draw. And I like what he's doing. He's gotten his king to relative safety. He could strike with f5 and create tension like in the F5. center. That's a very yep. thematic idea in these types of positions, Amon. Instead, he's playing this more defensively, though, with rook c8. Knight d4, Yeah, maybe. and I think Magnus is also... Uh, oh. he's, he's looking like he wants to go for some trades here. Bishop a2, and queen e6 is going to pick up the pawn. What a shot. No way. And now Hikaru with a clearly better position, up a full yep. pawn, and white's king has been breached. Yeah, and no. now with the, with the time getting as low on the match clock, this oh. is it, guys. This game needs to be a win for Hikaru, and he set himself up to do it. But he's got the hardest task still ahead of him on, because if he goes for the queen trade, try winning mm -hmm. that opposite colored bishop end game against Magnus Carlsen. Hikaru says, out of the question. I'm keeping the kings on the board, but Magnus keeps improving his position. Whoa, H5. what a move. He wants he to rock a one eventually. Yep. Oh, I thought he should have played f5 there. That would have been very interesting. But instead, he's just looking to simplify. Okay, a5, rook a1, b6. The pawns are going to go in dark squares. King is going to go to b7. What a move by Hikaru, shutting down White's rook, and Magnus has to bring everything back. I think the no, position Hikaru's is now getting well. worse. Yep, Hikaru's Thanks. playing really well because he's the rooks were too uh, advanced on the king side. Like, what are they doing, Magnus? Bring them back. And king b7, another amazing move. Nakamura says, hey, you want to attack down the a file? No, 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 no. I'm the boss down the A-file. Magnus doing yep. everything he can to distract Nakamura. Here comes the queen. Here come the oh, mate threats. No. Dire straits for Magnus. He's on the ropes. I don't even I don't even know what to recommend here. Queen C1, Rook it's A2. In it's insane. I, I can't find a move. Hikaru is doing it. He's got 15 seconds to find a move. And Magnus closes his eyes and goes all in. And oh Hikaru my goodness, Rook, 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 Rook A2. Rook A2. He missed it. Oh my goodness, Rook takes B6 again. Rook takes B6 and it's over. Rook takes it's B6, all over. and he oh missed it. Oh my goodness, he still has something. Maybe Rook, rook C7, C7 for a draw. Both Rooks are sacrificed. Oh my it's goodness, he might be winning, by the way, but he only needs a draw as the match clock expires and Hikaru is exasperated. Oh my gosh, Amon. Hikaru had it's forced mate. mate, and it's a draw by agreement, and it's the match. He offers a draw, a gentleman's draw, and I mean, what a finish. It literally comes down to the last game, and look at the smile on even Hikaru's face. These guys are just two titans, two champions going at one another. You cannot script this any better. Before we do anything, before we even congratulate Magnus, we have to show that last chance for Hikaru have because to. he had rook a1, which is such a difficult move to see. And this came after. This came after Magnus missed the first opportunity to sacrifice the rook. So this is later. Queen c2. Yeah. And if we could pull up, pull up the board here. Yeah, yeah, Rook EA8 is what lost the SCC final. Amon, take it away. What would have been the a win? Truly, truly incredible fashion here. Queen C2 gets a double question mark. And fittingly, Rook to A2, I'm going to have to award a brilliancy. Uh, King takes A2, Rook A8. And you clear the way for the oh. Queen to use the A1 square. That was what Hikaru Nakamura needed to find. That was the difference between us being in a tiebreaker right now and Magnus Carlsen being the SCC champion. What an incredible finish. I mean, you cannot script this any better. I'm speechless, but we got more talking to do. And the savvy move of the game will come in this last game. So keep it pulled up, I'm on. But here is the final score. Last year, it was a one-point victory for Nakamura. This year, it's a one-point victory for Magnus Carlsen. Amon, is there any way than that stat to symbolize how incredible these players are? Every time they play, the same thing happens. It's in insane action from the first minute to the last. It is. Like, it honestly feels uh, right for this match to be decided 
by one point. It, it doesn't even matter in which direction because it has been, you know, uh, Hikaru's match before. It's been Magnus's match. And these two are at the top of chess for a reason, certainly at the top of online speed chess. They always meet in the finals. And I mean, Hikaru Nakamura only loses to one person, and that's Magnus Carlsen. My gosh, there is no Netflix show. There is no activity, Amon, that I would have rather been doing the last couple of hours than watch this insane match. We congratulate Magnus Carlsen on his victory. And for yeah. our Coinbase savvy move of the day, Amon, let me know if you disagree, but I think we need to go right back to our last game. And I think the savvy move, or shall I say the savvy moves, have to be Magnus's Rook sacrifices because that is ultimately what won him the match. Totally. Um, I mean, this... This game right here was the entire match, just encapsulated into one game. Rook d7 was played by Magnus. He's chasing the king. He knows that, you know, he's about to lose the game with Rook a2 coming. But instead, he comes up with a very savvy set of moves. Not only one sacrifice, Rook takes c5, seemingly giving away the Rook for nothing. But Rook to c7 check, how's that for a savvy move to secure an SCC title, Daniel? using one rook to break apart black's uh, protective pawn cover the other rook to deflect the king and magnus realizing that mate is inevitable offer to draw hikara had no yeah. chance no choice but to accept because the king is cornered and that folks is how magnus carlson won one of the most epic matches i've ever seen the speed chess Truly. championship 2023 belongs to magnus carlson but how many hoops did he have to jump through to get the crown not just hikaru but everybody else whom he had to defeat amazing stuff i mean i obviously can't wait to hear from these players but this was the match that you know we, it was hyped up to be it always lives up to the hype uh i mean i was just most intrigued by that final shot of both players kind of giving that champion smile as they just i think they're just realizing that they're the best competitors for one another and it's such an amazing rivalry to watch it really is. And it seems like every one of their matches has so many twists and turns. It's never wire to wire. It's never a blowout. It's always one person has the momentum out of the yeah. gates. And then another person. And the fact that we had so many different openings, Amon, we had the Rui Lopez stage. The fact that this match can even be divided into stages tells us how epic it is. And you know what else is epic? It's the interview that we will have with Magnus Carlsen. We will hear the winner's thoughts on this amazing, unforgettable match, and we will set Magnus up. Folks, do not go anywhere. The interview with Magnus and the Speed Chess Championship presented by Coinbase, coming right up. Hold on to your toques. Beginning December 9th, the Champions Chess Tour Finals are coming to Toronto, Canada. Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura, and Noderbek Abdusatorov have already secured their spots in the finals thanks to their beauty victories on the tour so far. Super GM's Fabiano Caruana, Wesley So, and Ali Reza Ferruja have secured enough points to clinch spots, as well as young prodigy Denis Lazovic. Only one spot remains up for grabs. Levon Aronian currently holds the last qualifying spot on the leaderboard, but nothing is for sure, as several players remain in contention including Division I participants Jan Nepomneshi, Anish Giri, Maxim Vashiela Grav, and Shakriar Mamedyarov. The players will have to give her in the knockout rounds of the final event, the AI Cup, beginning on September 25th. I've worked with the two players, perhaps with the best chess intuition ever, Magnus Carlsen and Vichy Arnold. This course is generally about examples like this, common knowledge that's used on, on the highest level. Good intuition comes from knowing a lot of examples, from having seen examples, thought about them, and perhaps tried to implement the principles, but under different circumstances. Having thought about it, having tried to implement it in a way, and having debated it. So that's more or less what I try to do at this course. Basically puts the foundation for positional understanding, positional intuition you would see in, in, in many players.
Everyone loves playing chess, and everyone loves Chess Club. But there's also a time and a place for playing all your favorite games. Hey, we're trying to have a lesson here. You need to get out of here. Recently, more kids have been playing chess than ever in school. But sadly, we've learned that they may not always be playing chess at the most appropriate time. Eh ben, class, aujourd'hui... While it might be sometimes okay to grab a game between classes or if your teacher gives you permission and hasn't given you an assignment, it's not okay to be playing chess in school when you aren't supposed to. And chess should never come between you taking your studies seriously and cooperating with your fellow students and teachers. Chess over the board or on the phone is a great way to spend time with friends. But let's make sure that this school year we don't let too much chess happen in the classroom. Focus on your school, because chess.com will always be there when class is over. Chess is school! Respect your school! All right, that was awesome, everybody. Great job. Look what I did. Danny, did you spell that? Yeah. Can we get some other letters, please? What's wrong with it? Magnus Carlsen is the 2023 Speed Chess Champion. After a five-year period in which Hikaru Nakamura instituted hegemony over the SEC, Magnus reprises his victory from 2016 and 2017, and he is the SEC champion once more. Magnus joins us in the studio for an interview. First question, Magnus, when that final game ended, I guess two questions. Were you aware that that was going to be the final game of the match? And second, what... How would you characterize the emotions that flow through your mind when the match ended? <clears throat> um, yeah, I was just... Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, I realized, like, towards the end of the penultimate game that if... Um, th th well, that the the next game would very likely be the, be the last. So, uh, at least if I if it was not a very short game uh and um yeah uh i mean after i blundered the pawn on a2 after that i couldn't keep uh control uh at all and i mean i thought that was lost uh for sure and then i just gave a check uh and i realized only like after giving the check that well, I, it looks like I have a perpetual now, or at least a perpetual. So, yeah, that was was a bit lucky, like mentally. A few moves before, I was thinking that oh, this is going to be uh, we're going to be here for another half an hour. Um, but uh, hmm. yeah, I was just so happy, so relieved that um, that I found that shot and that I managed to yeah to finish the match off eventually. Well, Magnus, I mean, congratulations uh, from me as well. Uh, what a match. I think a theme that we were noticing throughout the match, uh, I don't know if you felt this way as well, but when Hikaru was just kind of throwing caution to the wind and just attacking your king straight up, those were the games that he was finding a lot of success. Is that something that you noticed uh, over the match, that when he just sort of went all out for these crazy attacks, that they were just working? Yeah, I, I actually think he could, sort of could have done that even earlier because uh, I was not in good shape today. I mean, I could feel it. I could feel it at the start. I could feel it before the start, really, the whole day that I was not going to be anywhere near the level that I was against against Wesley. Um, and I, I did feel very lucky that... 
he wasn't really trying harder to punish me at at uh, the start and um when he eventually started to to win games then i was just thinking that uh yeah this is i mean i, I didn't think that i was in any kind of uh kind of shape to to withstand the the pressure and we went into the break in the three one uh he just like i think then he just won that uh berlin ending where i was much better than he found some very good resources to stay afloat and somehow i managed to lose instead of draw uh towards the end in general i would say that i was not like uh keeping my head calm whatsoever in scrambles uh which was also which was also a problem i don't think he was great, great in scrambles either uh today but that's usually a good indication of whether your brain is working and mine would just shut off um during during scrambles while for instance against wesley i would still sort of be thinking and um um coming up with decent moves magnus Harkening back to the moment uh, after you got off to the four and a half half start in the three plus one, you were down by three going into the break. What specific adjustments did you make during the break? Because it it seemed like your play looked a little bit different. It seemed like you made some adjustments in order to tie the match going into the bullet. What did you tell yourself and how did you set yourself up mentally to make that comeback in the three plus one segment? Yeah, I mean, I started to check... Um... The games a bit that I, I'd lost and then I thought yeah that's in the past uh that's fine also I, I thought that yeah my mind was heating so I should change to something a little bit lighter um I had a banana and also I, I think a, not a carrot this time actually uh but uh I just thought that even though I mean I was losing games like he was just uh he was just completely crushing me at that point i i did feel that i mean from last year and from the bullet championship this year that um that i i know that i i could come back from reasonable deficits so deficits so i knew that it was all about whether my brain could start working like if my brain could start working at some point i knew i would have i would have some kind of chance um <laughs> And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I got a much needed win with, uh, black the next game. I, um, I mean, in terms of whether I changed and anything, like I was messing around with both like Sicilians and, and E5 and I thought that was getting decent positions in general. So it was just a matter of, uh, matter of taste really. Well. Magnus, taking a step back and just thinking about what this result means overall. I mean, can you speak about what it means to you, uh, you know, winning the SEC and, of course, doing it against Hikaru? You guys have had such a rivalry. It's literally only been you two that win the SEC. So, I mean, what does it mean to you to win the event uh, again and reclaim that and also against Hikaru, who's such a competitor for you? So, I mean, my, my goal... Um for this season, also for the last two seasons, has been very clear uh, to sort of, in a in a major way, sort of reestablish the pecking order when it comes to comes to speed chess and um, and to be honest, I failed miserably in that, like losing to uh, like very um even matches against Tikaru and and Maxim uh and uh winning one by by one point so um yeah as I said I didn't feel good like going into today but still I'm not at all satisfied with my performance I feel that I can do um I, I can do a lot better and I do feel that if I'd played the way that I played against Wesley then um you know uh, this wouldn't have been close mm -hmm. so in that sense you know uh, i'm i'm happy to get the win but 
winning should be like I should win most of the time. So uh, I, uh, so yeah, obviously, like when when you played such a match, it feels so much better to 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 win than to lose. So I'm happy and relieved about that. But I still haven't managed to achieve my goal really in the speed chess championship, um, which I did the first two two years. So I think there's uh, still definite uh, history to be to be written there. Well, that history will continue next year. Magnus, speaking of history, I think this is a great segue uh, to a few chat questions before we let you take your well-deserved rest. Uh, a question from Bobin TV. Which young player, Magnus, do you see becoming as good as your Hikaru in the SEC in the future? Uh, keeping in mind the blitz time controls and keeping in mind all of the young talents who are terrorizing the classical field these days. Uh, I think it's uh, it's. I mean, the answer is pretty obvious that it's Alvarezza Fedorcha. Uh, he has clearly the highest uh, potential. Um, and uh, th to be honest, I thought at this point that he would be, if not quite at the same level, then very, very close. And actually. When you mention these young players and I mentioned Alaresa, my feelings like today remind me a little bit of 2020 when I lost the Banter Blitz Cup final to to Alaresa, also in a very even match. Um, I did play him like a few weeks later um, in the uh, in the Magnus Invitational in Rapid, and I won a very very close match there, and that didn't satisfy me at all. I had some of the same feelings still that. The only thing that would sort of count as revenge for me was a decisive victory, and I, I couldn't get that. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, I think Alaresa is, clearly has the highest potential. Um, Nihal is very strong. Uh, I'm sure he can improve as well. Um, as for the other kids, uh, it would be interesting to see in a couple of years if Prague could, could, be, um, could be a contender in this format of the Satorov as well. Who knows? But um, for the moment, um, Alaresa is a little bit away uh, and the others are uh, far away. Well, continuing with the chat questions, Magnus, and bringing us back to the match a little bit. I admit I wanted to know the answer to this as well, but we have a chat question from Robert Balazzi who says, uh, Magnus, was it the change of shirts that brought you back in the game? Because, you know, whether or not uh, it was uh, intentional, you changed your shirt and you came in and, and won a bunch of games in a row and got right back in the match. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it helped that it cooled me down a little bit just wearing something lighter, as I spoke about earlier. And I, I, I guess I made plus four with this shirt and minus three with uh, the other, so... The result sort of speaks for itself. Well, Magnus, final question before we let you go. Any overall reflections from this year's SCC and how much are you looking forward to next year's edition? Can we sign you up preemptively? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I can just repeat what I what I said earlier that, um, you know, I'm happy to, happy to win. Uh, it's better to win than to lose, but I'm I'm not satisfied. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna be back and um, hoping to um, establish establish the dominance that I, I I think I can. Well, Magnus, we always appreciate your insight. We appreciate the effort, and we definitely appreciated this incredible match. Congratulations on the Speed Chess Championship. And uh, we can't wait to see what you will bring to the table next year. Congrats, Magnus. Thank you, guys. Always appreciate you as well. Thank you very much. That was Magnus Carlsen. Another victory among another mm -hmm. feather in his cap. He has had a chip on his shoulder for what seems like the last year. Online, over the board. He's got a lot of gas left in the tank, doesn't he? 
It really does, but I mean, just thinking about what we just witnessed, it was uh, down to the actual wire match between simply two of the, the greatest players, Daniel. So as a, as a fan, I know I'm up here in the commentary booth, but I just like to think I have the best seat in the house because that was pure entertainment. We certainly do, and obviously it takes two to tango. It takes two to produce a match of this level, and unfortunately for Hikaru fans, he was not quite able to come back, but he played an epic match. We will have Hikaru for an interview in just a couple of minutes. Send over your chat questions. Well, we are back with Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura. Fortunately, he came up short in the SCC final, but it was an amazing performance nonetheless in this match, as well as in the SCC overall. Hikaru, we really appreciate you uh, joining us for an interview. We won't keep mm -hmm. you too long. Could you start by sharing your overall reflections on that final segment of the match? You mean the one plus one or the final game? The one, well, perhaps both. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, for, first things first, you know, I, I think um, in the in the bullet portion, it started off quite well for me. I won the first game. Um, but, you know, in the next couple of games, I didn't really get positions where I felt like the flow, the moves didn't seem super easy for me. And Magus used his time extremely well. Um, so, I mean, he built this advantage. Then, then you know, at the end, I was able to win the sec second to last game. Um, and this last game, unfortunately, I, I didn't use my time. I had like 30 seconds, I guess, at the end. But, you know, we were, we were both moving so fast there that I wasn't able to stop myself. And um, Magus found this great double rook sacrifice, um, you know, to save the game. And uh, it's, it's what it is, but it was extremely close. And uh, I think considering the start, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the match overall. And Hikaru, I mean, I'm sure that most of us know the answer to this, but this is obviously just mm -hmm. not another match for you. I mean, the chance to compete against Magnus in the SCC finals, I think everyone basically predicted that would be the case. But when you go up against Magnus in the final like this, I mean, what does it mean 
to you uh, competing against him and obviously a chance to, uh, you know, change the lifetime uh, score. Magnus was speaking about that. I'm not sure if you uh, were listening to the interview as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think to, to look at the match as a whole is very close. There are probably two moments when the match probably could have gone either way. I mean, in a big direction. Um, I would say that the start, I don't think either of us were super, super great. Definitely in scrambles, we, we weren't playing well. Um, but Magus did start off very fast. And um, there was this critical game. I, I don't remember what, what which game it was, but he was up by two or three. And then he had this mouse slip. Then I didn't take the piece. And then we ended up in this very long Rook and Bishop versus Rook mm -hmm. game. And, you know, I think if Magus had saved this game, there's a very good chance it could have gone completely in his direction. Um, and then the other moment was when I was up by three after the break, I basically just had a sort of, a, I don't know if you want to call it a brain slip or a hand slip where I put the bishop on B5 instead of going to C4 like I'd been doing the whole match after he played knight six on move two. And I wasn't really able to reel it back in that game. And I think if I, if in that game, I had just played bishop C4 and what, what I was playing throughout the match, I think there's a very good chance I could have run away with it. But those are really the only two moments when I think it could have gone uh, bigly in either direction. After that, I think it was just, it was a dogfight. And um, I mean, it was very close. So, you know, I, I think Magda said he wasn't happy with his play. I actually wasn't super happy with my play throughout the match either, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Hikari, your rivalry with Magnus Carlsen is now extended to the better part of a decade. If you had to compare the sort of stereotypical Nakamura Carlsen match from 2016, and take one from 2022 or 2023. How do you feel that your and Magnus's styles and approach, particularly to Blitz and Bullet, have changed over the years? Well, I mean, first things first, for all for all the morons in chat who are busy saying stupid things, they'll be happy to hear me say this. But, um, you know, what I, what I would say first and foremost is that, frankly, it was not a rivalry until probably the pandemic, if I'm being completely honest. I mean, Magnus had a great score against me. He won pretty much every match, I would say, that we played. Like, he won the SEC in 2016 and 2017. Um so, you know, Magnus just just had a great score against me. So I think saying it's a rivalry is a little bit sort of questionable because it was very, very one sided. But certainly since the pandemic began, uh, I've done a lot better overall against him. And um, so I, I think it's fair to say that now it is pretty close to a rivalry because it's like even today, if you, if you were to take this match after the first few games and go back five years, I would have completely folded and lost this match um, and it would have been a complete disaster. So. You know, it's it, it's I'm really happy with the way that I played against Magnus. Uh, obviously, today, you know, he, he was just simply a little bit better at the critical moments. But, you know, I had my chances. And I, I think when you're playing against, you know, whether you want to call Magnus the greatest or second greatest, you know, all, all that that whole debate, um, you know, he is one of the two best players of all time. And the fact that I'm able to compete with him, you know, I'm very happy. Yeah, well. Uh, Hikaru, obviously this match didn't go the way you wanted, but I guess I was just going to ask you if you had any final thoughts about, uh, you know, the match overall or anything else uh, you wanted to say uh, here because appreciate you coming on for an interview. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there are a couple things. I mean, the, the first thing that I would say is, you know, there are all these people who think they, they seem to realize that times don't change, people don't change. And, um, you know, like, if this had been a match, like maybe like five, six years ago, I'd probably be very, very upset right now, honestly. Um, but the fact that it was so close, uh, all things considered, I'm, I'm very happy. I guess my, my only regret is I wish I could have flipped the bullet chest championship in this event. Like, I would have preferred to have lost that and won the SEC rather than the other way around. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just very happy that I'm competitive with Magnus overall. And, um, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun playing the SEC. I mean, I, I guess, like, the, the only thing that I find a little bit just disheartening or disappointing is it feels like you know he's the only other player where it's it's really really close uh it seems like whenever he or i play other players in the sec it it turns into these these very uh ugly one-sided mm -hmm. matches um so that's the that's the only thing perhaps i wish like some other players would would, would come up and 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 be in be in the matches um but you know overall like again to for, for the match to be so close i mean literally one game to be the differential uh, i could have gone either way and i mean i suspect uh when, when we have have some fun matchups coming up in the near future uh it, it'll be pretty hype as well well hikar i think i speak for all of us when i say that you gave us three hours of unforgettable entertainment and obviously a new page and a new chapter is still remaining to be written in your uh, affair against Magnus Carlsen. We look forward to that new chapter and we really, really appreciate you coming on to share your thoughts. <laughs> no problem, you guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Thanks Hikaru. Have a good rest of your stream. And that was Hikaru Nakamura. That is all she wrote, Amon. 
He loses by a point. Last year, he won by a point. And I think I can echo Hikaru's words when I say that these two players are the only ones who are able to put together a match against the other. No one else came even close against either Hikaru or Magnus. Is it a surprise that we had a one-point match? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's always refreshing to hear both of these players just pure, raw, honest thoughts. I, I, I thought both interviews were really interesting to hear their perspectives. And probably the most interesting thing is what Hikaru said at the end, just calling it like it is. Uh, this match is always close, no matter which way, direction it swings in. It's always close, but you don't get that uh, sense of intrigue and competitiveness necessarily with all the other players. So, uh, you know, what what can you say? It's like uh, um, problems for being uh, that good at the game, Daniel. I can't even imagine the nerves and the pressure <laughs> that these players feel. And Magnus Carlsen was world champion for 10 years. The, neither of these players is a stranger to high-pressure situations, but we've talked about it. Players have all talked about it. In the SEC and in these prestigious online events, it's a different mm -hmm. kind of pressure. Feeling that there are 150,000 souls watching your every move, that produces an incredible amount of heat on the players and the way that they handle this as we look now at the final bracket very sad i'm on unfortunately all of the names have been filled out and that means the sec has come to a close but man oh man was it an epic journey to the top for both of these players and an epic journey to the throne for magnus carlson yeah barring a last second ikaru rook a2 check and checkmate combination to send us into tie breaks it couldn't have gotten any better than this what a what fitting way to end the scc uh your champion is grandmaster magnus carlson and uh you got the final that i think everyone was hoping for and i think you said it best uh, just at the end there Daniel. there are future chapters to be written in this storied rivalry and i think we are fair to call it a rivalry yes uh, especially now between these two as just a point has decided things uh between them and they're just the, the greatest competitors for a reason a book will be written on uh, Magnus's matches against Ikaru Nakamura. A book can already be written about the back and forth that we have seen every time that they play, whether it's in the Bullet Chess Championship, in Fisher Random, yeah. any variant, choose a time control. It doesn't matter. Ikaru and Magnus always produce the kind of incredible, entertaining chess that has made chess a spectator sport beyond a shadow of doubt. We saw that today. Not only is it a spectator sport, but it's a sport that can now support uh, its top earners. As we take a look at the prize distribution from the Speed Chess Championship, almost 50,000 for Magnus. Remember, this is a composite of the matches that he won, as well as the points that he has garnered. So all of those blowout victories was not lost on the bankers. Hikaru with 30,000, <laughs> a pretty handsome prize as well. That's a nice car. And we see the other prizes there. Everybody gets something, but Magnus yeah. Carlsen picks up the big pot. Indeed, and I think, uh, you know, the most exciting thing for the Speed Chess Championship is, you know, I, I liked it. You put Magnus on the spot and said, hey, will we see you, you know, in the SCC again? I think the most exciting <laughs> thing to hear from Magnus himself was that, uh, you know, say what you want, but the guy is not satisfied. He, th he thinks and knows that he can do better so, you know, until he's scoring against Hikaru Nakamura, which seems unthinkable, until he's scoring like he did against Wesley, against Hikaru, it seems like he's just, he can't be satiated. So from that point of view, it seems like we may write quite a few chapters of this uh, Hikaru and Magnus match in the future. And that is uh, good news for the SCC. It is indeed. You see this in all the greatest athletes in the world. It doesn't matter if they've just won Wimbledon, the FIFA World Cup, uh, the NBA championship. The first thing they do is ask, where did I go wrong? How could I have been better? How do I be better next time? Right? It's not about celebrating the victory. They drive themselves to perfection for their entire chess career. And that is how they come the closest of anybody to attaining that perfection. Well, this match was perfection. And if you're already experiencing withdrawal, I wanted to remind you that <laughs> Uh, the chess calendar never sleeps, and it will awaken once again uh, this weekend when we head back to school uh, with the 2023 okay. Collegiate Chess League fall season. We return with Team Blitz matches every Saturday featuring the top talent in American college chess, and it all kicks off tomorrow, tomorrow Saturday, September the 23rd. Of course, there's also Bullet Brawl. There is plenty right. of action. Tune in wherever you watch chess.com streams and use exclam CCL. That's exclamation mark CCL in the chat for everything you need to know 
about the season. Well, we know everything we need to know about the SCC. I'm on for the final time today. I will hand the mic back to you for your overall thoughts on today's match and yet another epic season of the Speed Chess Championship. It is. I I think the SCC never disappoints. Um, And despite having an inkling or maybe having a a preference uh, for some of the fans out there, they're thinking, oh, I just want to see Magnus and Hikaru play in the final. It was never a guarantee that that they would be there, but they're both on form, both completely deserving uh, to be in the final. And they didn't just get to the final and uh, and face off against each other. They gave the fans literally exactly what they were chomping at the bit for: a lead from both players, momentum swings, attacks like crazy. Hikaru was going after Magnus's king today. Some really exciting chess, tons of brilliancies, and literally down to the final game. Danya, I mean. Not only could I not think of a better match to commentate in the in the final, but not a better partner either. So Aww. happy to have the call with you, Daniel. Oh, well, I'm very touched, Amon. And likewise, it takes an entire village. And first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for your wit and your insight and just being such an easy partner to work with. Uh, next, I'd like to thank everybody in the chat. We had over 125,000 of wow. you. And the great thing about the SEC, everybody comes out with a smile on their face, whether you're a Hikaru fan, a Magnus fan, or whether you were hoping for an outstanding performance by someone else in the field. We all have to come together for a second and agree that there was no better way to spend the previous three hours. Our production Truly. team works so hard behind the scenes. Our producer, Hala. Uh, for an incredible job yet again and everybody else on our chess.com team for being responsible for these amazing broadcasts and making our jobs easy folks the ccl returns this weekend the scc returns next year and a big big thank you once again from grandmaster daniel naraditsky and grandmaster amana hamilton you were watching the speed chess championship presented by coinbase so long hi guys Bishop F4 itself was so bad. Oh, Bishop Wonder, rookie seven. Oh, he oh my nine. goodness. He drops a minor piece. And Magnus strikes first after that initial draw. Wait a minute, rook G8 check. Rook G8 check. What a oh, move. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, rook takes rook F3, takes though. F3. Oh, and rook takes G3, blundered his queen. Magnus blundered his queen. He can't cover with the knight. And Hikaru wins. Unbelievable. This game went up in flames. Oh, my gosh. There's a queen sack no, on G3 and F that, leads that to mating. Oh. Oh. oh my goodness, oh, that Hikaru. is beautiful. Wow. Just wow. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. There's only oh, one move no. in that position and he nobody could use it. No. I can't believe and it. Magnus is like, how did this just happen? If the king was on d4, different oh, story. Why did he oh, let he's it got out? his king. Tap six, and Magnus oh, is going to no, win. he's lost. He has lost a critical game, allowing Magnus to tie the match up to e4, potentially. And Magnus is a... Oh, he now slipped. What was that? What are you doing? You've got 15 seconds. Hikaru doing everything he can to open up White's king. But I think Magnus he has just enough here. Back. Just like that, Magnus flips the script. Oh my goodness, Rook takes B6! Rook A2! He missed it! Oh my gosh, I'm on. Hikaru had it's forced mate. mate. And it's a draw by agreement. These guys are just two titans, two champions going at one another.